The Republic by Plato, translated by Benjamin Jowett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Bob Neufeld. Persons of the Dialogue Socrates, who is the narrator, Glaucon, Adamantus, Polemarchus, Cephalus, Thrasymachus, and Clitophon, and others who are mute auditors. The scene is laid in the house of Cephalus at the Piraeus, and the whole dialogue is narrated by Socrates, the day after it actually took place, to Timaeus, Hermocrates, Critias, and a nameless person, who are introduced in the Timaeus. Book One I went down yesterday to the Piraeus with Glaucon, the son of Ariston, that I might offer up my prayers to the goddess, and also because I wanted to see in what manner they would celebrate the festival, which was a new thing. I was delighted with the procession of the inhabitants, but that of the Thracians was equally, if not more, beautiful. When we had finished our prayers and viewed the spectacle, we turned in the direction of the city, and at that instant Polemarchus, the son of Cephalus, chanced to catch sight of us from a distance as we were starting on our way home, and told his servant to run and bid us wait for him. The servant took hold of me by the cloak behind, and said, Polemarchus desires you to wait. I turned round and asked him where his master was. There he is, said the youth, coming after you, if you will only wait. Certainly we will, said Glaucon, and in a few minutes Polemarchus appeared, and with him Adamantus, Glaucon's brother, Nicaratus, the son of Nicias, and several others who had been at the procession. Polemarchus said to me, I perceive, Socrates, that you and your companion are already on your way to the city. You are not far wrong, I said. But do you see, he rejoined, how many we are? Of course. And are you stronger than all these? For if not, you will have to remain where you are. May there not be an alternative, I said, that we may persuade you to let us go? But can you persuade us if we refuse to listen to you? he said. Certainly not, replied Glaucon. Then we are not going to listen, of that you may be assured. Adamantus added, Has no place told you of the torch race on horseback in honour of the goddess which will take place in the evening? With horses, I replied, that is a novelty. Will horsemen carry torches and pass them one to another during the race? Yes, said Polemarchus, and not only so, but a festival will be celebrated at night, which you certainly ought to see. Let us rise soon after supper and see this festival. There will be a gathering of young men, and we will have a good talk. Stay then, and do not be perverse. Glaucon said, I suppose, since you insist, that we must. Very good, I replied. Accordingly, we went with Polemarchus to his house, and there we found his brothers, Lysias and Ethodemus, and with them Trasymachus the Chalcedonian, Carmantides the Paean, and Clitophon the son of Aristonymus. There, too, was Cephalus, the father of Polemarchus, whom I had not seen for a long time, and I thought him very much aged. He was seated on a cushioned chair, and had a garland on his head, for he had been sacrificing in the court. And there were some other chairs in the room, arranged in a semicircle, upon which we sat down by him. He saluted me eagerly, and then he said, You don't come to see me, Socrates, as often as you ought. If I were still able to go and see you, I would not ask you to come to me, but at my age I can hardly get to the city, and therefore you should come oftener to the Piraeus. For let me tell you that the more the pleasures of the body fade away, the greater to me is the pleasure and charm of conversation. Do not then deny my request, but make our house your resort, and keep company with these young men. We are old friends, and you will be quite at home with us. I replied, there is nothing which, for my part, I like better, Cephalus, than conversing with aged men, for I regard them as travellers who have gone on a journey which I, too, may have to go, 
and of whom I ought to inquire whether the way is smooth and easy, or rugged and difficult. And this is a question which I should like to ask of you who have arrived at that time which the poets call the threshold of old age. Is life harder towards the end, or what report do you give of it? I will tell you, Socrates, he said, what my own feeling is. Men of my age flock together. We are birds of a feather, as the old proverb says, and at our meetings the tale of my acquaintance commonly is, I cannot eat, I cannot drink, the pleasures of youth and love are fled away. There was a good time once, but now that is gone, and life is no longer life. Some complain of the slights which are put upon them by relations, and they will tell you sadly of how many evils their old age is the cause. But to me, Socrates, these complainers seem to blame that which is not really in fault. For if old age were the cause, I too, being old, and every other old man, would have felt as they do. But this is not my own experience, nor that of others whom I have known. How well I remember the aged poet Sophocles, when in answer to the question, How does love suit with age, Sophocles? Are you still the man you were? Peace, he replied. Most gladly have I escaped the thing of which you speak. I feel as if I had escaped from a mad and furious master. His words have often occurred to my mind since, and they seem as good to me now as at the time when he uttered them. For certainly old age has a great sense of calm and freedom. When the passions relax their hold, then, as Sophocles says, we are freed from the grasp not of one mad master only, but of many. The truth is, Socrates, that these regrets, and also the complaints about relations, are to be attributed to the same cause, which is not old age, but men's characters and tempers. For he who is of a calm and happy nature will hardly feel the pressure of age. But to him who is of an opposite disposition, youth and age are equally a burden. I listened in admiration, and wanting to draw him out, that he might go on, Yes, Cephalus, I said, but I rather suspect that people in general are not convinced by you when you speak thus. They think that old age sits lightly upon you, not because of your happy disposition, but because you are rich, and wealth is well known to be a great comforter. You are right, he replied. They are not convinced, and there is something in what they say, not, however, so much as they imagine. I might answer them as Themistocles answered the Seriphian, who was abusing him, and saying that he was famous not for his own merits, but because he was an Athenian. If you had been a native of my country, or I of yours, neither of us would have been famous. And to those who are not rich, and are impatient of old age, the same reply may be made. For to the good poor man old age cannot be a light burden, nor can a bad rich man ever have peace with himself. May I ask, Cephalus, whether your fortune was for the most part inherited or acquired by you? Acquired, Socrates. Do you want to know how much I acquired? In the art of making money I have been midway between my father and grandfather, for my grandfather, whose name I bear, doubled and trebled the value of his patrimony, that which he inherited being much what I possess now. But my father, Lysanias, reduced the property below what it is at present, and I shall be satisfied if I leave to these my sons not less but a little more than I had received. That was why I asked you the question, I replied, because I see that you are indifferent about money, which is a characteristic rather of those who have inherited their fortunes than of those who have acquired them. The makers of fortunes have a second love of money as a creation of their own, resembling the affection of authors for their own poems, or of parents for their children, besides that natural love of it, for the sake of use and profit which is common to them and all men. And hence they are very bad company for they can talk about nothing but the praises of wealth. That is true, he said. 
"'Yes, that is very true. But may I ask you another question? What do you consider to be the greatest blessing which you have reaped from your wealth?' "'One,' he said, "'of which I could not expect easily to convince others. For let me tell you, Socrates, that when a man thinks himself to be near death, fears and cares into into his mind which he never had before. The tales of a world below, and the punishment which is exacted there of deeds done here, were once a laughing matter to him. But now he is tormented with the thought that they may be true, either from the weakness of age, or because he is now drawing near to that other place, he has a clearer view of these things. Suspicions and alarms crowd thickly upon him, and he begins to reflect and consider what wrongs he has done to others. And when he finds that the sum of his transgressions is great, he will many a time, like a child, start up in his sleep for fear, and he is filled with dark forebodings. But to him who is conscious of no sin, sweet hope, as Pindar charmingly says, is the kind nurse of his age. Hope, he says, cherishes the soul of him who lives in justice and holiness, and is the nurse of his age and the companion of his journey, hope which is mightiest to sway the restless soul of man. How admirable are his words, and the great blessing of riches, I do not say to every man, but to a good man, is that he has had no occasion to deceive or to defraud others, either intentionally or unintentionally and when he departs to the world below, he is not in any apprehension about offerings due to the gods or debts which he owes to men. Now, to this peace of mind the possession of wealth greatly contributes, and therefore I say that setting one thing against another, of the many advantages which wealth has to give to a man of sense, this is, in my opinion, the greatest. "'Well said, Cephalus,' I replied, but as concerning justice, what is it? To speak the truth and to pay your debts no more than this, and even to this are there not exceptions. Suppose that a friend, when in his right mind, has deposited arms with me, and he asks for them when he is not in his right mind, ought I to give them back to him? No one would say that I ought, or that I should be right in doing so, any more than they would say that I ought always to speak the truth to one who is in his condition. You are quite right, he replied. But then, I said, speaking the truth and paying your debts is not a correct definition of justice. Quite correct, Socrates, if Simonides is to be believed, said Polemarchus, interposing. I fear, said Cephalus, that I must go now, for I have to look after the sacrifices, and I hand over the argument to Polemarchus and the company. Is not Polemarchus your heir? I said. To be sure, he answered, and went away, laughing to the sacrifices. Tell me then, O thou heir of the argument, what did Simonides say, and according to you truly say, about justice? He said that the repayment of a debt is just, and in saying so he appears to me to be right. I should be sorry to doubt the word of such a wise and inspired man, but his meaning, though probably clear to you, is the reverse of clear to me. For he certainly does not mean, as we were just now saying, that I ought to return a deposit of arms, or of anything else, to one who asks for it when he is not in his right senses and yet a deposit cannot be denied to be a debt. True. Then, when the person who asks me is not in his right mind, I am by no means to make the return? Certainly not. When Simonides said that the repayment of a debt was justice, he did not mean to include that case. Oh, certainly not, for he thinks that a friend ought always to do good to a friend, and never evil. You mean that the return of a deposit of gold, which is to the injury of the receiver, if the two parties are friends, is not the repayment of a debt? That is what you would imagine him to say? Yes. And are enemies also to receive what we owe to them? To be sure, he said. They are to receive what we owe them, and an enemy, as I take it, owes to an enemy that which is due or proper to him, that is to say, evil. Simonides, then, after the manner of poets, 
would seem to have spoken darkly of the nature of justice, for he really meant to say that justice is the giving to each man what is proper to him, and this he termed a debt. That must have been his meaning, he said. By heaven, I replied, and if we asked him what due or proper thing is given by medicine, and to whom, what answer do you think that he would make to us? He would surely reply that medicine gives drugs and meat and drink to human bodies. And what due or proper thing is given by cookery, and to what? Seasoning to food. And what is that which justice gives, and to whom? If, Socrates, we are to be guided at all by the analogy of the preceding instances, then justice is the art which gives good to friends and evil to enemies. That is his meaning, then? I think so. And who is best able to do good to his friends and evil to his enemies in time of sickness? The physician. Or when they are on a voyage amid the perils of the sea? The pilot. And in what sort of actions, or with a view to what results, is the just man most able to do harm to his enemy and good to his friend? In going to war against the one, and in making alliances with the other. But when a man is well, my dear Polemarchus, there is no need of a physician. No. And he who is not on a voyage has no need of a pilot. No. Then in time of peace justice will be of no use. I am very far from thinking so. You think that justice may be of use in peace as well as in war? Yes. Like husbandry for the acquisition of corn? Yes or like shoemaking for the acquisition of shoes, that is what you mean? Yes. And what similar use or power of acquisition has justice in time of peace? In contracts, Socrates, justice is of use. And by contracts you mean partnerships? Exactly. But is the just man or the skilful player a more useful and better partner at the game of drafts? A skilful player and in the laying of bricks and stones is the just man a more useful or better partner than the builder? Oh, quite the reverse. Then in what sort of partnership is the just man a better partner than the harp player? As in playing the harp, the harp player is certainly a better partner than the just man. In a money partnership. Yes, Polemarchus, but surely not in the use of money, for you do not want a just man to be your counsellor in the purchase or sale of a horse. A man who is knowing about horses would be better for that, would he not? Certainly. And when you want to buy a ship, the shipwright or the pilot would be better. True. Then what is that joint use of silver or gold in which the just man is to be preferred? When you want a deposit to be kept safely. You mean when money is not wanted but allowed to lie. Precisely. That is to say, justice is useful when money is useless that is the inference. And when you want to keep a pruning hook safe, then justice is useful to the individual and to the state. But when you want to use it, then the art of the vine-dresser. Clearly. And when you want to keep a shield or a lyre and not to use them, you would say that justice is useful. But when you want to use them, then the art of the soldier or of the musician. Certainly. And so, of all other things, justice is useful when they are useless, and useless when they are useful. That is the inference. Then justice is not good for much. But let us consider this further point. Is not he who can best strike a blow in a boxing match, or in any kind of fighting, best able to ward off a blow? Certainly. And he who is most skillful in preventing or escaping from a disease is best able to create one? True. And he is the best guard of a camp who is best able to steal a march upon the enemy. Oh, certainly. Then he who is a good keeper of anything is also a good thief? That, I suppose, is to be inferred. Then, if the just man is good at keeping money, he is good at stealing it. That is implied in the argument. Then, after all, the just man has turned out to be a thief. And this is a lesson which I suspect you must have learnt out of Homer, for he, speaking of Autolycus, the maternal grandfather of Odysseus, who is a favourite of his, affirms that 
he was excellent above all men in theft and perjury. And so you and Homer and Simonides are agreed that justice is an art of theft, to be practised, however, for the good of friends and for the harm of enemies. That was what you were saying? No, certainly not that, though I do not know now what I did say, but I still stand by the latter words. Well, there is another question. By friends and enemies, do we mean those who are so really, or only in seeming? Surely, he said, a man may be expected to love those whom he thinks good, and to hate those whom he thinks evil. Yes, but do not persons often err about good and evil? Many who are not good seem to be so, and conversely. Well, that is true. Then to them the good will be enemies, and the evil will be their friends? True, and in that case they will be right in doing good to the evil, and evil to the good? Clearly but the good are just, and would not do an injustice. True. Then, according to your argument, it is just to injure those who do no wrong. Nay, Socrates, th the doctrine is immoral. Then I suppose that we ought to do good to the just, and harm to the unjust. I like that better. But see the consequence. Many a man who is ignorant of human nature has friends who are bad friends, and in that case he ought to do harm to them, and he has good enemies whom he ought to benefit. But if so, we shall be saying the very opposite of that which we affirmed to be the meaning of Simonides. Very true, he said, and I think that we had better correct an error into which we seem to have fallen in the use of the words friend and enemy. What was the error, Polemarchus? I asked. We assume that he is a friend who seems to be, or who is thought, good. And how is the error to be corrected? We should rather say that he is a friend who is, as well as seems, good, and that he who seems only, and is not good, only seems to be, and is not a friend, and of an enemy the same may be said. You would argue that the good are our friends, and the bad our enemies? Yes. And instead of saying simply, as we did at first, that it is just to do good to our friends and harm to our enemies, we should further say, it is just to do good to our friends when they are good, and harm to our enemies when they are evil. Yes, that appears to me to be the truth. But ought the just to injure any one at all? Undoubtedly he ought to injure those who are both wicked and his enemies. When horses are injured, are they improved or deteriorated? The latter. Deteriorated, that is to say, in the good qualities of horses, not of dogs. Yes, of horses. And dogs are deteriorated in the good qualities of dogs, and not of horses? Of course. And will not men who are injured be deteriorated in that which is the proper virtue of man? Certainly. And that human virtue is justice, to be sure then men who are injured are of necessity made unjust. That is the result. But can the musician by his art make men unmusical? Well, certainly not. Or the horseman by his art make them bad horsemen? Impossible. And can the just by justice make men unjust? Or, speaking generally, can the good by virtue make them bad? Oh, assuredly not. Any more than heat can produce cold? It cannot, or drought moisture, clearly not, nor can the good harm any one. Impossible. And the just is the good, certainly. Then to injure a friend or any one else is not the act of a just man, but of the opposite, who is the unjust. I think that what you say is quite true, Socrates. Then if a man says that justice consists in the repayment of debts, and that good is the debt which a just man owes to his friends, and evil the debt which he owes to his enemies, to say this is not wise. For it is not true, if, as has been clearly shown, the injuring of another can be in no case just. I agree with you, said Polemarchus. Then you and I are prepared to take up arms against any one who attributes such a saying to Simonides, or Bias, or Pittacus or any other wise man or seer. I am quite ready to do battle at your side, he said. Shall I tell you whose I believe the saying to be? Whose? 
I believe that Periander, or Perdicus, or Xerxes, or Ismenius the Theban, or some other rich and mighty man, who had a great opinion of his own power, was the first to say that justice is doing good to your friends and harm to your enemies. Most true, he said. Yes, I said, but if this definition of justice also breaks down, what other can be offered? Several times in the course of the discussion, Thrasymachus had made an attempt to get the argument into his own hands, and had been put down by the rest of the company who wanted to hear the end. But when Polymarchus and I had done speaking, and there was a pause, he could no longer hold his peace, and gathering himself up, he came at us like a wild beast, seeking to devour us. We were quite panic-stricken at the sight of him. He roared out to the whole company, "'What folly, Socrates, has taken possession of you all, and why, silly billies, do you knock under to one another? I say that if you want really to know what justice is, you should not only ask, but answer, and you should not seek honour to yourself from the refutation of an opponent, but have your own answer. For there is many a one who can ask and cannot answer. And now I will not have you say that justice is duty, or advantage, or profit, or gain, or interest, for this sort of nonsense will not do for me. I must have clearness and accuracy. I was panic-stricken at his words, and could not look at him without trembling. Indeed, I believe that if I had not fixed my eye upon him, I should have been struck dumb. But when I saw his fury rising, I looked at him first, and was therefore able to reply to him. Thrasymachus, I said, with a quiver, don't be hard upon us. Polymarchus and I may have been guilty of a little mistake in the argument, but I can assure you that the error was not intentional. If we were seeking for a piece of gold, you would not imagine that we were knocking under to one another, and so losing our chance of finding it. And why, when we are seeking for justice, a thing more precious than many pieces of gold, do you say that we are weakly yielding to one another, and not doing our utmost to get at the truth? Nay, my good friend, we are most willing and anxious to do so but the fact is that we cannot. And if so, you people who know all things should pity us, and not be angry with us. How characteristic of Socrates, he replied, with a bitter laugh. <laughs> That's your ironical style. Did I not foresee, have I not already told you, that whatever he was asked he would refuse to answer, and try irony or any other shuffle, in order that he might avoid answering. "'You are a philosopher, Thrasymachus,' I replied, and well know that if you ask a person what numbers make up twelve, taking care to prohibit him whom you ask from answering twice six, or three times four, or six times two, or four times three, for this sort of nonsense will not do for me, then, obviously, if that is your way of putting the question, no one can answer you. But suppose that he were to retort, Thrasymachus, what do you mean? If one of these numbers which you interdict be the true answer to the question, am I falsely to say some other number which is not the right one? Is that your meaning? How would you answer him? Just as if the two cases were at all alike, he said. But why should they not be? I replied, and even if they are not, but only appear to be so to the person who is asked, ought he not to say what he thinks, whether you and I forbid him or not? I presume, then, that you are going to make one of the interdicted answers. I dare say that I may, notwithstanding the danger, if upon reflection I approve of any of them. But what if I give you an answer about justice other and better, he said, than any of these? What do you deserve to have done to you? Done to me? As becomes the ignorant, I must learn from the wise. That is what I deserve to have done to me. What, and no payment? A pleasant notion. I will pay when I have the money, I replied. But you have, Socrates, said Glaucon, and you, Thrasymachus, need to be under no anxiety about money, for we will all make a contribution for Socrates. Yes, he replied, and then Socrates will do as he always does, refuse to answer himself, but take and pull to pieces the answer of someone else. Why, my good friend, I said, 
how can any one answer who knows and says that he knows just nothing and who even if he has some faint notions of his own is told by a man of authority not to utter them the natural thing is that the speaker should be some one like yourself who professes to know and can tell what he knows will you then kindly answer for the edification of the company and of myself glaucon and the rest of the company joined in my request and thrasymachus as any one might see was in reality eager to speak for he thought that he had an excellent answer and would distinguish himself but at first he affected to insist on my answering at length he consented to begin behold he said the wisdom of socrates he refuses to teach himself and goes about learning of others to whom he never even says thank you that i learn of others i replied is quite true but that i am ungrateful i wholly deny money i have none and therefore i pay in praise which is all i have and how ready i am to praise any one who appears to me to speak well you will very soon find out when you answer for i expect that you will answer well listen then he said i proclaim that justice is nothing else than the interest of the stronger and now why do you not praise me but of course you won't let me first understand you i replied justice as you say is the interest of the stronger what thrasymachus is the meaning of this you cannot mean to say that because polydamus the pancratiest is stronger than we are and finds the eating of beef conducive to his bodily strength that to eat beef is therefore equally for our good who are weaker than he is and right and just for us that's abominable of you socrates you take the words in the sense which is most damaging to the argument not at all my good sir i said i am trying to understand them and i wish that you would be a little clearer well he said have you never heard that forms of government differ there are tyrannies and there are democracies and there are aristocracies yes i know and the government is the ruling power in each state certainly and the different forms of government make laws democratical aristocratical tyrannical with a view to their several interests and these laws which are made by them for their own interests are the justice which they deliver to their subjects and him who transgresses them they punish as a breaker of the law and unjust and that is what i mean when i say that in all states there is the same principle of justice which is the interest of the government and as the government must be supposed to have power the only reasonable conclusion is that everywhere there is one principle of justice which is the interest of the stronger now i understand you i said and whether you are right or not i will try to discover but let me remark that in defining justice you have yourself used the word interest which you forbade me to use it is true however that in your definition the words of the stronger are added a small addition you must allow he said great or small never mind about that we must first inquire whether what you are saying is the truth now we are both agreed that justice is interest of some sort but you go on to say of the stronger about this addition i am not so sure and must therefore consider further proceed i will and first tell me do you admit that it is just for subjects to obey their rulers i do but are the rulers of states absolutely infallible or are they sometimes liable to err to be sure he replied they are likely to err then in making their laws they may sometimes make them rightly and sometimes not true when they make them rightly they make them agreeable to their interest when they are mistaken contrary to their interest you admit that yes and the laws which they make must be obeyed by their subjects and that is what you call justice doubtless then justice according to your argument is not only obedience to the interest of the stronger but the reverse what is that you are saying he asked i am only repeating what you are saying i believe but let us consider 
Have we not admitted that the rulers may be mistaken about their own interest in what they command, and also that to obey them is justice? Has not that been admitted? Yes. Then you must also have acknowledged justice not to be for the interest of the stronger, when the rulers intentionally command things to be done which are to their own injury. For if, as you say, justice is the obedience which the subject renders to their commands, in that case, O oh, wisest of men, is there any escape from the conclusion that the weaker are commanded to do not what is for the interest, but what is for the injury of the stronger? Nothing can be clearer, Socrates, said Polymarchus. Yes, said Clytophon, interposing, if you are allowed to be his witness. But there is no need of any witness, said Polymarchus, for Thrasymachus himself acknowledges that rulers may sometimes command what is not for their own interest, and that for subjects to obey them is justice. Yes, Polymarchus, Thrasymachus said that for subjects to do what was commanded by their rulers is just. Yes, Clytophon, but he also said that justice is the interest of the stronger, and while admitting both these propositions, he further acknowledged that the stronger may command the weaker who are his subjects to do what is not for his own interest, whence follows that justice is the injury quite as much as the interest of the stronger. But, said Clytophon, he meant by the interest of the stronger what the stronger thought to be his interest. This is what the weaker had to do, and this was affirmed by him to be justice. Those were not his words, rejoined Polymarchus. Never mind, I replied. If he now says that they are, let us accept his statement. Tell me, Thrasymachus, I said, did you mean by justice what the stronger thought to be his interest, whether really so or not? Well, certainly not, he said. Do you suppose that I call him who is mistaken the stronger at the time when he is mistaken? Yes. I said, my impression was that you did so, when you admitted that the ruler was not infallible, but might be sometimes mistaken. You argue like an informer, Socrates. Do you mean, for example, that he who is mistaken about the sick is a physician in that he is mistaken, or that he who errs in arithmetic or grammar is an arithmetician or grammarian at the time when he is making the mistake, in respect of the mistake? True, we say that the physician or arithmetician or grammarian has made a mistake, but this is only a way of speaking, for the fact is that neither the grammarian nor any other person of skill ever makes a mistake in so far as he is what his name implies. They none of them err unless their skill fails them, and then they cease to be skilled artists. No artist or sage or ruler errs at the time when he is what his name implies though he is commonly said to err, and I adopted the common mode of speaking. But to be perfectly accurate, since you are such a lover of accuracy, we should say that the ruler, in so far as he is a ruler, is unerring, and being unerring always commands that which is for his own interest, and the subject is required to execute his commands, and therefore, as I said at first, and now repeat, justice is the interest of the stronger. Indeed, Thrasymachus, and do I really appear to you to argue like an informer? Certainly, he replied. And do you suppose that I ask these questions with any design of injuring you in the argument? Nay, he replied, suppose is not the word, I know it, but you will be found out, and by sheer force of argument you will never prevail. I shall not make the attempt, my dear man but to avoid any misunderstanding occurring between us in future, let me ask, in what sense do you speak of a ruler or stronger, whose interest, as you were saying, he being the superior, it is just that the inferior should execute? Is he a ruler in the popular or in the strict sense of the term? In the strictest of all senses, he said. And now cheat and play the informer if you can. I ask no quarter at your hands." but you never will be able, never. And do you imagine, I said, that I am such a madman as to try and cheat, Thrasymachus? I might as well shave a lion. Why, he said, you made the attempt a minute ago, and you failed. Enough, I said, of these civilities. It will be better that I should ask you a question. Is the physician, 
taken in that strict sense of which you were speaking, a healer of the sick, or a maker of money. And remember that I am now speaking of the true physician. A healer of the sick, he replied. And the pilot, that is to say, the true pilot, is he a captain of sailors or a mere sailor? A captain of sailors. The circumstance that he sails in the ship is not to be taken into account, neither is he to be called a sailor. The name pilot by which he is distinguished has nothing to do with sailing, but is significant of his skill and of his authority over the sailors. Very true, he said. Now, I said, every art has an interest, certainly, for which the art has to consider and provide. Yes, that is the aim of art. And the interest of any art is the perfection of it, this and nothing else. What do you mean? I mean what I may illustrate negatively by the example of the body. Suppose you were to ask me whether the body is self-sufficing, or has wants. I should reply, certainly the body has wants, for the body may be ill and require to be cured, and has therefore interests to which the art of medicine ministers, and this is the origin and intention of medicine, as you will acknowledge. Am I right? Quite right, he replied. But is the art of medicine, or any other art, faulty or deficient in any quality, in the same way that the eye may be deficient in sight, or the ear fail of hearing, and therefore requires another art to provide for the interests of seeing and hearing? Has art in itself, I say, any similar liability to fault or defect, and does every art require another supplementary art to provide for its interests, and that another and another without end? Or have the arts to look only after their own interests? Or have they no need either of themselves or of another? Having no faults or defects, they have no need to correct them, either by the exercise of their own art or of any other. They have only to consider the interest of their subject matter. For every art remains pure and faultless while remaining true, that is to say, while perfect and unimpaired. Take the words in your precise sense, and tell me whether I am not right. Yes, clearly. Then medicine does not consider the interest of medicine, but the interest of the body. True, he said. Nor does the art of horsemanship consider the interests of the art of horsemanship, but the interests of the horse. Neither do any other arts care for themselves, for they have no needs. They care only for that which is the subject of their art. True, he said. But surely, Thrasymachus, the arts are the superiors and rulers of their own subjects. To this he assented with a good deal of reluctance. Then, I said, no science or art considers or enjoins the interest of the stronger or superior, but only the interest of the subject and the weaker. He made an attempt to contest this proposition also, but finally acquiesced. Then, I continued, no physician, in so far as he is a physician, considers his own good in what he prescribes, but the good of his patient. For the true physician is also a ruler having the human body as a subject, and he is not a mere money-maker. That has been admitted. Yes. And the pilot, likewise, in the strict sense of the term, is a ruler of sailors, and not a mere sailor. That has been admitted and such a pilot and ruler will provide and prescribe for the interest of the sailor who is under him, and not for his own or the ruler's interest. He gave a reluctant yes. Then, I said, Thrasymachus, there is no one in any rule who, in so far as he is a ruler, considers or enjoins what is for his own interest, but always what is for the interest of his subject, or suitable to his art. To that he looks, and that alone he considers in everything which he says and does. End of Part One Book One, Part Two of The Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Niffeld. When we had got to this point in the argument, and every one saw that the definition of justice had been completely upset, Trasymachus, instead of replying to me, said, Tell me, Socrates, have you got a nurse? Why do you ask such a question, I said, when you ought rather to be answering? 
because she leaves you to snivel, and never wipes your nose. She has not even taught you to know the shepherd from the sheep. What makes you say that? I replied. Because you fancy that the shepherd or neat's herd fattens or tends the sheep or oxen with a view to their own good, and not to the good of himself or his master. And you further imagine that the rulers of states, if they are true rulers, never think of their subjects as sheep, and that they are not studying their own advantage day and night. Oh, no! And so entirely astray are you in your ideas about the just and unjust, as not even to know that justice, and the just are in reality another's good. That is to say, the interest of the ruler and stronger, and the loss of the subject and the servant, and injustice the opposite. For the unjust is lord over the truly simple and just. He is the stronger, and his subjects do what is for his interests, and minister to his happiness, which is very far from being their own. Consider further, most foolish Socrates, that the just is always a loser in comparison with the unjust. First of all, in private contracts, wherever the unjust is the partner of the just, you will find that, when the partnership is dissolved, the unjust man has always more and the just less. Secondly, in their dealings with the state, when there is an income tax, the just man will pay more, and the unjust less on the same amount of income and when there is anything to be received, the one gains nothing, and the other much. Observe also what happens when they take an office. There is the just man neglecting his affairs, and perhaps suffering other losses, and getting nothing out of the public, because he is just. Moreover, he is hated by his friends and acquaintances for refusing to serve them in unlawful ways. But all this is reversed in the case of the unjust man. I am speaking, as before, of injustice on a large scale, in which the advantage of the unjust is most apparent, and my meaning will be most clearly seen if we turn to that highest form of injustice in which the criminal is the happiest of men, and the sufferers, or those who refuse to do injustice, are the most miserable, that is to say, tyranny, which by fraud and force takes away the property of others, not little by little, but wholesale comprehending in one things sacred as well as profane private and public for which acts of wrong if he were detected perpetrating any of them singly he would be punished and incur great disgrace they who do such wrong in particular cases are called robbers of temples and man-stealers and burglars and swindlers and thieves but when a man besides taking away the money of the citizens has made slaves of them then, instead of these names of reproach, he is termed happy and blessed, and not only by the citizens, but by all who hear of his having achieved the consummation of injustice. For mankind censure injustice, fearing that they may be the victims of it, and not because they shrink from committing it. And thus I have shown Socrates injustice, when on a sufficient scale, has more strength and freedom and mastery than justice and, as I said, at first, justice is the interest of a stronger, whereas injustice is a man's own profit and interest. Trisimachus, when he had thus spoken, having, like a bathman, deluged our ears with his words, had a mind to go away. But the company would not let him. They insisted that he should remain and defend his position, and I myself added my own humble request that he would not leave us. Trisimachus, I said to him, excellent man, how suggestive are your remarks, and are you going to run away before you have fairly taught and learned whether they are true or not? Is the attempt to determine the way of man's life so small a matter in your eyes to determine how life may be passed by each one of us to the greatest advantage? And do I differ from you, he said, as to the importance of the inquiry? You appear rather, I replied, to have no care or thought about us, Trisimachus, whether we live better or worse from not knowing what you say you know is to you a matter of indifference. Pray thee, friend, do not keep your knowledge to yourself. We are a large party, and any benefit which you confer upon us will be amply rewarded. For my own part, 
I openly declare that I am not convinced, and that I do not believe in justice to be more gainful than justice, even if uncontrolled and allowed to have free play. For, granting that there may be an unjust man who is able to commit injustice either by fraud or force, still this does not convince me of the superior advantage of injustice, and there may be others who are in the same predicament as myself. Perhaps we may be wrong. If so, you, in your wisdom, should convince us that we are mistaken in preferring justice to injustice. And how am I to convince you, he said, if you are not already convinced by what I have just said? What more can I do for you? Would you have me put the proof bodily into your souls? Heaven forbid, I said. I would only ask you to be consistent, or, if you change, change openly, and let there be no deception. For I must remark, Thrasymachus, if you will recall what was previously said, that although you began by defining the true position in an exact sense, you do not observe a like exactness when speaking of the shepherd. You thought that the shepherd, as a shepherd, tends the sheep not with a view to their own good, but more like a diner or banqueter with a view to the pleasures of the table, or, again, as a trader for sale in the market, and not as a shepherd. Yet surely the art of the shepherd is concerned only with the good of his subjects. He has only to provide the best for them, since the perfection of the art is already ensured whenever all the requirements of it are satisfied. And that was what I was saying just now about the ruler. I conceive that the art of the ruler, considered as ruler, whether in a state or in private life, can only regard the good of his flock or subjects, whereas you seem to think that the rulers in states, that is to say, the true rulers, like being in authority. Think? Nay, I am sure of it. Then why, in the case of lesser offices, do men never take them willingly without payment, unless under the idea that they govern for the advantage not of themselves, but of others? Let me ask you a question. Are not the several arts different, by reason of their each having a separate function? And, my dear illustrious friend, do say what you think, that we may make a little progress. Yes, that is the difference, he replied and each art gives us a particular good, and not merely a general one. Medicine, for example, gives us health, navigation, safety at sea, and so on. Yes, he said. And the art of payment has the special function of giving pay, but we do not confuse this with other arts, any more than the art of the pilot is to be confused with the art of medicine, because the health of the pilot may be improved by a sea voyage. You would not be inclined to say, would you, that navigation is the art of medicine, at least if we are to adopt your exact use of language? Certainly not. Or, because a man is in good health when he receives pay, you would not say that the art of payment is medicine? I should not. Nor would you say that medicine is the art of receiving pay, because a man takes fees when he is engaged in healing? Certainly not. And we have admitted, I said, that the good of each art is specially confined to the art? Yes. Then, if there be any good which all artists have in common, that is to be attributed to something of which they all have the common use? True, he replied. And when the artist is benefited by receiving pay, the advantage is gained by an additional use of the art of pay, which is not the art professed by him? He gave a reluctant assent to this. Then the pay is not derived by the several artists from their respective arts. But the truth is that while the art of medicine gives health, and the art of the builder builds a house, another art attends them, which is the art of pay. The various arts may be doing their own business, and benefiting that over which they preside, but would the artist receive any benefit from his art unless he were paid as well? I suppose not. But does he therefore confer no benefit when he works for nothing? Certainly he confers a benefit. Then now, Trisemachus, there is no longer any doubt that neither arts nor governments provide for their own interests, but, as we were before saying, 
they rule and provide for the interests of their subjects, who are the weaker and not the stronger. To their good they attend, and not to the good of the superior. And this is the reason, my dear Trisemachus, why, as I was just now saying, no one is willing to govern, because no one likes to take in hand the reformation of evils which are not his concern without remuneration. For in the execution of his work, and in giving his orders to another, the true artist does not regard his own interest, but always that of his subjects, and therefore, in order that rulers may be willing to rule, they must be paid in one of three modes of payment, money, or honour, or a penalty for refusing. "'What do you mean, Socrates?' said Glaucon. The first two modes of payment are intelligible enough, but what the penalty is I do not understand, and how a penalty can be a payment. You mean that you do not understand the nature of this payment, which to the best man is the great inducement to rule? Of course you know that ambition and avarice are held to be, as indeed they are, a disgrace. Very true. And for this reason, I said, money and honour have no attraction for them. Good men do not wish to be openly demanding payment for governing, and so to get the name of hirelings, nor by secretly helping themselves out of the public revenues to get the name of thieves, and not being ambitious they do not care about honour. Wherefore necessity must be laid upon them, and they must be induced to serve from the fear of punishment. And this, as I imagine, is the reason why the forwardness to take office instead of waiting to be compelled, has been deemed dishonourable. Now, the worst part of the punishment is that he who refuses to rule is liable to be ruled by one who is worse than himself, and the fear of this, as I conceive, induces the good to take office, not because they would, but because they cannot help, not under the idea that they are going to have any benefit or enjoyment themselves, but as a necessity, and because they are not to commit the task of ruling to any one who is better than themselves, or indeed as good. For there is reason to think that if a city were composed entirely of good men, then to avoid office would be as much an object of contention as to obtain office is at present. Then we should have plain proof that the true ruler is not bent by nature to regard his own interest, but that of his subjects, and every one who knew this would choose rather to receive a benefit from another than to have the trouble of conferring one. So far am I from agreeing with Trasimachus that justice is the interest of the stronger. This latter question need not be further discussed at present. But when Trasimachus says that the life of the unjust is more advantageous than that of the just, his new statement appears to me to be of a far more serious character. Which of us has spoken truly, and which sort of life, Glaucon, do you prefer? I, for my part, deem the life of the just to be the more advantageous, he answered. Do you hear all the advantages of the unjust which Trasimachus was rehearsing? Yes, I heard him, he replied, but he has not convinced me. Then shall we try to find some way of convincing him, if we can, that he is saying what is not true. Most certainly, he replied. If, I said, he makes a set speech, and we make another, recounting all the advantages of being just, and he answers, and we rejoin, there must be a numbering and measuring of the goods which are claimed on either side, and in the end we shall want judges to decide. But if we proceed in our inquiry as we lately did, by making admissions to one another, we shall unite the offices of judge and advocate in our own persons. Very good, he said. And which method do I understand you to prefer, I said? That which you propose. Well then, Trasimachus, I said, suppose you begin at the beginning and answer me. You say that perfect injustice is more gainful than perfect justice. Yes, that is what I say, and I have given you my reasons. And what is your view about them? Would you call one of them virtue and the other vice? Certainly. I suppose that you would call justice virtue and injustice vice. What a charming notion! So likely, too, seeing that I affirm injustice to be profitable and justice not. 
"'What else, then, would you say?' "'The opposite,' he replied. "'And would you call justice vice?' "'No, I would rather say sublime simplicity. "'Then would you call injustice malignity? "'No, I would rather say discretion. "'And do the unjust appear to you to be wise and good?' "'Yes,' he said. "'At any rate, those of them who are able to be perfectly unjust, "'and who have the power of subduing states and nations. "'But perhaps you imagine me to be talking of cut-purses.' Even this profession, if undetected, has advantages, though they are not to be compared with those of which I was just now speaking. I do not think that I misapprehend your meaning, Trasimachus, I replied, but still I cannot hear without amazement that you class injustice with wisdom and virtue, and justice with the opposite. Certainly I do so class them. Now, I said, you are on more substantial and almost unanswerable ground, for if the injustice which you were maintaining to be profitable had been admitted by you as by others to be vice and deformity, an answer might have been given to you on received principles. But now I perceive that you will call injustice honourable and strong, and to the unjust you will attribute all the qualities which are attributed by us before to the just seeing that you do not hesitate to rank injustice with wisdom and virtue. "'You have guessed most infallibly,' he replied. "'Then I certainly ought not to shrink from going through the argument, so long as I have reason to think that you, Trasimachus, are speaking your real mind. For I do believe that you are now in earnest, and are not amusing yourself at our expense. I may be in earnest or not, but what is that to you? To refute the argument is your business. Very true, I said. That is what I have to do. But will you be so good as to answer yet one more question? Does the just man try to gain any advantage over the just? Far otherwise. If he did, he would not be the simple, amusing creature which he is. And would he try to go beyond just action? He would not. And how would he regard the attempt to gain an advantage over the unjust? Would that be considered by him as just or unjust? He would think it just, and would try to gain the advantage, but he would not be able. Whether he would or would not be able, I said, is not the point. My question is only whether the just man, while refusing to have more than another just man, would wish and claim to have more than the unjust. Yes, he would. And what of the unjust? Does he claim to have more than the just man, and to do more than is just? Of course, he said, for he claims to have more than all men. And the unjust man will strive and struggle to obtain more than the unjust man or action, in order that he may have more than all? True. We may put the matter thus, I said. The just does not desire more than his like, but more than his unlike, whereas the unjust desires more than both his like and his unlike. Nothing, he said, can be better than that statement. And the unjust is good and wise, and the just is neither. Good again, he said. And is not the unjust like the wise and good, and the just unlike them? Of course, he said. He who is of a certain nature is like those who are of a certain nature. He who is not, not. Each of them, I said, is such as his like is. Certainly, he replied. Very good, Trasimachus, I said. And now to take the case of the arts. You would admit that one man is a musician and another not a musician. Yes. And which is wise and which is foolish? Clearly the musician is wise, and he who is not a musician is foolish. And he is good in as far as he is wise, and bad in as far as he is foolish? Yes. And you would say the same sort of thing of the physician? Yes. And do you think, my excellent friend, that a musician, when he adjusts the lyre, would desire or claim to exceed or go beyond a musician in the tightening and loosening the strings? I do not think that he would. But he would claim to exceed the non-musician? Of course. And what would you say of the physician? 
in prescribing meats and drinks would he wish to go beyond another physician or beyond the practice of medicine he would not but he would wish to go beyond the non-physician yes and about knowledge and ignorance in general see whether you think that any man who has knowledge ever would wish to have the choice of saying or doing more than another man who has knowledge would he not rather say or do the same as his like in the same case that i suppose could hardly be denied and what of the ignorant would he not desire to have more than either the knowing or the ignorant i dare say and the knowing is wise yes and the wise is good true then the wise and good will not desire to gain more than his like but more than his unlike and opposite i suppose so whereas the bad and ignorant will desire to gain more than both yes but did we not say trasimachus that the unjust goes beyond both his like and unlike were not these your words they were and you also said that the just will not go beyond his like but his unlike yes then the just is like the wise and good and the unjust like the evil and ignorant that is the inference and each of them is such as his like is that was admitted then the just has turned out to be wise and good and the unjust evil and ignorant Trasimachus made all these admissions, not fluently, as I repeat them, but with extreme reluctance. It was a hot summer's day, and the perspiration poured from him in torrents. And then I saw what I had never seen before, Trasimachus blushing. As we were now agreed that justice was virtue and wisdom, and injustice vice and ignorance, I proceeded to another point. Well, I said, Trisimachus, that matter is now settled. But were we not also saying that injustice had strength? Do you remember? Yes, I remember, he said. But do not suppose that I approve of what you are saying, or have no answer. If, however, I were to answer, you would be quite certain to accuse me of haranguing. Therefore, either permit me to have my say out, or, if you would rather ask, do so and I will answer very good, as they say to story-telling old women, and will nod yes and no. Certainly not, I said, if contrary to your real opinion. Yes, he said, I will, to please you, since you will not let me speak. What else would you have? Nothing in the world, I said, and if you are so disposed, I will ask, and you shall answer. Proceed then i will repeat the question which i asked before in order that our examination of the relative nature of justice and injustice may be carried on regularly a statement was made that injustice is stronger and more powerful than justice but now justice having been identified with wisdom and virtue is easily shown to be stronger than injustice if injustice is ignorance this can no longer be questioned by any one but I want to view the matter, Trisimachus, in a different way. You would not deny that a state may be unjust, and may be unjustly attempting to enslave other states, or may have already enslaved them, and may be holding many of them in subjection. True, he replied, and I will add that the best and most perfectly unjust state would be most likely to do so. I know, I said, that such was your position but what i would further consider is whether this power which is possessed by the superior state can exist or be exercised without justice or only with justice if you are right in your view and justice is wisdom then only with justice but if i am right then without justice i am delighted trasimachus to see you not only nodding assent and dissent but making answers which are quite excellent. That is out of civility to you, he replied. You are very kind, I said, and would you have the goodness also to inform me whether you think that a state, or an army, or a band of robbers and thieves, or any other gang of ill-doers, could act at all if they injured one another? No, indeed, he said, they could not. 
but if they abstain from injuring one another, then they might act together better? Yes. And this is because injustice creates divisions and hatreds and fighting, and justice imparts harmony and friendship. Is not that true, Trasimachus? I agree, he said, because I do not wish to quarrel with you. How good of you, I said. But I should like to know also whether injustice, having this tendency to arouse hatred, wherever existing, among slaves or among freemen, will not make them hate one another and set them at variance and render them incapable of common action. Certainly. And even if injustice be found in two only, will they not quarrel and fight, and become enemies to one another and to the just? They will. And suppose injustice abiding in a single person, would your wisdom say that she loses or that she retains her natural power? Or let us assume that she retains her power. Yet is not the power which injustice exercises of such a nature that wherever she takes up her abode, whether in a city, in an army, in a family, or in any other body, that body is, to begin with, rendered incapable of united action by reason of sedition and distraction, and does it not become its own enemy, and at variance with all that opposes it, and with the just? Is not this the case? Yes, certainly. And is not injustice equally fatal when existing in a single person, in the first place rendering him incapable of action because he is not at unity with himself, and in the second place making him an enemy to himself and the just? Is not that true, Trasimachus? Yes. And, O oh, my friend, I said, surely the gods are just? Granted that they are. But if so, the unjust will be the enemy of the gods, and the just will be their friend. Feast away in triumph, and take your fill of the argument. I will not oppose you, lest I should displease the company. Well, then, proceed with your answers, and let me have the remainder of my repast. For we have already shown that the just are clearly wiser and better and abler than the unjust, and that the unjust are incapable of common action. Nay, more, that to speak as we did of men who are evil acting at any time vigorously together is not strictly true, for if they had been perfectly evil they would have laid hands upon one another. But it is evident that there must have been some remnant of justice in them which enabled them to combine. If there had not been, they would have injured one another as well as their victims. They were but half-villains in their enterprises, for had they been whole villains and utterly unjust, they would have been utterly incapable of action. That, as I believe, is the truth of the matter, and not what you said at first. But whether the just have a better and happier life than the unjust is a further question which we also propose to consider. I think that they have, and for the reasons which I have given. But still, I should like to examine further, for no light matter is at stake, nothing less than the rule of human life. Proceed. I will proceed by asking a question. Would you not say that a horse has some end? I should. And the end or use of a horse or of anything would be that which could not be accomplished, or not so well accomplished, by any other thing. I do not understand, he said. Let me explain. Can you see except with the eye? Certainly not. Or hear except with the ear? No. These, then, may be truly said to be the ends of these organs. They may but you can cut off a vine branch with a dagger or with a chisel, and in many other ways, of course, and yet not so well as with a pruning hook made for the purpose. True. May we not say that this is the end of a pruning hook? We may. Then now I think you will have no difficulty in understanding my meaning when I asked the question whether the end of anything would be that which could not be accomplished or not so well accomplished by any other thing. I understand your meaning, he said, and assent. And that to which an end is appointed has also an excellence. Need I ask again whether the eye has an end? 
It has, and has not the eye an excellence? Yes. And the ear has an end and an excellence also? True. And the same is true of all other things. They have each of them an end and a special excellence. That is so. Well, and can the eyes fulfill their end if they are wanting in their own proper excellence and have a defect instead? Oh, how can they, he said, if they are blind and cannot see? You mean to say, if they have lost their proper excellence, which is sight. But I have not arrived at that point yet. I would rather ask the question more generally, and only inquire whether the things which fulfill their ends fulfill them by their own proper excellence, and fail of fulfilling them by their own defect. Certainly, he replied. I might say the same of the ears. When deprived of their own proper excellence, they cannot fulfill their end. True. And the same observation will apply to all other things? I agree. Well, and has not the soul an end which nothing else can fulfill? For example, to superintend and command and deliberate and the like. Are not these functions proper to the soul, and can they rightly be assigned to any other? To no other. And is not life to be reckoned among the ends of the soul? Assuredly, he said. And has not the soul an excellence also? Yes. And can she, or can she not, fulfill her own ends when deprived of that excellence? She cannot. Then an evil soul must necessarily be an evil ruler and superintendent, and the good soul a good ruler. Yes, necessarily. And we have admitted that justice is the excellence of the soul, and injustice the defect of the soul. That has been admitted. Then the just soul and the just man will live well and the unjust man will live ill, that is what your argument proves. And he who lives well is blessed and happy, and he who lives ill the reverse of happy. Certainly. Then the just is happy, and the unjust miserable. So be it. But happiness, and not misery, is profitable. Of course. Then, my blessed Trisimachus, Injustice can never be more profitable than justice. Let this, Socrates, he said, be your entertainment at the Bendidia. For which I am indebted to you, I said, now that you have grown gentle towards me and have left off scolding. Nevertheless, I have not been well entertained, but that was my own fault and not yours. As an epicure snatches a taste of every dish which is successively brought to table, he not having allowed himself time to enjoy the one before, so have I gone from one subject to another without having discovered what I sought at first, the nature of justice. I left that inquiry and turned away to consider whether justice is virtue and wisdom, or evil and folly, and when there arose a further question about the comparative advantages of justice and injustice, I could not refrain from passing on to that. And the result of the whole discussion has been that I know nothing at all. For I know not what justice is, and therefore I am not likely to know whether it is or is not a virtue, nor can I say whether the just man is happy or unhappy. End of Book One Book Two, Part One of the Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. With these words, I was thinking that I had made an end to the discussion, but the end, in truth, proved only to be a beginning. For Glaucon, who was always the most pugnacious of men, was dissatisfied at Trisimachus's retirement. He wanted to have the battle out. So he said to me, Socrates, do you wish really to persuade us, or only to seem to have persuaded us, that to be just is always better than to be unjust? I should wish really to persuade you, I replied, if I could. Then you certainly have not succeeded. Let me ask you now, how would you arrange goods? Are there not some which we welcome for their own sakes, and independently of their consequences? as, for example, harmless pleasures and enjoyments, 
which delight us at the time, although nothing follows from them. I agree in thinking there is such a class, I replied. Is there not also a second class of goods, such as knowledge, sight, or health, which are desirable not only in themselves, but also for their results? Certainly, I said. And would you not recognize a third class, such as gymnastic, and the care of the sick, and the physician's art, also the various ways of money-making? These do us good, but we regard them as disagreeable, and no one would choose them for their own sakes, but only for the sake of some reward or result which flows from them. There is, I said, this third class also. But why do you ask? Because I want to know in which of the three classes you would place justice. In the highest class, I replied. Among those goods which he who would be happy desires both for their own sake and for the sake of their results. Then the many are of another mind. They think the justice is to be reckoned in the troublesome class, among goods which are to be pursued for the sake of rewards and of reputation, but in themselves are disagreeable and rather to be avoided. I know, I said, that this is their manner of thinking, and that this was the thesis which Thrasymachus was maintaining just now, when he censured justice and praised injustice. But I am too stupid to be convinced by him. I wish, he said, that you should hear me as well as him, and then I shall see whether you and I agree. For Trasimachus seems to me like a snake to have been charmed by your voice sooner than he ought to have been. But to my mind the nature of justice and injustice have not yet been made clear. Setting aside their rewards and results, I want to know what they are in themselves, and how they inwardly work in the soul. If you please, then, I will revive the argument of Trasimachus, and first I will speak of the nature and origin of justice according to the common view of them. Secondly, I will show that all men who practice justice do so against their will, of necessity, but not as a good. And thirdly, I will argue that there is reason in this view, for the life of the unjust is, after all, better far than the life of the just, if what they say is true, Socrates, since I myself am not of their opinion. But still, I acknowledge that I am perplexed when I hear the voices of Trasimachus and myriads of others dinning in my ears, and, on the other hand, I have never yet heard the superiority of justice to injustice maintained by any one in a satisfactory way. I want to hear justice praised in respect of itself. Then I shall be satisfied, and you are the person from whom I think that I am most likely to hear this, and therefore I will praise the unjust life to the utmost of my power, and my manner of speaking will indicate the manner in which I desire to hear you too praising justice and censuring injustice. Will you say whether you approve of my proposal? Indeed, I do, nor can I imagine any theme about which a man of sense would oftener wish to converse. I am delighted, he replied, to hear you say so, and shall begin by speaking, as I proposed, of the nature and origin of justice. They say that to do injustice is by nature good, to suffer injustice evil, but that the evil is greater than the good. And so when men have both done and suffered injustice, and have had experience of both, not being able to avoid the one and obtain the other, they think that they had better agree among themselves to have neither. Hence there arise laws and mutual covenants, and that which is ordained by law is termed by them lawful and just. Thus they affirm to be the origin and nature of justice. It is a mean or compromise between the best of all, which is to do injustice and not be punished, and the worst of all, which is to suffer injustice without the power of retaliation. And justice, being at a middle point between the two, is tolerated not as a good, but as the lesser evil and honoured by reason of the inability of men to do injustice. 
for no man who is worthy to be called a man would ever submit to such an agreement if he were able to resist. He would be mad if he did. Such is the received account, Socrates, of the nature and origin of justice. Now that those who practice justice do so involuntarily, and because they have not the power to be unjust, will best appear if we imagine something of this kind— having given both to the just and the unjust power to do what they will, let us watch and see whither desire will lead them. Then we shall discover in the very act the just and unjust man to be proceeding along the same road, following their interests, which all natures deem to be their good, and are only diverted into the path of justice by the force of law. The liberty which we are supposing may be most completely given to them in the form of such a power as is said to have been possessed by Gyges, the ancestor of Croesus, the Lydian. According to the tradition, Gyges was a shepherd in the service of the king of Lydia. There was a great storm, and an earthquake made an opening in the earth at the place where he was feeding his flock. Amazed at the sight, he descended into the opening, where, among other marvels, he beheld a hollow brazen horse, having doors, at which he, stooping and looking in, saw a dead body of stature, as appeared to him, more than human, and having nothing on but a gold ring. This he took from the finger of the dead, and reascended. Now the shepherds met together, according to custom, that they might send their monthly report about the flocks to the king. Into their assembly he came, having the ring on his finger and as he was sitting among them, he chanced to turn the collet of the ring inside his hand, when instantly he became invisible to the rest of the company, and they began to speak of him as if he were no longer present. He was astonished at this, and again, touching the ring, he turned the collet outwards and reappeared. He made several trials of the ring, and always with the same result. When he turned the collet inwards, he became invisible, when outwards he reappeared. Whereupon he contrived to be chosen one of the messengers who were sent to the court, whereas, soon as he arrived, he seduced the queen, and with her help conspired against the king, and slew him, and took the kingdom. Suppose now that there were two such magic rings, and the just put on one of them, and the unjust the other. No man can be imagined to be of such an iron nature that he would stand fast in justice. No man would keep his hands off what was not his own, when he could safely take what he liked out of the market, or go into houses and lie with any one at his pleasure, or kill or release from prison whom he would, and in all respects be like God among men. Then the actions of the just would be as the actions of the unjust. They would both come at last to the same point and this we may truly affirm to be a great proof that a man is just, not willingly, or because he thinks that justice is any good to him individually, but of necessity, for wherever any one thinks that he can safely be unjust, there he is unjust. For all men believe in their hearts that injustice is far more profitable to the individual than justice, and he who argues, as I have been supposing, will say that they are right. If you could imagine any one obtaining this power of becoming invisible, and never doing any wrong or touching what was another's, he would be thought by the lookers-on to be a most wretched idiot, although they would praise him to one another's faces, and keep up appearances with one another from a fear that they too might suffer injustice. Enough of this. Now, if we are to form a real judgment of the life of the just and unjust, we must isolate them. There is no other way. And how is the isolation to be effected? I answer, let the unjust man be entirely unjust, and the just man entirely just. Nothing is to be taken away from either of them, and both are to be perfectly furnished for the work of their respective lives. First, let the unjust be like other distinguished masters of craft, like the skilful pilot or physician, who knows intuitively his own powers and keeps within their limits, and who, if he fails at any point, is able to recover himself. So let the unjust make his unjust attempts in the right way, and lie hidden if he means to be great in his injustice. He who is found out is nobody. 
for the highest reach of injustice is to be deemed just when you are not. Therefore I say that in the perfectly unjust man we must assume the most perfect injustice. There is to be no deduction, but we must allow him, while doing the most unjust acts, to have acquitted the greatest reputation for justice. If he have taken a false step, he must be able to recover himself. He must be one who can speak with effect, if any of his deeds come to light, and who can force his way where force is required by his courage and strength and command of money and friends. And at his side let us place the just man in his nobleness and simplicity, wishing, as Aeschylus says, to be and not to seem good. There must be no seeming, for if he seem to be just he will be honoured and rewarded, and then we shall not know whether he is just for the sake of justice or for the sake of honours and rewards. Therefore let him be clothed in justice only, and have no other covering, and he must be imagined in a state of life the opposite of the former. Let him be the best of men, and let him be thought the worst, then he will have been put to the proof and we shall see whether he will be affected by the fear of infamy and its consequences. And let him continue thus to the hour of death, being just and seeming to be unjust. When both have reached the utmost extreme, the one of justice and the other of injustice, let judgment be given which of them is the happier of the two. "'Heavens, my dear Glaucon,' I said, how energetically you polish them up for the decision, first one, then the other, as if they were two statues. I do my best, he said, and now that we know what they are like, there is no difficulty in tracing out the sort of life which awaits either of them. This I will proceed to describe. But as you may think the description a little too coarse, I ask you to suppose, Socrates, that the words which follow are not mine. Let me put them into the mouths of the eulogists of injustice. They will tell you that the just man who is thought unjust will be scourged, racked, bound, will have his eyes burnt out, and at last, after suffering every kind of evil, he will be impaled. Then he will understand that he ought to seem only and not to be just. The words of Aeschylus may be more truly spoken of the unjust than of the just, for the unjust is pursuing a reality. He does not live with a view to appearance. He wants to be really unjust, and not to seem only. His mind has a soil, deep and fertile, out of which spring his prudent counsels. In the first place he is thought just, and therefore bears rule in the city. He can marry whom he will, and give in marriage to whom he will. Also he can trade, and deal where he likes, and always to his own advantage, because he has no misgivings about injustice, and at every contest, whether in public or private, he gets the better of his antagonists, and gains at their expense, and he is rich, and out of his gains he can benefit his friends and harm his enemies. Moreover, he can offer sacrifices and dedicate gifts to the gods abundantly and magnificently, and can honour the gods or any man whom he wants to honour in a far better style than the just, and therefore he is likely to be dearer than they are to the gods. And thus, Socrates, gods, and men are said to unite in making the life of the unjust better than the life of the just. I was going to say something in answer to Glaucon, when Adamantus, his brother, interposed. Socrates, he said, do you not suppose that there is nothing more to be urged? Why, what else is there? I answered. Oh, the strongest point of all has not even been mentioned, he replied. Well, then, according to the proverb, let brother help brother. If he fails in any part, do you assist him? Although I must confess that Glaucon has already said quite enough to lay me in the dust, and take from me the power of helping justice. Nonsense, he replied. But let me add something more. There is another side to Glaucon's argument about the praise and censure of justice and injustice, which is equally required in order to bring out what I believe to be his meaning. Parents and tutors are always telling their sons and their wards that they are to be just. But why? Not for the sake of justice, but for the sake of character and reputation. 
in the hope of obtaining for him who is reputed just some of these offices, marriages, and the like which Glaucon has enumerated among the advantages accruing to the unjust from the reputation of justice. More, however, is made of appearances by this class of persons than by the others, for they throw in the good opinion of the gods, and will tell you of a shower of benefits which the heavens, as they say, rain upon the pious. And this accords with the testimony of the noble Hesiod and Homer, the first of whom says that the gods make the oaks of the just to bear acorns at their summit and bees in the middle, and the sheep are bowed down with the weight of their fleeces and many other blessings of a like kind are provided for them. And Homer has a very similar strain, for he speaks of one whose fame is as the fame of some blameless king, who, like a god, maintains justice, to whom the black earth brings forth wheat and barley, whose trees are bound with fruit, and his sheep never fail to bear, and the sea gives him fish. Still grander are the gifts of heaven which Musaeus and his son vouchsafe to the just. They take them down into the world below, where they have the saints lying on couches at a feast, everlastingly drunk, crowned with garlands. Their idea seems to be that an immortality of drunkness is the highest meed of virtue. Some extend their rewards yet further. The posterity, as they say, of the faithful and just shall survive to the third and fourth generation. This is the style in which they praise justice. But about the wicked there is another strain. They bury them in a slough at Hades, and make them carry water in a sieve. Also, while they are yet living, they bring them to infamy, and inflict upon them the punishments which Glaucon described as the portion of the just who are reputed to be unjust. Nothing else does their invention supply. Such is the manner of praising the one and censuring the other. Once more, Socrates, I will ask you to consider another way of speaking about justice and injustice, which is not confined to the poets, but is found in prose writers. The universal voice of mankind is always declaring that justice and virtue are honourable, but grievous and toilsome, and that the pleasures of vice and injustice are easy of attainment, and are only censured by law and opinion. They say also that honesty is for the most part less profitable than dishonesty, and they are quite ready to call wicked men happy, and to honour them both in public and private when they are rich, or in any other way influential, while they despise and overlook those who may be weak and poor, even though acknowledging them to be better than the others. But most extraordinary of all is their mode of speaking about virtue and the gods, they say that the gods apportion calamity and misery to many good men, and good and happiness to the wicked. The mendicant prophets go to rich men's doors and persuade them that they have a power committed to them by the gods of making an atonement for man's own or his ancestors' sins by sacrifices or charms, with rejoicings and feasts, and they promise to harm an enemy, whether just or unjust, at a small cost with magic arts and incantations binding heaven, as they say, to execute their will. And the poets are the authorities to whom they appeal, now smoothing the path of vice with the words of Hesiod. Vice may be had in abundance without trouble. The way is smooth, and her dwelling place is near. But before virtue the gods have set toil, and a tedious and uphill road. Then, citing Homer as a witness that the gods may be influenced by men, for he also says, The gods too may be turned from their purpose, and men pray to them and avert their wrath by sacrifices and soothing entreaties, and by libations and the odour of fat, when they have sinned and transgressed. And they produce a host of books written by Musaeus and Orpheus, who were children of the moon and the muses, that is what they say, according to which they perform their ritual, and persuade not only individuals, but whole cities, that expiations and atonements for sin may be made by sacrifices and amusements which fill a vacant hour, and are equally at the service of the living and the dead, the latter sort they call mysteries, and they redeem us from the pains of hell. But if we neglect them, no one knows what awaits us. He proceeded, and now— when the young hear all this said about virtue and vice, and the way in which gods and men regard them, 
how are their minds likely to be affected my dear socrates those of them i mean who are quick-witted and like bees on the wing light on every flower and from all that they hear are prone to draw conclusions as to what manner of persons they should be and in what way they should walk if they would make the best of life probably the youth will say to himself in the words of pindar can i by justice or by crooked ways of deceit ascend a loftier tower which may be a fortress to me all my days for what men say is that if i am really just and not also thought just profit there is none but the pain and loss on the other hand are unmistakable but if though unjust i acquire the reputation of justice a heavenly life is promised to me since then as philosophers prove appearance tyrannizes over truth and is lord of happiness to appearance i must devote myself i will describe around me a picture and shadow of virtue to be the vestibule and exterior of my house behind i will trail the subtle and crafty fox as archilochus greatest of sages recommends but i hear some one exclaiming that the concealment of wickedness is often difficult to which i answer nothing great is easy nevertheless the argument indicates this if we would be happy to be the path along which we should proceed with a view to concealment we will establish secret brotherhoods and political clubs and there are professors of rhetoric who teach the art of persuading courts and assemblies and so partly by persuasion and partly by force i shall make unlawful gains and not be punished still i hear a voice saying that the gods cannot be deceived neither can they be compelled but what if there are no gods or suppose them to have no care of human things why in either case should i mind about concealment and even if there are gods and they do care about us what yet we know of them only from tradition and the genealogies of the poets and these are the very persons who say that they may be influenced and turned by sacrifices and soothing entreaties and by offerings let us be consistent then and believe both or neither if the poets speak truly why then we had better be unjust and offer the fruits of injustice for if we are just although we may escape the vengeance of heaven we shall lose the gains of injustice but if we are unjust we shall keep the gains and by our sinning and praying and praying and sinning the gods will be propitiated and we shall not be punished but there is a world below in which either we or our posterity will suffer for unjust deeds yes my friend will be the reflection but there are mysteries and atoning deities and these have great power this is what mighty cities declare and the children of the gods who were their poets and prophets bear a like testimony on what principle then shall we any longer choose justice rather than the worst injustice when if we only unite the latter with a deceitful regard to appearances we shall fare to our mind both with gods and men in life and after death as the most numerous and the highest authorities tell us knowing all this socrates how can a man who has any superiority of mind or person or rank or wealth be willing to honour justice or indeed to refrain from laughing when he hears justice praised and even if there should be some one who is able to disprove the truth of my words and who is satisfied that justice is best still he is not angry with the unjust but is very ready to forgive them because he also knows that men are not just of their own free will unless peradventure there be some one whom the divinity within him may have inspired with a hatred of injustice or who has attained knowledge of the truth but no other man he only blames injustice who owing to cowardice or age or some weakness has not the power of being unjust and this is proved by the fact that when he obtains the power he immediately becomes unjust as far as he can be the cause of all this socrates was indicated by us at the beginning of the argument but my brother and i told you how astonished we were to find that all of the professing panegyrists of justice 
beginning with the ancient heroes of whom any memorial has been preserved to us, and ending with the men of our own time, no one has ever blamed injustice or praised justice except with a view to the glories, honors, and benefits which flow from them. No one has ever adequately described, either in verse or prose, the true essential nature of either of them abiding in the soul, and invisible to any human or divine eye, or shown that of all the things of a man's soul which he has within him, justice is the greatest good, and injustice the greatest evil. Had this been the universal strain, had you sought to persuade us of this from our youth upwards, we should not have been on the watch to keep one another from doing wrong. But every one would have been his own watchman, because, afraid, if he did wrong, of harbouring in himself the greatest of evils. I dare say that Trasimachus and others would seriously hold the language which I have been merely repeating, and words even stronger than these about justice and injustice, grossly, as I conceive, perverting their true nature. But I speak in this vehement manner, as I must frankly confess to you, because I want to hear from you the opposite side, and I would ask you to show not only the superiority which justice has over injustice, but what effect they have on the possessor of them, which makes the one to be a good, and the other an evil to him. And please, as Glaucon requested of you, to exclude reputations, for unless you take away from each of them his true reputation, and add on the false, we shall say that you do not praise justice, but the appearance of it. We shall think that you are only exhorting us to keep injustice dark, and that you really agree with Trasimachus in thinking that justice is another's good, and the interest of the stronger, and that injustice is a man's own profit and interest, though injurious to the weaker. Now, as you have admitted that justice is one of that highest class of goods which are desired indeed for their results, but in a far greater degree for their own sakes, like sight, or hearing, or knowledge, or health, or any other real and natural and not merely conventional good, I would ask you in your praise of justice to regard one point only. I mean the essential good and evil which justice and injustice work in the possessors of them. Let us praise justice and censor injustice, magnifying the rewards and honours of the one, and abusing the other. That is a manner of arguing which, coming from them, I am ready to tolerate, but from you, who have spent your whole life in the consideration of this question, unless I hear the contrary from your own lips, I expect something better. And therefore, I say, not only prove to us that justice is better than injustice, but show what they either of them do to the possessor of them, which makes the one to be a good and the other an evil, whether seen or unseen by gods and men. I have always admired the genius of Glaucon and Adamantis, but on hearing these words I was quite delighted, and said, Sons of an illustrious father, that was not a bad beginning of the elegiac verses which the admirer of Glaucon made in honour of you after you had distinguished yourselves at the battle of Megara. Sons of Ariston, he sang, divine offspring of an illustrious hero. The epithet is very appropriate, for there is something truly divine in being able to argue, as you have done, for the superiority of injustice, and remaining unconvinced by your own arguments and I do believe that you are not convinced. This I infer from your general character, for had I judged you only from your speeches, I should have mistrusted you. But now, the greater my confidence in you, the greater is my difficulty in knowing what to say. For I am in a strait between two. On the one hand, I feel that I am unequal to the task and my inability is brought home to me by the fact that you were not satisfied with the answer which I made to Trasimachus, proving, as I thought, the superiority which justice has over injustice. And yet I cannot refuse to help while breath and speech remain to me. I am afraid that there would be an impiety in being present when justice is evil spoken of, and not lifting up a hand in her defence, and therefore I had best give such help as I can. Glaucon and the rest entreated me by all means not to let the question drop, but to proceed in the investigation. 
They wanted to arrive at the truth, first about the nature of justice and injustice, and secondly about their relative advantages. I told them what I really thought, that the inquiry would be of a serious nature and would require very good eyes. Seeing then, I said, that we are no great wits, I think that we had better adopt a method which I may illustrate thus. Suppose that a short-sighted person had been asked by someone to read small letters from a distance, and it occurred to someone else that they might be found in another place which was larger and in which the letters were larger. If they were the same, and he could read the larger letters first, then proceed to the lesser, this would have been thought a rare piece of good fortune. Very true, said Adamantus, but how does the illustration apply to our inquiry? I will tell you, I replied. Justice, which is the subject of our inquiry, is, as you know, sometimes spoken of as a virtue of an individual, and sometimes as the virtue of a state. True, he replied. And is not a state larger than an individual? It is. Then in the larger, the quantity of justice is likely to be larger and more easily discernible. I propose, therefore, that we inquire into the nature of justice and injustice, first as they appear in the state, and secondly in the individual, proceeding from the greater to the lesser, and comparing them. That, he said, is an excellent proposal. And if we imagine the state in process of creation, we shall see the justice and injustice of the state in process of creation also. I dare say. When the state is completed, there may be a hope that the object of our search will be more easily discovered. Yes, far more easily. But ought we to attempt to construct one, I said, for to do so, as I am inclined to think, will be a very serious task. Reflect, therefore. I have reflected, said Adamantus, and I am anxious that you should proceed. A state, I said, arises, as I conceive, out of the needs of mankind. No one is self-sufficing, but all of us have many wants. Can any other origin of a state be imagined? There can be no other. Then, as we have many wants, and many persons are needed to supply them, one takes a helper for one purpose and another for another. And when these partners and helpers are gathered together in one habitation, the body of inhabitants is termed a state. True, he said. And they exchange with one another, and one gives and another receives, under the idea that exchange will be for their good. Very true. Then, I said, let us begin and create in idea a state. And yet the true creator is necessity, who is the mother of our invention. Of course, he replied. Now, the first and greatest of necessities is food, which is the condition of life and existence. Certainly. The second is a dwelling, and the third clothing, and the like. True. And now let us see how our city will be able to supply the great demand. We may suppose that one man is a husbandman, another a builder, someone else a weaver. Shall we add to them a shoemaker, or perhaps some other purveyor to our bodily ones? Quite right. The barest notion of a state must include four or five men. Clearly. And how will they proceed? Will each bring the result of his labors into a common stock? The individual husbandman, for example, producing for four, and laboring four times as long and as much as he need in the provision of food with which he supplies others as well as himself, or will he have nothing to do with others and not be at the trouble of producing for them, but provide for himself alone a fourth of the food in a fourth of the time? and in the remaining three-fourths of his time be employed in making a house, or a coat, or a pair of shoes, having no partnership with others, but supplying himself all his own wants. Adamantus thought that he should aim at producing food only, and not at producing everything. Probably, I replied, that would be the better way, and when I hear you say this, I am myself reminded that we are not all alike. There are diversities of natures among us which are adapted to different occupations. Very true. And will you have a work better done when the workman has many occupations, or when he has only one? Well, when he has only one. Further, there can be no doubt that a work is spoilt when not done at the right time. No doubt. 
for business is not disposed to wait until the doer of the business is at leisure, but the doer must follow up what he is doing and make the business his first object. He must. And if so, we must infer that all things are produced more plentifully and easily and of a better quality when one man does one thing which is natural to him, and does it at the right time, and leaves other things. Undoubtedly. Then more than four citizens will be required, for the husbandman will not make his own plough or mattock or other implements of agriculture, if they are to be good for anything. Neither will the builder make his tools, and he too needs many, and in like manner the weaver and the shoemaker. True. Then carpenters and smiths and many other artisans will be sharers in our little state, which is already beginning to grow. True. Yet even if we add neatherds, shepherds, and other herdsmen, in order that our husbandmen may have oxen to plough with, and builders as well as husbandmen may have draught cattle, and curriers and weavers fleeces and hides, still our state will not be very large. Well, that is true. Yet neither will it be a very small state which contains all these. Then again there is the situation of the city. To find a place where nothing need be imported is well nigh impossible. Impossible. Then there must be another class of citizens who will bring the required supply from another city. There must. But if the trader goes empty-handed, having nothing which they require who would supply his need, he will come back empty-handed. That is certain. And therefore what they produce at home must not be only enough for themselves, but such both in quantity and quality, as to accommodate those from whom their wants are supplied. Very true. Then more husbandmen and more artisans will be required. They will. Not to mention the importers and exporters, who are called merchants. Yes. Then we shall want merchants. We shall. And if merchandise is to be carried over the sea, skilful sailors will also be needed, and in considerable numbers. Yes, in considerable numbers. Then, again, within the city, how will they exchange their productions? To secure such an exchange was, as you will remember, one of our principal objects when we formed them into a society and constituted a state. Clearly they will buy and sell. Then they will need a marketplace and a money token for purposes of exchange. Certainly. Suppose now that a husbandman or an artisan brings some production to market, and he comes at a time when there is no one to exchange with him. Is he to leave his calling and set idle in the marketplace? Not at all. He will find people there who, seeing the want, undertake the office of salesman. In well ordered states, they are commonly those who are the weakest in bodily strength, and therefore of little use for any other purpose. Their duty is to be in the market, and to give money in exchange for goods to those who desire to sell, and to take money from those who desire to buy. This want, then, creates a class of retail traders in our state. Is not retailer the term which is applied to those who sit in the marketplace engaged in buying and selling, while those who wander from one city to another are called merchants? Yes, he said, and there is another class of servants who are intellectually hardly on the level of companionship. Still they have plenty of bodily strength for labor, which accordingly they sell, and are called, if I do not mistake, hirelings, hire being the name which is given to the price of their labor. True. Then hirelings will help to make up our population? Yes. And now, Adamantus, is our state matured and perfected? I think so. Where, then, is justice, and where is injustice, and in what part of the state did they spring up? Probably in the dealings of these citizens with one another. I cannot imagine that they are more likely to be found anywhere else. I dare say that you are right in your suggestion, I said. We had better think the matter out, and not shrink from the inquiry. End of Book Two, Part One. Book Two, Part Two of The Republic by Plato. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Let us consider, first of all, what will be their way of life, now that we have thus established them. Will they not produce corn and wine and clothes and shoes, and build houses for themselves? And when they are housed, they will work in summer commonly stripped and barefoot, but in winter substantially clothed and shod. They will feed on barley meal and flour of wheat, baking and kneading them, making noble cakes and loaves. These they will serve up on a mat of reeds or on clean leaves, themselves reclining the while upon beds strewn with yew or myrtle. And they and their children will feast, drinking the wine which they have made, wearing garlands on their heads, and hymning the praises of the gods in happy converse with one another. And they will take care that their families do not exceed their means, having an eye to poverty or war. But, said Glaucon, interposing, you have not given them a relish to their meal. True, I replied, I had forgotten. Of course they must have a relish, salt and olives and cheese, and they will boil roots and herbs such as country people prepare. For a dessert we shall give them figs and peas and beans, and they will roast myrtle berries and acorns at the fire, drinking in moderation. And with such a diet they may be expected to live in peace and health to a good old age, and bequeath a similar life to their children after them. Yes, Socrates, he said, and if you were providing for a city of pigs, how else would you feed the beasts? But what would you have, Glaucon? I replied. Why, he said, you should give them the ordinary conveniences of life. People who are to be comfortable are accustomed to lie on sofas and dine off tables, and they should have sauces and sweets in the modern style. Yes, I said. Now I understand. The question which you would have me consider is not only how a state, but how a luxurious state is created, and possibly there is no harm in this, for in such a state we shall be more likely to see how justice and injustice originate. In my opinion, the true and healthy constitution of a state is the one which I have described. But if you wish also to see a state at fever heat, I have no objection for I suspect that many will not be satisfied with a simpler way of life. They will be for adding sofas and tables and other furniture, also dainties and perfumes and incense and courtesans and cakes, all these not of one sort only, but in every variety. We must go beyond the necessaries of which I was at first speaking, such as houses and clothes and shoes, the arts of the painter and the embroiderer will have to be set in motion, and gold and ivory and all sorts of materials must be procured. True, he said. Then we must enlarge our borders, for the original healthy state is no longer sufficient. Now will the city have to fill and swell with a multitude of callings which are not required by any natural want, such as a whole tribe of hunters and actors of whom one large class have to do with forms and colours, another will be the votaries of music, poets, and their attendant train of rhapsodists, players, dancers, contractors, also makers of diverse kinds of articles, including women's dresses, and we shall want more servants. Will not tutors be also in request, and nurses wet and dry, tire women and barbers, as well as confectioners and cooks? and swineherds, too, who were not needed, and therefore had no place in the former edition of our state, but are needed now. They must not be forgotten, and there will be animals of many other kinds, if people eat them. Certainly, and living in this way we shall have much greater need of physicians than before. Much greater, and the country which was enough to support the original inhabitants will be too small now, and not enough. Quite true then a slice of our neighbour's land will be wanted by us for pasture and tillage, and they will want a slice of ours, if, like ourselves, they exceed the limit of necessity and give themselves up to the unlimited accumulation of wealth. That, Socrates, will be inevitable. And so we shall go to war, Glaucon, shall we not? Most certainly, he replied. 
then without determining as yet whether war does good or harm this much we may affirm that now we have discovered war to be derived from causes which are also the causes of almost all the evils in states private as well as public undoubtedly and our state must once more enlarge and this time the enlargement will be nothing short of a whole army which will have to go out and fight with the invaders for all that we have as well as for the things and persons whom we were describing above why he said are they not capable of defending themselves no i said not if we were right in the principle which was acknowledged by all of us when we were framing the state the principle as you will remember was that one man cannot practise many arts with success very true he said but is not war an art certainly and an art requiring as much attention as shoemaking quite true and the shoemaker was not allowed by us to be a husbandman or a weaver or a builder in order that we might have our shoes well made but to him and to every other worker was assigned one work for which he was by nature fitted and at that he was to continue working all his life long and at no other he was not to let opportunities slip and then he would become a good workman now nothing can be more important than that the work of a soldier should be well done but is war an art so easily acquired that a man may be a warrior who is also a husbandman or shoemaker or other artisan although no one in the world would be a good dice or draught player who merely took up the game as a recreation and had not from his earliest years devoted himself to this and nothing else no tools will make a man a skilled workman or a master of defence nor be of any use to him who has not learned how to handle them and has never bestowed any attention upon them how then will he who takes up a shield or other implement of war become a good fighter all in a day whether with heavy armed or any other kind of troops yes he said the tools which would teach men their own use would be beyond price and the higher the duties of the guardian i said the more time and skill and art and application will be needed by him no doubt he replied will he not also require natural aptitude for his calling certainly then it will be our duty to select if we can natures which are fitted for the task of guarding the city it will and the selection will be no easy manner i said but we must be brave and do our best we must is not the noble youth very like a well-bred dog in respecting of guarding and watching what do you mean i mean that both of them ought to be quick to see and swift to overtake the enemy when they see him and strong too if when they have caught him they have to fight with him all these qualities he replied will certainly be required by them well and your guardian must be brave if he is to fight well certainly and is he likely to be brave who has no spirit whether horse or dog or any other animal have you never observed how invincible and unconquerable is spirit and how the presence of it makes the soul of any creature to be absolutely fearless and indomitable i have then now we have a clear notion of the bodily qualities which are required in the guardian true and also of the mental ones his soul is to be full of spirit yes but are not these spirited natures apt to be savage with one another and with everybody else a difficulty by no means easy to overcome he replied whereas i said they ought to be dangerous to their enemies and gentle to their friends if not they will destroy themselves without waiting for their enemies to destroy them true he said what is to be done then i said how shall we find a gentle nature which has also a great spirit for the one is the contradiction of the other true he will not be a good guardian who is wanting in either of these two qualities and yet the combination of them appears to be impossible and hence we must infer that to be a good guardian is impossible i am afraid that what you say is true he replied here feeling perplexed i began to think over what had preceded my friend i said 
no wonder that we are in a perplexity, for we have lost sight of the image which we had before us. Oh, what do you mean? he said. I mean to say that there do exist natures gifted with these opposite qualities. And where do you find them? Many animals, I replied, furnish examples of them. Our friend the dog is a very good one. You know that well-bred dogs are perfectly gentle to their familiars and acquaintances, and the reverse to strangers. Yes, I know. Then there is nothing impossible or out of order of nature in our finding a guardian who has a similar combination of qualities? Certainly not. What? Would not he who is fitted to be a guardian, besides the spirited nature, need to have the qualities of a philosopher? I do not apprehend your meaning. The trait of which I am speaking, I replied, may also be seen in the dog, and is remarkable in the animal. What trait? Why, a dog, whenever he sees a stranger, is angry. When an acquaintance, he welcomes him, although the one has never done him any harm, nor the other any good. Did this never strike you as curious? The matter never struck me before, but I quite recognize the truth of your remark. And surely this instinct of the dog is very charming. Your dog is a true philosopher. Why? Why, because he distinguishes the face of a friend and of an enemy only by the criterion of knowing and not knowing. And must not an animal be a lover of learning who determines what he likes and dislikes by the test of knowledge and ignorance? Most assuredly. And is not the love of learning the love of wisdom, which is philosophy? They are the same, he replied. And may we not say confidently of man also that he who is likely to be gentle to his friends and acquaintances must by nature be a lover of wisdom and knowledge? That we may safely affirm. Then he who has to be a really good and noble guardian of the state will require to unite in himself philosophy and spirit and swiftness and strength? Undoubtedly. Then we have found the desired natures. And now that we have found them, how are they to be reared and educated? Is not this an inquiry which may be expected to throw light on the greater inquiry which is our final end? How do justice and injustice grow up in states? For we do not want either to omit what is to the point, or to draw out the argument to an inconvenient length. Adamant has thought that the inquiry would be of great service to us. Then, I said, my dear friend, the task must not be given up, even if somewhat long. Certainly not. Come, then, and let us pass a leisure hour in story-telling, and our story shall be the education of our heroes. By all means. And what shall be their education? Can we find a better than the traditional sort? And this has two divisions, gymnastic for the body and music for the soul. True. Shall we begin education with music, and go on to gymnastics afterwards? By all means. And when you speak of music, do you include literature or not? I do. And literature may be either true or false? Yes. And the young shall be trained in both kinds, and we begin with the false? I do not understand your meaning, he said. You know, I said, that we begin by telling children stories which, though not wholly destitute of truth, are in the main fictitious, and these stories are told them when they are not of an age to learn gymnastics. Very true. That was my meaning when I said that we must teach music before gymnastics. Quite right, he said. You know also that the beginning is the most important part of any work, especially in the case of a young and tender thing for that is the time at which the character is being formed, and the desired impression is more readily taken. Quite true. And shall we just carelessly allow children to hear any casual tales which may be devised by casual persons, and to receive into their minds ideas for the most part the very opposite of those which we should wish them to have when they are grown up? We cannot. Then the first thing will be to establish a censorship of the writers of fiction, and let the censors receive any tale of fiction which is good, and reject the bad. And we will desire mothers and nurses to tell their children the authorized ones only. 
Let them fashion the mind with such tales, even more fondly than they mould the body with their hands, but most of those which are now in use must be discarded. Of what tales are you speaking? he said. You may find a model of the lesser in the greater, I said, for they are necessarily of the same type, and there is the same spirit in both of them. Very likely, he replied, but I do not as yet know what you would term the greater. Those, I said, which are narrated by Homer and Hesiod, and the rest of the poets, which have ever been the great storytellers of mankind. But which stories do you mean, he said, and what fault do you find with them? A fault which is most serious, I said. The fault of telling a lie, and what is more, a bad lie. But when is this fault committed? Whenever an erroneous representation is made of the nature of gods and heroes, as when a painter paints a portrait not having the shadow of a likeness to the original. Yes, he said, that sort of thing is certainly very blamable, but what are the stories which you mean? Well, first of all, I said, there was that greatest of all lies in high places which the poet told to Uranus, which was a bad lie too. I mean what Hesiod says that Uranus did, and how Cronus retaliated on him. The doings of Cronus and the sufferings which in turn his son inflicted upon him, even if they were true, ought certainly not to be lightly told to young and thoughtless persons. If possible, they had better be buried in silence. But if there is an absolute necessity for their mention, a chosen few might hear them in a mystery, and they should sacrifice not a common pig, but some huge and unprocurable victim and then the numbers of the hearers will be very few indeed. Why, yes, said he, those stories are extremely objectionable. Yes, Adamantus, they are stories not to be repeated in our state. The young man should not be told that in committing the worst of crimes he is far from doing anything outrageous, and that even if he chastises his father when he does wrong, in whatever manner, he will only be following the example of the first and greatest among the gods. I certainly agree with you, he said. In my opinion, those stories are quite unfit to be repeated. Neither, if we mean our future guardians to regard their habit of quarrelling among themselves as of all things the basest, should any word be said to them of the wars in heaven, and of the plots and fightings of the gods against one another, for they are not true. No, we shall never mention the battles of the giants, or let them be embroidered on garments, and we shall be silent about the innumerable other quarrels of gods and heroes with their friends and relatives. If they would only believe us, we would tell them that quarrelling is unholy, and that never up to this time has there been any quarrel between citizens. This is what old men and old women should begin by telling children, and when they grow up, the poets also should be told to compose for them in the similar spirit. But the narrative of Hephaestus binding here his mother, or how on another occasion Zeus sent him flying for taking her part when she was being beaten, and all the battles of the gods in Homer, these tales must not be admitted into our state, whether they are supposed to have an allegorical meaning or not. For a young person cannot judge what is allegorical and what is liberal. Anything that he receives into his mind at that age is likely to become indelible and unalterable, and therefore it is most important that the tales which the young first hear should be models of virtuous thoughts. "'There you are right,' he replied. "'But if any one asks where are such models to be found, and of what tales are you speaking, how shall you answer him?' I said to him, you and I, Adamantus, at this point are not poets, but founders of a state. Now, the founders of a state ought to know the general forms in which poets should cast their tales, and the limits which must be observed by them, but to make the tales is not their business. Very true, he said. But what are these forms of theology which you mean? Something of this kind, I replied. God is always to be represented as he truly is, whatever be the sort of poetry, epic, lyric, or tragic, in which the representation is given. All right. And is he not truly good, and must he not be represented as such? Certainly. 
and no good thing is hurtful no indeed and that which is not hurtful hurts not certainly not and that which hurts not does no evil no and can that which does no evil be a cause of evil impossible and the good is advantageous yes and therefore the cause of well-being yes it follows therefore that the good is not the cause of all things but of the good only assuredly then god if he be good is not the author of all things as the many assert but he is the cause of a few things only and not of most things that occur to men for few are the goods of human life and many are the evils and the good is to be attributed to god alone of the evils the causes are to be sought elsewhere and not in him that appears to me to be most true he said then we must not listen to homer or to any other poet who is guilty of the folly of saying that two casks lie at the threshold of zeus full of lots one of good the other of evil lots and that he to whom zeus gives a mixture of the two sometimes meets with ill fortune at other times with good but to he to whom is given the cup of unmingled ill him wild hunger drives o'er the beauteous earth and again zeus who is the dispenser of good and evil to us and if any one asserts that the violation of oaths and treaties which was really the work of pandarus was brought about by athene and zeus or that the strife and contention of the gods was instigated by themis and zeus he shall not have our approval neither will we allow our young men to hear the words of aeschylus that god plants guilt among men when he desires utterly to destroy a house and if a poet writes of the sufferings of niobethe the subject of the tragedy in which these iambic verses occur or of the house of pelops or of the trojan war or any similar theme either we must not permit him to say that these are not the works of god or if they are god he must devise some explanation of them such as we are seeking he must say that god did what was just and right and they were the better for being punished but that those who are punished are miserable and that god is the author of their misery the poet is not to be permitted to say though he may say that the wicked are miserable because they require to be punished and are benefited by receiving punishment from god but that god being good is the author of evil to any one is to be strenuously denied and not to be said or sung or heard in verse or prose by any one whether old or young in any well-ordered commonwealth such a fiction is suicidal ruinous impious i agree with you he replied and i am ready to give my assent to the law let this then be one of our rules and principles concerning the gods to which our poets and reciters will be expected to conform that god is not the author of all things but of good only that will do he said and what do you think of a second principle shall i ask you whether god is a magician and of a nature to appear insidiously now in one shape and now in another sometimes himself changing and passing into many forms sometimes deceiving us with the semblance of such transformations or is he one and the same immutably fixed in his own proper image i cannot answer you he said without more thought well i said but if we suppose a change in anything that that change must be effected either by the thing itself or by some other thing most certainly and things which are at their best are also least liable to be altered or discomposed for example when healthiest and strongest the human frame is least liable to be affected by meats and drinks and the plant which is in the fullest vigour also suffers least from winds or the heat of the sun or any similar causes of course and will not the bravest and wisest soul be least confused or deranged by any external influence true and the same principle as i should suppose applies to all composite things furniture houses garments when good and well made they are least altered by time and circumstances very true then everything which is good whether made by art or nature or both is least liable to suffer change from without true 
But surely God and the things of God are in every way perfect. Of course they are. Then he can hardly be compelled by external influence to take many shapes. He cannot. But may he not change and transform himself? Clearly, he said, that must be the case if he is changed at all. And will he then change himself for the better and the fairer, or for the worse and more unsightly? If he change at all, he can only change for the worse, for we cannot suppose him to be deficient either in virtue or beauty. Very true, Atamantus. But then would any one, whether God or man, desire to make himself worse? Impossible. Then it is impossible that God should ever be willing to change, being, as is supposed, the fairest and best that is conceivable. Every God remains absolutely and forever in his own form. That necessarily follows, he said, in my judgment. Then, I said, my dear friend, let none of the poets tell us that the gods, taking the disguise of strangers from other lands, walk up and down cities in all sorts of forms. And let no one slander Proteus and Thetis, neither let any one, either in tragedy or in any other kind of poetry, introduce Hera disguised in the likeness of a priestess asking an alms for the life-giving daughters of Inachus, the river of Argus. Let us have no more lies of that sort. Neither must we have mothers under the influence of the poets scaring their children with a bad version of these myths, telling our certain gods, as they say, go about by night in the likeness of so many strangers and in diverse forms. But let them take heed, lest they make cowards of their children, and at the same time speak blasphemy against the gods. Heaven forbid, he said. But although the gods are themselves unchangeable, still, by witchcraft and deception, they may make us think that they appear in various forms. Perhaps, he replied. Well, but can you imagine that God will be willing to lie, whether in word or deed, or put forth a phantom of himself? I cannot say, he replied. Do you not know, I said, that the true lie, if such an expression may be allowed, is hated of gods and men? What do you mean? he said. I mean that no one is willingly deceived in that which is the truest and highest part of himself, or about the truest and highest matters. There, above all, he is most afraid of a lie having possession of him. Still, he said, I do not comprehend you. The reason is, I replied, that you attribute some profound meaning to my words, but I am only saying that deception, or being deceived or uninformed about the highest realities and the highest part of themselves, which is the soul, and in that part of them to have and to hold the lie, is what mankind least like. That, I say, is what they utterly detest. There is nothing more hateful to them. And as I was just now remarking, this ignorance in the soul of him who is deceived may be called the true lie, for the lie in words is only a kind of imitation and shadowy image of a previous affection of the soul, not pure unadulterated falsehood. Am I not right? Perfectly right. The true lie is hated not only by the gods, but also by men? Yes. Whereas the lie in words is in certain cases useful and not hateful. In dealing with enemies, that would be an instance. Or again, when those whom we call our friends in a fit of madness or illusion are going to do some harm, then it is useful, and is a sort of medicine or preventive. Also in the tales of mythology, of which we were just now speaking, because we do not know the truth about ancient times, we make falsehood as much like truth as we can, and so turn it into account. Very true, he said. But can any of these reasons apply to God? Can we suppose that he is ignorant of antiquity, and therefore has recourse to invention? That would be ridiculous, he said. Then the lying poet has no place in our idea of God? I should say not. Or perhaps he may tell a lie because he is afraid of enemies. That is inconceivable. But he may have friends who are senseless or mad. But no mad or senseless person can be a friend of God. Then no motive can be imagined why God should lie. None whatever. 
then the superhuman and divine is absolutely incapable of falsehood yes then is god perfectly simple and true both in word and deed he changes not he deceives not either by sign or word by dream or waking vision your thoughts he said are the reflection of my own you agree with me then i said that this is the second type or form in which we should write and speak about divine things the gods are not magicians who transform themselves neither do they deceive mankind in any way i grant that then although we are admirers of homer we do not admire the lying dream which zeus sends to agamemnon neither will we praise the verses of aeschylus in which thetis says that apollo at her nuptials was celebrating in song fair progeny whose days were to be long and to know no sickness and when he had spoken of my lot as in all things blessed of heaven he raised a note of triumph and cheered my soul and i thought that the word of phoebus being driven and full of prophecy would not fail and now he himself who uttered the strain he who was present at the banquet and who said this he it is who has slain my son these are the kind of sentiments about the gods which will arouse our anger and he who utters them shall be refused a chorus neither shall we allow teachers to make use of them in the instruction of the young meaning as we do that our guardians as far as men can be should be true worshippers of the gods and like them i entirely agree he said in these principles and promise to make them my laws End of part two Book Three, Part One From the Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Such then, I said, are our principles of theology. Some tales are to be told, and others are not to be told to our disciples from their youth upwards, if we mean them to honor the gods and their parents, and to value friendship with one another yes and i think that our principles are right he said but if they are to be courageous must they not learn other lessons besides these and lessons of such a kind as will take away the fear of death can any man be courageous who has the fear of death in him certainly not he said and can he be fearless of death or will he choose death in battle rather than defeat and slavery who believes the world below to be real and terrible impossible then we must assume a control over the narrators of this class of tales as well as over the others and beg them not simply to revile but rather to commend the world below intimating to them that their descriptions are untrue and will do harm to our future warriors that will be our duty he said then i said we shall have to obliterate many obnoxious passages beginning with the verses i would rather be a serf on the land of a poor and portionless man than rule over the dead who have come to naught we must also expunge the verse which tells us how pluto feared lest the mansions grim and squalid which the gods abhor should be seen both of mortals and immortals and again o oh heavens verily in the house of hades there is soul and ghostly form but no mind at all again of tiresias to him even after death did persephone grant mind that he alone should be wise but the other souls are flitting shades again the soul flying from the limbs had gone to hades lamenting her fate leaving manhood and youth again and the soul with shrilling cry passed like smoke beneath the earth and as bats in hollow of mystic cavern whenever any of them has dropped out of the string and falls from the rock fly shrilling and cling to one another so did they with shrilling cry hold together as they moved and we must beg homer and the other poets not to be angry if we strike out these and similar passages not because they are unpoetical or unattractive to the popular ear but because the greater the poetical charm of them the less are they meet for the ears of boys and men who are meant to be free 
and who should fear slavery more than death. Undoubtedly. Also, we shall have to reject all the terrible and appalling names which describe the world below, Cocytus and Styx, Ghost under the earth, and sapless shades, and any similar words of which the very mention causes a shudder to pass through the inmost soul of him who hears them. I do not say that these horrible stories may not have a use of some kind, but there is a danger that the nerves of our guardians may be rendered too excitable and effeminate by them. There is a real danger, he said. Then we must have no more of them. True. Another and a nobler strain must be composed and sung by us, clearly. And shall we proceed to get rid of the weepings and wailings of famous men? They will go with the rest. But shall we be right in getting rid of them? Reflect. Our principle is that the good man will not consider death terrible to any other good man who is his comrade. Yes, that is our principle and therefore he will not sorrow for his departed friend as though he had suffered anything terrible. He will not. Such an one, as we further maintain, is sufficient for himself and his own happiness, and therefore is least in need of other men. True, he said. And for this reason the loss of a son or brother, or the deprivation of fortune, is to him of all men least terrible. Assuredly and therefore he will be least likely to lament, and will bear with the greatest equanimity any misfortune of this sort which may befall him. Yes, he will feel such a misfortune far less than another. Then we shall be right in getting rid of the lamentations of famous men, and making them over to women, and not even to women who are good for anything, or to men of a baser sort, that those who are being educated by us to be the defenders of their country may scorn to do the like. That will be very right. Then we will once more entreat Homer and the other poets to depict Achilles, who is the son of a goddess, first lying on his side, then on his back, and then on his face, then starting up and sailing in a frenzy along the shores of the barren sea, now taking the sooty ashes in both his hands and pouring them over his head, or weeping and wailing in the various modes which Homer has delineated nor should he describe Priam, the kinsman of the gods, as praying and beseeching, rolling in the dirt, calling each man loudly by his name. Still more earnestly will we beg of him, at all events, not to introduce the gods lamenting, and saying, Alas, my misery, alas, that I bore the bravest to my sorrow. But he must introduce the gods, at any rate let him dare not so completely to misrepresent the greatest of the gods, as to make him say, O oh, heavens, with my eyes verily I behold a dear friend of mine chased round and round the city, and my heart is sorrowful. Or again, Woe is me that I am fated to have Sarpedon, dearest of men to me, subdued at the hands of Patroclus and the son of Menetius. For if, my sweet Arimantus, our youth seriously listened to such unworthy representations of the gods, instead of laughing at them as they ought, hardly will any of them deem that he himself, being but a man, can be dishonoured by similar actions. Neither will he rebuke any inclination which may arise in his mind to say and do the like. And instead of having any shame or self-control, he will be always whining and lamenting on slight occasions. Yes, he said, that is most true. Yes, I replied, but that surely is what ought not to be, as the argument has just proved to us, and by that proof we must abide until it is disproved by a better. It ought not to be. Neither ought our guardians to be given to laughter, for a fit of laughter which has been indulged to excess almost always produces a violent reaction. So I believe." then persons of worth, even if only mortal men, must not be represented as overcome by laughter, and still less must such a representation of the gods be allowed. Still less of the gods, as you say, he replied. Then we shall not suffer such an expression to be used against the gods as that of Homer when he describes how inextinguishable laughter arose among the blessed gods when they saw Hephaestus bustling about the mansion. 
On your views we must admit them. On my views, if you like to father them on me, that we must not admit them is certain. Again, truth should be highly valued, if, as we were saying, a lie is useless to the gods and useful only as a medicine to men, then the use of such medicines should be restricted to physicians. Private individuals have no business with them. Clearly not, he said. Then, if any one at all is to have the privilege of lying, the rulers of the state should be the persons, and they, in their dealings either with enemies or with their own citizens, may be allowed to lie for the public good. But nobody else should meddle with anything of the kind, and although the rulers have this privilege, for a private man to lie to them in return is to be deemed a more heinous fault than for the patient or the pupil of a gymnasium, not to speak about his own bodily illnesses to the physician or to the trainer, or for a sailor not to tell the captain what is happening about the ship and the rest of the crew, and how things are going with himself or his fellow sailors. Most true, he said. If, then, the ruler catches anybody beside himself lying in the state, any of the craftsmen, whether he be priest or physician or carpenter, he will punish him for introducing a practice which is equally subversive and destructive of ship or state. Most certainly, he said, if our idea of the state is ever carried out. In the next place, our youth must be temperate. Certainly. Are not the chief elements of temperance, speaking generally, obedience to commanders and self-control in sensual pleasures? True then we shall approve such language as that of Diomede and Homer. Friend, sit still and obey my word. And the verses which follow, the Greeks marched breathing prowess in silent awe of their leaders, and other sentiments of the same kind. We shall. What of this line, O oh, heavy with wine, who hast the eyes of a dog and the heart of a stag? And of the words which follow, would you say that these, or any similar impertinences which private individuals are supposed to address to their rulers, whether in verse or prose, are well or ill-spoken? They are ill-spoken. They may very possibly afford some amusement, but they do not conduce to temperance, and therefore they are likely to do harm to our young men. You would agree with me there? Yes and then again to make the wisest of men say that nothing in his opinion is more glorious than when the tables are full of bread and meat and the cup-bearer carries round wine which he draws from the bowl and pours into the cups is it fit or conducive to temperance for a young man to hear such words or the verse the saddest of fates is to die and meet destiny from hunger what would you say again to the tale of zeus who, while other gods and men were asleep, and he the only person awake, lay devising plans, but forgot them all in a moment through his lust, and was so completely overcome at the sight of Hera that he would not even go into the hut, but wanted to lie with her on the ground, declaring that he had never been in such a state of rapture before, even when they first met one another without the knowledge of their parents, or that other tale of how Hephaestus, because of similar goings-on, cast a chain around Ares and Aphrodite. Indeed, he said, I am strongly of opinion that they ought not to hear that sort of thing. But any deeds of endurance which are done or told by famous men, these they ought to see and hear, as, for example, what is said in the verses, He smote his breast, and thus reproached his heart, Endure, my heart, far worse hast thou endured. Certainly he said, and in the next place we must not let them be receivers of gifts or lovers of money. Certainly not. Neither must we sing to them of gifts persuading gods and persuading reverend kings. Neither is Phoenix, the tutor of Achilles, to be approved or deemed to have given his pupil good counsel when he told him he should take the gifts of the Greeks and assist them, but that without a gift he should not lay aside his anger neither will we believe or acknowledge achilles himself to have been such a lover of money that he took agamemnon's gifts or that when he had received payment he restored the dead body of hector but that without payment he was unwilling to do so undoubtedly 
he said, these are not sentiments which can be approved. Loving Homer as I do, I hardly like to say that in attributing these feelings to Achilles, or in believing that they are truly attributed to him, he is guilty of downright impiety, as little can I believe the narrative of his insolence to Apollo, where he says, Thou hast wronged me, O far darter, most abominable of deities. Verily I would be even with thee, if I only had the power. Or his insubordination to the river god, on whose divinity he is ready to lay hands, or his offering to the dead Patroclus of his own hair, which had been previously dedicated to the river god Specaeus, and that he actually performed this vow, or that he dragged Hector round the tomb of Patroclus, and slaughtered the captives at the pyre. Of all this I cannot believe that he was guilty, any more than I can allow our citizens to believe that he, the wise Chiron's pupil, the son of a goddess and Peleus, who was the gentlest of men, and third in descent from Zeus, was so disordered in his wits as to be at one time the slave of two seemingly inconsistent passions, meanness not untainted by avarice, combined with overweening contempt of gods and men. You are quite right, he replied, and let us equally refuse to believe, or allow to be repeated, the tale of Theseus, son of Poseidon, or of Pyrethus, son of Zeus, going forth as they did to perpetuate a horrid rape, or of any other hero or son of a god daring to do such impious and dreadful things as they falsely ascribe to them in our day. And let us further compel the poets to declare either that these acts were not done by them, or that they were not the sons of gods. Both, in the same breath, they shall not be permitted to affirm. We will not have them trying to persuade our youth that the gods are the authors of evil, and that heroes are no better than men, sentiments which, as we were saying, are neither pious nor true for we have already proved that evil cannot come from the gods, or surely not. And further, they are likely to have a bad effect on those who hear them, for everybody will begin to excuse his own vices, when he is convinced that similar wickednesses are always being perpetrated by the kindred of the gods, the relatives of Zeus, whose ancestral altar, the altar of Zeus, is a lofted air on the peak of Ida, and who have the blood of deities yet flowing in their veins. And therefore let us put an end to such tales, lest they engender laxity of morals among the young. By all means, he replied. But now that we are determining what classes of subjects are or are not to be spoken of, let us see whether any have been omitted by us. The manner in which gods and demigods and heroes and the world below should be treated has been already laid down. Very true. And what shall we say about men? That is clearly the remaining portion of our subject. Clearly so. But we are not in a condition to answer this question at present, my friend. Why not? Because, if I am not mistaken, we shall have to say that about men poets and storytellers are guilty of making the gravest misstatements when they tell us that wicked men are often happy, and the good miserable, and that the injustice is profitable when undetected, but that justice is a man's own loss and another's gain. These things we shall forbid them to utter, and command them to sing and say the opposite. To be sure we shall, he replied. But if you admit that I am right in this, then I shall maintain that you have implied the principle for which we have been all along contending. I grant the truth of your inference, that such things are or are not to be said about men, is a question which we cannot determine until we have discovered what justice is, and how naturally advantageous to the possessor, whether he seem to be just or not. Most true, he said. Enough of the subjects of poetry. Let us now speak of the style, and when this has been considered, both matter and manner will have been completely treated. I do not understand what you mean, said Adimantus. Then I must make you understand, and perhaps I may be more intelligible if I put the matter in this way. 
you are aware i suppose that all mythology and poetry is a narration of events either past present or to come certainly he replied and narration may be either simple narration or imitation or a union of the two that again he said i do not quite understand i fear that i must be a ridiculous teacher when i have so much difficulty in making myself apprehended like a bad speaker therefore i will not take the whole of the subject but will break a piece off in illustration of my meaning you know the first lines of the iliad in which the poet says that crises prayed agamemnon to release his daughter and that agamemnon flew into a passion with him whereupon crises failing of his object invoked the anger of the god against the achaeans now as far as these lines and he prayed all the greeks but especially the two sons of atreus the chiefs of the people the poet is speaking in his own person he never leads us to suppose that he is any one else but in what follows he takes the person of crises and then he does all that he can to make us believe that the speaker is not homer but the aged priest himself and in this double form he has cast the entire narrative of the events which occurred at troy and in ithaca and throughout the odyssey which occurred at troy and in ithaca and throughout the odyssey yes and a narrative it remains both in the speeches which the poet recites from time to time and in the intermediate passages quite true but when the poet speaks in the person of another may we not say that he assimilates his style to that of a person who as he informs you is going to speak certainly and this assimilation of himself to another either by the use of voice or gesture is the imitation of the person whose character he assumes of course then in this case the narrative of the poet may be said to proceed by way of imitation very true or if the poet everywhere appears and never conceals himself then again the imitation is dropped and his poetry becomes simple narration however in order that i may make my meaning quite clear and that you may no more say i don't understand i will show how the change might be effected if homer had said the priest came having his daughter's ransom in his hands supplicating the achaeans and above all the kings and then if instead of speaking in the person of crises he had continued in his own person the words would have been not imitation but simple narration the passage would have run as follows i am no poet and therefore i drop the metre a priest came and prayed the gods on behalf of the greeks that they might capture troy and return safely home but begged that they would give him back his daughter and take the ransom which he brought and respect the god thus he spoke and the other greeks revered the priest and assented but agamemnon was wroth and bade him depart and not come again lest the staff and chaplets of the god should be of no avail to him the daughter of crises should not be released he said she should grow old with him in argos and then he told him to go away and not to provoke him if he intended to get home unscathed and the old man went away in fear and silence and when he had left the camp he called upon apollo by his many names reminding him of everything which he had done pleasing to him whether in building his temples or in offering sacrifice and praying that his good deeds might be returned to him and that the achaeans might expiate his tears by the arrows of the god and so on in this way the whole becomes simple narrative i understand he said or you may suppose the opposite case that the intermediate passages are omitted and the dialogue only left that also he said i understand you mean for example as in tragedy you have conceived my meaning perfectly and if i mistake not what you failed to apprehend before is now made clear to you that poetry and mythology are in some cases wholly imitative instances of this are supplied by tragedy and comedy there is likewise the opposite style in which the poet is the only speaker of this the dithyram affords the best example and the combination of both is found in epic and in several other styles of poetry do i take you with me yes 
he said, I see now what you meant. I will ask you to remember also what I began by saying, that we had done with the subject, and might proceed to the style. Yes, I remember. In saying this, I intended to imply that we must come to an understanding about the mimetic art, about the mimetic art, whether the poets in narrating their stories are to be allowed by us to imitate, and, if so, whether in whole or in part, and, if the latter, in what parts, or should all imitation be prohibited. You mean, I suspect, to ask whether tragedy and comedy shall be admitted into our state. Yes, I said, but there may be more than this in question. I really do not know as yet, but whither the argument may blow, thither we go. And go we will, he said. Then, Adamantus, let me ask you whether our guardians ought to be imitators, or rather, has not this question been decided by the rule already laid down that one man can only do one thing well, and not many? and that if he attempt many, he will altogether fail of gaining much reputation in any. Certainly. And this is equally true of imitation. No man can imitate many things as well as he would imitate a single one. He cannot. Then the same person would hardly be able to play a serious part in life, and at the same time to be an imitator and imitate many other parts as well. For even when two species of imitation are nearly allied, the same person cannot succeed in both, as, for example, the writers of tragedy and comedy. Did you not just now call them imitations? Ah, yes, I did, and you were right in thinking that the same persons cannot succeed in both, any more than they can be rhapsodists and actors at once. True. Neither are comic and tragic actors the same, yet all these things are but imitations. They are so. And human nature, Adamantus, appears to have been coined into yet smaller pieces, and to be as incapable of imitating many things well, as of performing well the actions of which the imitations are copies. Quite true, he replied. If, then, we adhere to our original notion, and bear in mind that our guardians, setting aside every other business, are to dedicate themselves wholly to the maintenance of freedom in the state, making this their craft, and engaging in no work which does not bear on this end, they ought not to practice or imitate anything else. If they imitate at all, they should imitate from youth upward only those characters which are suitable to their profession, the courageous, temperate, holy, free, and the like. But they should not depict or be skilful at imitating any kind of illiberality or baseness, lest from imitation they should come to be what they imitate. Did you never observe how imitations, beginning in early youth and continuing far into life, at length grow into habits and become a second nature, affecting body, voice, and mind? Yes, certainly, he said. Then, I said, we will not allow those for whom we profess a care, and of whom we say that they ought to be good men, to imitate a woman, whether young or old, quarrelling with her husband, or striving and vaunting against the gods in conceit of her happiness, or when she is in affliction, or sorrow, or weeping, and certainly not one who is in sickness, love, or labour. Very right, he said. Neither must they represent slaves, male or female, performing the offices of slaves. They must not, and surely not bad men, whether cowards or any others, who do the reverse of what we have just been prescribing, who scold or mock or revile one another, in drink or out of drink, or who in any other manner sin against themselves and their neighbours in word or deed, as the manner of such is. Neither should they be trained to imitate the action or speech of men or women who are mad or bad, for madness, like vice, is to be known, but not to be practised or imitated. Very true, he replied. Neither may they imitate smiths or other artificers or oarsmen or boatswains or the like. How can they, he said, when they are not allowed to apply their minds to the callings of any of these? Nor may they imitate the neighing of horses, the bellowing of bulls, the murmur of rivers and roll of the ocean, thunder and all that sort of thing. Nay, he said, if madness be forbidden, neither may they copy the behaviour of madmen. 
"'You mean,' I said, "'if I understand you aright, that there is one sort of narrative style which may be employed by a truly good man when he has anything to say, and that another sort will be used by a man of an opposite character and education. And which are these two sorts?' he asked. Suppose, I answered, that a just and good man in the course of a narration comes on some saying or action of another good man. I should imagine that he will like to personate him, and will not be ashamed of this sort of imitation. He will be most ready to play the part of a good man when he is acting firmly and wisely, in a less degree when he is overtaken by illness, or love, or drink, or has met with any other disaster. But when he comes to a character which is unworthy of him, he will not make a study of that. He will disdain such a person, and will assume his likeness, if at all, for a moment, only when he is performing some good action. At other times he will be ashamed to play a part which he has never practised, nor will he like to fashion and frame himself after the baser models. He feels the employment of such an art, unless in jest, to be beneath him and his mind revolts at it. "'So I should expect,' he replied. "'Then he will adopt a mode of narration such as we have illustrated out of Homer. That is to say, his style will be both imitative and narrative. But there will be very little of the former, and a great deal of the latter. Do you agree?' "'Certainly,' he said. "'That is the model which such a speaker must necessarily take.' but there is another sort of character who will narrate anything and the worse he is the more unscrupulous he will be nothing will be too bad for him and he will be ready to imitate anything not as a joke but in right good earnest and before a large company as i was just now saying he will attempt to represent the roll of thunder the noise of wind and hail or the creaking of wheels and pulleys and the various sounds of flutes, pipes, trumpets, and all sorts of instruments. He will bark like a dog, bleat like a sheep, or crow like a cock. His entire art will consist in imitation of voice and gesture, and there will be very little narration. That, he said, will be his mode of speaking. These, then, are the two kinds of style? Yes. And you would agree with me in saying that one of them is simple and has but slight changes, and if the harmony and rhythm are also chosen for their simplicity, the result is that the speaker, if he speaks correctly, is always pretty much the same in style, and he will keep within the limits of a single harmony, for the changes are not great, and in like manner he will make use of nearly the same rhythm. That is quite true, he said. Whereas the other requires all sorts of harmonies and all sorts of rhythms, if the music and the style are to correspond because the style has all sorts of changes. "'That is also perfectly true,' he replied. "'And do not the two styles, or the mixture of the two, comprehend all poetry and every form of expression in words? No one can say anything except in one or other of them, or in both together.' "'They include all,' he said. "'And shall we receive into our state all the three styles, or one only of the two unmixed styles, or would you include the mixed? I should prefer only to admit the pure imitator of virtue. Yes, I said, Adamantus, but the mixed style is also very charming, and indeed the pantomimic, which is the opposite of the one chosen by you, is the most popular style with children and their attendants, and with the world in general. I do not deny it, but I suppose you would argue that such a style is unsuitable to our state in which human nature is not twofold or manifold, for one man plays one part only. Yes, quite unsuitable. And this is the reason why in our state, and in our state only, we shall find a shoemaker to be a shoemaker, and not a pilot also, and a husbandman to be a husbandman, and not a die-cast also, and a soldier a soldier, and not a traitor also, and the same throughout. True, he said. And therefore, when any one of these pantomimic gentlemen, who are so clever that they can imitate anything, comes to us and makes a proposal to exhibit himself and his poetry, we will fall down and worship him as a sweet and holy and wonderful being, but we must also inform him that in our state 
such as he are not permitted to exist, the law will not allow them. And so, when we have anointed him with myrrh and set a garland of wool upon his head, we shall send him away to another city, for we mean to employ for our soul's health the rougher and severer poet or storyteller, who will imitate the style of the virtuous only, and will follow those models which we prescribed at first when we began the education of our soldiers. We certainly will, he said, if we have the power. Then now, my friend, I said, that part of music or literary education which relates to the story or myth may be considered to be finished, for the matter and manner have both been discussed. I think so too, he said. End of Book Three, Part One Book Three, Part Two of The Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Next in order will follow melody and song. Well, that is obvious. Every one can see already what we ought to say about them, if we are to be consistent with ourselves. I fear, said Glaucon, laughing, that the word every one hardly includes me, for I cannot at the moment say what they should be, though I may guess. At any rate, you can tell that a song or ode has three parts the words, the melody, and the rhythm. That degree of knowledge I may presuppose. Oh, yes, he said. So much as that you may. And as for the words, there will surely be no difference between words which are and which are not set to music. Both will conform to the same laws, and these have been already determined by us, yes. And the melody and rhythm will depend upon the words, certainly. We were saying, when we spoke of the subject matter, that we had no need of lamentation and strains of sorrow. True. And which are the harmonies expressive of sorrow? You are musical and can tell me. The harmonics which you mean are the mixed or tenor Lydian, and the full-toned or bass Lydian, and such like. These, then, I said, must be banished, even to women who have a character to maintain they are of no use, and much less to men. Certainly. In the next place, drunkenness and softness and indolence are utterly unbecoming the character of our guardians. Utterly unbecoming. And which are the soft or drinking harmonies? The Ionian, he replied, and the Lydian. They are termed relaxed. Well, and are these of any military use? Quite the reverse, he replied. And if so, the Dorian and the Phrygian are the only ones which you have left. I answered, Of the harmonies I know nothing, but I want to have one warlike, to sound the note or accent which a brave man utters in the hour of danger and stern resolve, or when his cause is failing, and he is going to wounds or death, or is overtaken by some evil, and at every such crisis meets the blows of fortune with firm step and a determination to endure and another to be used by him in times of peace and freedom of action, when there is no pressure of necessity, and he is seeking to persuade God by prayer, or man by instruction and admonition, or on the other hand, when he is expressing his willingness to yield to persuasion, or entreaty, or admonition, and which presents him when by prudent conduct he has attained his end, not carried away by his success, but acting moderately and wisely under the circumstances and acquiescing in the event. These two harmonies I ask you to leave, the strain of necessity, the strain of courage, and the strain of temperance. These, I say, leave. And these, he replied, are the Dorian and Phrygian harmonies of which I was just now speaking. Then, I said, if these and these only are to be used in our songs and melodies, we shall not want multiplicity of notes or panharmonic scale. I suppose not. Then we shall not maintain the artificers of lyres with three corners and complex scales, or the makers of any other many-stringed, curiously harmonized instruments. Certainly not. 
But what do you say to flute-makers and flute-players? Would you admit them into our state when they reflect that in this composite use of harmony the flute is worse than all the stringed instruments put together? Even the panharmonic music is only an imitation of the flute. Clearly not. There remain then only the lyre and the harp for use in the city, and the shepherds may have a pipe in the country. That is surely the conclusion to be drawn from the argument. The preferring of Apollo and his instruments is not at all strange, I said. Not at all, he replied. And so, by the dog of Egypt, we have been unconsciously purging the state, which not long ago we termed luxurious. And we have done wisely, he replied. Then let us now finish the purgation, I said. Next, in order to harmonies, rhythms will naturally follow, and they should be subject to the same rules, for we ought not to seek out complex systems of meter or meters of every kind, but rather to discover what rhythms are the expressions of a courageous and harmonious life, and when we have found them, we shall adapt the foot and the melody to words having a like spirit, not the words to the foot and the melody. To say what these rhythms are will be your duty. You must teach me, then, as you have already taught me the harmonics. But, indeed, he replied, I cannot tell you. I only know that there are some three principles of rhythm out of which metrical systems are framed, just as in sounds there are four notes, that is, the four notes of the tetrachord, out of which all the harmonies are composed. That is an observation which I have made, but but of what sort of lives they are severally the imitations, I am unable to say. Then, I said, we must take Damon into our councils, and he will tell us what rhythms are expressive of meanness or insolence or fury or other unworthiness, and what are to be reserved for the expression of opposite feelings. And I think that I have an indistinct recollection of his mentioning a complex critic rhythm also a dactylic or heroic, and he arranged them in some manner which I do not quite understand, making the rhythms equal in the rise and fall of the foot, long and short alternating, and, unless I am mistaken, he spoke of an iambic as well as a trochaic rhythm, and assigned to them short and long quantities. Also, in some cases, he appeared to praise or censure the movement of the foot quite as much as the rhythm, or perhaps a combination of the two, for I am not certain what he meant. These matters, however, as I was saying, had better be deferred to Damon himself, for the analysis of the subject would be difficult, you know. Rather so, I should say. But there is no difficulty in seeing that grace, or the absence of grace, is an effect of good or bad rhythm. Not at all and also that good and bad rhythm naturally assimilate to a good and bad style, and that harmony and discord in like manner follow style, for our principle is that rhythm and harmony are regulated by the words, and not the words by them. Just so, he said, they should follow the words. And will not the words and the character of the style depend on the temper of the soul? Yes. And everything else on the style? Yes. Then beauty of style and harmony and grace and good rhythm depend on simplicity, I mean the true simplicity of a rightly and nobly ordered mind and character, not that other simplicity which is only a euphemism for folly. Very true, he replied. And if our youth are to do their work in life, must they not make these graces and harmonies their perpetual aim? They must. And surely the art of the painter and every other creative and constructive art are full of them, weaving, embroidery, architecture, and every kind of manufacture, also nature, animal and vegetable. In all of them there is a grace or the absence of grace, and ugliness and discord and inharmonious motion are nearly allied to ill words and ill nature, as grace and harmony are the twin sisters of goodness and virtue, and bear their likeness. That is quite true, he said. But shall our superintendents go no further, and are the poets only to be required by us to express the image of the good in their works on pain, if they do anything else, of expulsion from our state? 
or is the same control to be extended to the other artists and are they also to be prohibited from exhibiting the opposite forms of vice and intemperance and meanness and indecency in sculpture and building and the other creative arts and is he who cannot conform to this rule of ours to be prevented from practising his art in our state lest the taste of our citizens be corrupted by him we would not have our guardians grow up amid images of moral deformity as in some noxious pasture and there browse and feed upon many a baneful herb and flower day by day little by little until they silently gather a festering mass of corruption in their own soul let our artists rather be those who are gifted to discern the true nature of the beautiful and graceful then will our youth dwell in the land of wealth and amid fair sights and sounds and receive the good in everything and beauty the affluence of fair works shall flow into the eye and ear like a health-giving breeze from a purer region and insensibly draw the soul from earliest years into likeness and sympathy with the beauty of reason there can be no nobler training than that he replied and therefore i said glaucon musical training is a more potent instrument than any other because rhythm and harmony find their way into the inward places of the soul on which they mightily fasten imparting grace and making the soul of him who is rightly educated graceful or of him who is ill-educated ungraceful and also because he who has received this true education of the inner being will most shrewdly perceive omissions or faults in art and nature and with a true taste while he praises and rejoices over and receives into his soul the good and becomes noble and good he will justly blame and hate the bad now in the days of his youth even before he is able to know the reason why and when reason comes he will recognize and salute the friend with whom his education has made him long familiar yes he said i quite agree with you in thinking that our youth should be trained in music and on the grounds which you mention just as in learning to read i said we were satisfied when we knew the letters of the alphabet which are very few in all their recurring sizes and combinations not slighting them as unimportant whether they occupy a space large or small but everywhere eager to make them out and not thinking ourselves perfect in the art of reading until we recognize them wherever they are found true or as we recognize the reflection of letters in the water or in a mirror only when we know the letters themselves the same art and study giving us the knowledge of both exactly even so as i maintain neither we nor our guardians whom we have to educate can ever become musical until we and they know the essential forms of temperance courage liberality magnificence and their kindred as well as the contrary forms in all their combinations and can recognize them and their images wherever they are found not slighting them either in small things or great but believing them all to be within the sphere of what art and study most assuredly and when a beautiful soul harmonizes with a beautiful form and the two are cast in one mould that will be the fairest of sights to him who has an eye to see it the fairest indeed and the fairest is also the loveliest well, that may be assumed and the man who has the spirit of harmony will be most in love with the loveliest but he will not love him who is of an inharmonious soul that is true he replied if the deficiency be in his soul but if there be any merely bodily defect in another he will be patient of it and will love all the same i perceive i said that you have or have had experiences of this sort and i agree but let me ask you another question has excess of pleasure any affinity to temperance how can that be he replied pleasure deprives a man of the use of his faculties quite as much as pain or any affinity to virtue in general none whatever any affinity to wantonness and intemperance yes the greatest and is there any greater or keener pleasure than that of sensual love no nor a madder whereas true love is a love of beauty and order temperate and temperate and harmonious quite true 
he said. Then no intemperance or madness should be allowed to approach true love? Well, certainly not. Then mad or intemperate pleasure must never be allowed to come near the lover and his beloved. Neither of them can have any part in it if their love is of the right sort. No, indeed, Socrates, it must never come near them. Then I suppose that in the city which we are founding you could make a law to the effect that a friend should use no other familiarity to his love than a father would use to his son, and then only for a noble purpose, and he must first have the other's consent. And this rule is to limit him in all his intercourse, and he is never to be seen going further, or if he exceeds, he is to be deemed guilty of coarseness and bad taste. I quite agree, he said. This much of music, which makes a fair ending, for what should be the end of music if not the love of beauty? I agree, he said. After music comes gymnastic, in which our youth are next to be trained. Certainly. Gymnastic, as well as music, should begin in early years. The training in it should be careful and should continue through life. Now, my belief is— and this is a matter upon which I should like to have your opinion in confirmation of my own, but my own belief is not that the good body by any bodily excellence improves the soul, but on the contrary, that the good soul by her own excellence improves the body as far as this may be possible. What do you say? Yes, I agree. Then to the mind, when adequately trained, we shall be right in handing over the more particular care of the body, and in order to avoid prolixity, we will now only give the general outlines of the subject. Very good. That they must abstain from intoxication has been already remarked by us, for of all persons a guardian should be the last to get drunk and not know where in the world he is. Yes, he said, that a guardian should require another guardian to take care of him is ridiculous indeed. But next, what shall we say of their food? For the men are in training for the great contest of all, are they not? Yes, he said. And will the habit of body of our ordinary athletes be suited to them? Well, why not? I am afraid, I said, that a habit of body such as they have is but a sleepy sort of thing, and rather perilous to health. Do you not observe that these athletes sleep away their lives, and are liable to most dangerous illnesses if they depart, in ever so slight a degree, from their customary regimen? Yes, I do. Then, I said, a finer sort of training will be required for our warrior athletes, who are to be like wakeful dogs, and to see and hear with the utmost keenness, amid the many changes of water and also of food, of summer heat and winter cold, which they will have to endure when on a campaign, they must be liable to break down in health. That is my view. The really excellent gymnastic is twin sister of that simple music which we were just now describing. How so? Why, I conceive that there is a gymnastic which, like our music, is simple and good, and especially the military gymnastic. What do you mean? My meaning may be learned from Homer. He, you know, feeds his heroes at their feasts, when they are campaigning on soldiers' fare. They have no fish, although they are on the shores of the Hellespont, and they are not allowed boiled meats, but only roast, which is the food most convenient for soldiers, requiring only that they should light a fire, and not involving the trouble of carrying about pots and pans. True and I can hardly be mistaken in saying that sweet sauces are nowhere mentioned in Homer. In proscribing them, however, he is not singular. All professional athletes are well aware that a man who is to be in good condition should take nothing of the kind. Yes, he said, and knowing this they are quite right in not taking them. Then you would not approve of the Syracusan dinners and the refinements of Sicilian cookery? I think not. Nor, if a man is to be in condition, would you allow him to have a Corinthian girl as his fair friend? Certainly not. Neither would you approve of the delicacies, as they are thought, of Athenian confectionery? Certainly not. All such feeding and living may be rightly compared by us to melody and song, composed in the panharmonic style, and in all the rhythms. Exactly. 
there complexity engendered license, and here disease. Whereas simplicity in music was the parent of temperance in the soul, and simplicity in gymnastic of health in the body. Most true, he said. But when intemperance and diseases multiply in a state, halls of justice and medicine are always being opened, and the arts of the doctor and the lawyer give themselves airs, finding how keen is the interest which not only the slaves but the free men of the city take about them. Of course. And yet, what greater proof can there be of a bad and disgraceful state of education than this? that not only artisans and the meaner sort of people need the skill of first-rate physicians and judges, but also those who would profess to have had a liberal education. Is it not disgraceful, and a great sign of want of good breeding, that a man should have to go abroad for his law and physic because he has none of his own at home, and must therefore surrender himself into the hands of other men whom he makes lords and judges over him? Of all things, he said, the most disgraceful. Would you say most, I replied, when you consider that there is a further stage of the evil, in which a man is not only a lifelong litigant, passing all his days in the courts, either as plaintiff or defendant, but is actually led by his bad taste to pride himself on his litigiousness, he imagines that he is a master of dishonesty, able to take every crooked turn, and wriggle into and out of every hole, bending like a withy, and getting out of the way of justice. And a hole for what? In order to gain small points not worth mentioning, he not knowing that so to order his life as to be able to do without a napping judge, is a far higher and nobler sort of thing. Is not that still more disgraceful? Yes he said, that is still more disgraceful. Well, I said, and to require the help of medicine, not when a wound has to be cured, or on occasion of an epidemic, but just because, by indolence and a habit of life such as we have been describing, men fill themselves with waters and winds as if their bodies were a marsh, compelling the ingenious sons of Asclepius to find more names for diseases, such as flatulence and catarrh. Is not this, too, a disgrace? Yes, he said. They do certainly give very strange and new-fangled names to diseases. Yes, I said, and I do not believe that there were any such diseases in the days of Asclepius. And this I infer from the circumstance that the hero Eurypylus, after he has been wounded in Homer, drinks a posset of Pramnian wine, well besprinkled with barley meal and grated cheese, which are certainly inflammatory and yet the sons of Asclepius, who were at the Trojan War, do not blame the damsel who gives him the drink, or rebuke Patroclus, who is treating his case. Well, he said, that was surely an extraordinary drink to be given to a person in his condition. Not so extraordinary, I replied, if you bear in mind that in former days, as is commonly said, before the time of Herodicus, the guild of Asclepius did not practice our present system of medicine, which may be said to educate diseases. But Herodicus, being a trainer, and himself of a sickly constitution, by a combination of training and doctoring, found out a way of torturing first and chiefly himself, and secondly the rest of the world. How was that? he said. By the intervention of lingering death for he had a mortal disease which he perpetually tended, and as recovery was out of the question, he passed his entire life as a valetudinarian. He could do nothing but attend upon himself, and he was in constant torment whenever he departed in anything from his usual regimen, and so, dying hard by the help of science, he struggled on to old age. A rare reward for his skill. Yes, I said, a reward which a man might fairly expect who never understood that if Asclepius did not instruct his descendants in valetudinarian hearts, the omission arose not from ignorance or inexperience of such a branch of medicine, but because he knew that in all well-ordered states every individual has an occupation to which he must attend, and has therefore no leisure to spend in continually being ill. This we remark in the case of the artisan, but ludicrously enough do not apply the same rule to people of the richer sort. How do you mean? he said. I mean this. 
When a carpenter is ill, he asks the physician for a rough and ready cure, an emetic or purge or a cautery or the knife. These are his remedies. And if someone prescribes for him a course of dietetics, and tells him that he must swathe and swaddle his head, and all that sort of thing, he replies at once that he has no time to be ill, and that he sees no good in a life which is spent in nursing his disease to the neglect of his customary employment, and therefore, bidding good-bye to this sort of physician, he resumes his ordinary habits, and either gets well and lives and does his business, or, if his constitution fails, he dies and has no more trouble. Yes, he said, and a man in his condition of life ought to use the art of medicine thus far only. Has he not, I said, an occupation? And what profit would there be in his life if he were deprived of his occupation? Quite true, he said. But with a rich man this is otherwise. Of him we do not say that he has any specially appointed work which he must perform, if he would live. He is generally supposed to have nothing to do. Then you have heard of the saying of Phocyclides, that as soon as a man has a livelihood he should practice virtue? Nay he said, I think that he had better begin somewhat sooner. Let us not have a dispute with him about this, I said, but rather ask ourselves, is the practice of virtue obligatory on the rich man, or can he live without it? And if obligatory on him, then let us raise a further question, whether this dieting of disorders, which is an impediment to the application of the mind in carpentering and the mechanical arts, does not equally stand in the way of the sentiment of Phocyclides. Of that, he replied, there can be no doubt. Such excessive care of the body, when carried beyond the rules of gymnastic, is, is most inimical to the practice of virtue. Yes, indeed, I replied, and equally incompatible with the management of a house, an army, or an office of state, and what is most important of all, irreconcilable with any kind of study or thought or self-reflection, there is a constant suspicion that headache and giddiness are to be ascribed to philosophy, and hence all practising or making trial of virtue in the higher sense is absolutely stopped, for a man is always fancying that he is being made ill, and is in constant anxiety about the state of his body. Yes, likely enough. And therefore our politic Asclepius may be supposed to have exhibited the power of his art only to persons who, being generally of healthy constitution and habits of life, had a definite ailment, such as those he cured by purges and operations, and bade them live as usual, herein consulting the interests of the state. But bodies which disease had penetrated through and through he would not have attempted to cure by gradual processes of evacuation and infusion. He did not want to lengthen out good-for-nothing lives, or to have weak fathers begetting weaker sons. If a man was not able to live in the ordinary way, he had no business to cure him, for such a cure would have been of no use either to himself or to the state. Then, he said, you regard Asclepius as a statesman. Clearly, and his character is further illustrated by his sons. Note that they were heroes in the days of old, and practised the medicines of which I am speaking at the siege of Troy. You will remember how, when Pandarus wounded Menelaus, they sucked the blood out of the wound and sprinkled soothing remedies. But they never prescribed what the patient was afterwards to eat or drink in the case of Menelaus, any more than in the case of Eurypylus. The remedies, as they conceived, were enough to heal any man who before he was wounded was healthy and regular in his habits, and even though he did happen to drink a posset of Pramnian wine, he might get well all the same. But they would have nothing to do with unhealthy and intemperate subjects, whose lives were of no use either to themselves or others. The art of medicine was not designed for their good, and though they were as rich as Midas, the sons of Asclepius would have declined to attend them. They were very acute persons, those sons of Asclepius. Naturally so, I replied. Nevertheless, the tragedians and Pindar, disobeying our behests, although they acknowledge that Asclepius was the son of Apollo, say also that he was bribed into healing a rich man who was at the point of death, and for this reason he was struck by lightning. But we, in accordance with the principle already affirmed by us, will not believe them when they tell us both. 
If he was the son of a god, we maintain that he was not avaricious, or if he was avaricious, he was not the son of a god. All that, Socrates, is excellent, but I should like to put a question to you. Ought there not to be good physicians in a state, and are not the best those who have treated the greatest number of constitutions good or bad, and are not the best judges in like manner those who are acquainted with all sorts of moral natures? Yes, I said, I too would have good judges and good physicians. But do you know whom I think good? Will you tell me? I will, if I can. Let me, however, note that in the same question you join two things which are not the same. How so? he asked. Why, I said, you join physicians and judges. Now, the most skilful physicians are those who, from their youth upwards, have combined with the knowledge of their art the greatest experience of disease. They had better not be robust in health, and should have had all manner of diseases in their own persons. For the body, as I conceive, is not the instrument with which they cure the body. In that case we could not allow them ever to be or to have been sickly. But they cure the body with the mind and the mind which has become and is sick can cure nothing. That is very true, he said. But with the judge it is otherwise, since he governs mind by mind. He ought not therefore to have been trained among vicious minds, and to have associated with them from youth upwards, and to have gone through the whole calendar of crime, only in order that he may quickly infer the crimes of others as he might their bodily diseases from his own self-consciousness. The honourable mind which is to form a healthy judgment should have had no experience or contamination of evil habits when young. And this is the reason why in youth good men often appear to be simple and are easily practised upon by the dishonest, because they have no examples of what evil is in their own souls. Yes, he said, they are far too apt to be deceived. Therefore, I said, the judge should not be young. He should have learned to know evil, not from his own soul, but from late and long observation of the nature of evil in others. Knowledge should be his guide, not personal experience. Yes, he said, that is the ideal of a judge. Yes, I replied, and he will be a good man, which is my answer to your question. For he is good who has a good soul. But the cunning and suspicious nature of which we spoke— he who has committed many crimes and fancies himself to be a master in wickedness, when he is amongst his fellows, is wonderful in the precautions which he takes, because he judges of them by himself. But when he gets into the company of men of virtue, who have the experience of age, he appears to be a fool again, owing to his unseasonable suspicions. He cannot recognize an honest man, because he has no pattern of honesty in himself, and at the same time, as the bad are more numerous than the good, and he meets with them oftener, he thinks himself, and is by others thought to be, rather wise than foolish. Most true, he said. Then the good and wise judge whom we are seeking is not this man, but the other. For vice cannot know virtue too, but a virtuous nature, educated by time, will acquire a knowledge both of virtue and vice, the virtuous and not the vicious man has wisdom, in my opinion, and in mine also. This is the state of medicine, and this is the sort of law which you will sanction in your state. They will minister to better natures, giving health both of soul and of body. But those who are diseased in their bodies they will leave to die, and the corrupt and incurable souls they will put an end to themselves. That is clearly the best thing both for the patients and for the state. And thus our youth, having been educated only in that simple music, which, as we said, inspires temperance, will be reluctant to go to law. Clearly. And the musician, who, keeping the same track, is content to practice the simple gymnastic, will have nothing to do with medicine, unless in some extreme case. That I quite believe. The very exercises and tolls which he undergoes are intended to stimulate the spirited element of his nature, and not to increase his strength. He will not, like common athletes, use exercise and regimen to develop his muscles. Very right, he said. 
neither are the two arts of music and gymnastic really designed as is often supposed the one for the training of the soul the other for the training of the body what then is the real object of them i believe i said that the teachers of both have in view chiefly the improvement of the soul how can that be he asked did you never observe i said the effect on the mind itself of exclusive devotion to gymnastic or the opposite effect of an exclusive devotion to music in what way shown he said the one producing a temper of hardness and ferocity the other of softness and effeminacy i replied yes he said i am quite aware that the mere athlete becomes too much of a savage and that the mere musician is melted and softened beyond what is good for him yet surely i said this ferocity only comes from spirit which if rightly educated would give courage but if too much intensified is liable to become hard and brutal that i quite think on the other hand the philosopher will have the quality of gentleness and this also when too much indulged will turn to softness but if educated rightly will be gentle and moderate true and in our opinion the guardians ought to have both these qualities assuredly and both should be in harmony beyond a question and the harmonious soul is both temperate and courageous yes and the inharmonious is cowardly and boorish very true and when a man allows music to play upon him and to pour into his soul through the funnel of his ears those sweet and soft and melancholy airs of which we were just now speaking and his whole life is passed in warbling and the delights of a song in the first stage of the process the passion or spirit which is in him is tempered like iron and made useful instead of brittle and useless but if he carries on the softening and soothing process in the next stage he begins to melt and waste until he has wasted away his spirit and cut out the sinews of his soul and he becomes a feeble warrior very true if the element of spirit is naturally weak in him the change is speedily accomplished but if he have a good deal then the power of music weakening the spirit renders him excitable and the least provocation he flames up at once and is speedily extinguished instead of having spirit he grows irritable and passionate and is quite impracticable exactly and so in gymnastics if a man takes violent exercise and is a great feeder and the reverse of a great student of music and philosophy at first the high condition of his body fills him with pride and spirit and he becomes twice the man that he was certainly and what happens if he do nothing else and holds no converse with the muses does not even that intelligence which there may be in him having no taste of any sort of learning or inquiry or thought or culture grow feeble and dull and blind his mind never waking up or receiving nourishment and his senses not being purged of their mists true he said and he ends by becoming a hater of philosophy uncivilized never using the weapons of persuasion he is like a wild beast all violence and fierceness and knows no other way of dealing and he lives in all ignorance and evil conditions and has no sense of propriety and grace that is quite true he said and as there are two principles of human nature one the spirited and the other philosophical some god as i should say has given mankind two arts answering to them and only indirectly to the soul and the body in order that these two principles like the strings of an instrument may be relaxed or drawn tighter until they are duly harmonized that appears to be the intention and he who mingles music with gymnastic in the fairest proportions and best attempers them to the soul may be rightly called the true musician and harmonist in a far higher sense than the tuner of the strings you are quite right socrates and such a presiding genius will always be required in our state if the government is to last yes he will be absolutely necessary such then are our principles of nurture and education where would be the use of going into further details about the dances of our citizens or about the hunting and coursing their gymnastic and equestrian contests 
for these all follow the general principle, and having found that, we shall have no difficulty in discovering them. I dare say that there will be no difficulty. Very good, I said. But then, what is the next question? Must we not ask who are to be the rulers and whose subjects? Certainly. There can be no doubt that the elder must rule the younger, clearly, and that the best of these must rule. That is also clear. Now, are not the best husbandmen those who are most devoted to husbandry? Yes. And as we are to have the best of guardians for our city, must they not be those who have the most the character of guardians? Yes. And to this end they ought to be wise and efficient, and to have a special care of the state? True. And a man will be most likely to care about that which he loves, to be sure, and he will be most likely to love that which he regards as having the same interests with himself, and that of which the good or evil fortune is supposed by him at any time most to affect his own? Very true, he replied. Then there must be a selection. Let us note among the guardians those who in their whole life show the greatest eagerness to do what is for the good of their country, and the greatest repugnance to do what is against her interests. Those are the right men. And they will have to be watched at every age, in order that we may see whether they preserve their resolution, and never, under the influence either of force or enchantment, forget or cast off their sense of duty to the state. How cast off? he said. I will explain to you, I replied. A resolution may go out of a man's mind either with his will or against his will, with his will when he gets rid of a falsehood and learns better, against his will whenever he is deprived of a truth. I understand, he said, the willing loss of a resolution, the meaning of the unwilling I have yet to learn. Why, I said, do you not see that men are unwillingly deprived of a good and willingly of an evil? is not to have lost the truth an evil, and to possess the truth a good? And you would agree that to conceive things as they are is to possess the truth? Yes, he replied, I agree with you in thinking that mankind are deprived of truth against their will. And is not this involuntary deprivation caused either by theft or force or enchantment? Still, he replied, I do not understand you. I fear that I must have been talking darkly, like the tragedians. I only mean that some men are changed by persuasion, and that others forget. Argument steals away the hearts of one class and time of the other, Then this I call theft. Now you understand me? Yes. Those again who are forced are those whom the violence of some pain or grief compels to change their opinion. I understand, he said, and you are quite right. And you would also acknowledge that the enchanted are those who change their minds either under the softer influence of pleasure or the sterner influence of fear? Yes, he said, everything that deceives may be said to enchant. Therefore, as I was just now saying, we must inquire who are the best guardians of their own conviction that what they think the interest of the state is to be the rule of their lives. We must watch them from their youth upwards, and make them perform actions in which they are most likely to forget or to be deceived. And he who remembers and is not deceived is to be selected, and he who fails in the trial is to be rejected. That will be the way. Yes. And there should also be toils and pains and, and conflicts prescribed for them, in which they will be made to give further proof of the same qualities. Very right, he replied. And then, I said, we must try them with enchantments, that is the third sort of test, and see what will be their behaviour, like those who take colts amid noise and tumults to see if they are of a timid nature. So must we take our youth amid terrors of some kind, and again pass them into pleasures, and prove them more thoroughly than gold is proved in a furnace, that we may discover whether they are armed against all enchantments, and of a noble bearing always, good guardians of themselves and of the music which they have learned, and retaining under all circumstances a rhythmical and harmonious nature, such as will be most serviceable to the individual and to the state. 
and he who at every age as boy and youth and in mature life has come out of the trial victorious and pure shall be appointed a ruler and guardian of the state he shall be honoured in life and death and shall receive sepulture and other memorials of honour the greatest that we have to give but him who fails we must reject i am inclined to think that this is the sort of way in which our rulers and guardians should be chosen and appointed i speak generally and not with any pretension to exactness and speaking generally i agree with you he said and perhaps the word guardian in the fullest sense ought to be applied to this higher class only who preserve us against foreign enemies and maintain peace among our citizens at home that the one may not have the will or the others the power to harm us the young men whom we before called guardians may be more properly designated auxiliaries and supporters of the principles of the rulers i agree with you he said how then may we devise one of these needful falsehoods of which we lately spoke just one royal lie which may deceive the rulers if that be possible and at any rate the rest of the city but what sort of lie he said nothing new i replied only an old phoenician tale of what has often occurred before now in other places or as the poets say and have made the world believe though not in our time and i do not know whether such an event could ever happen again or could now even be made probable if it did how your words seem to hesitate on your lips you will not wonder i replied at my hesitation when you have heard speak he said and fear not well then i will speak although i really know not how to look you in the face or in what words to utter the audacious fiction which I propose to communicate gradually, first to the rulers, then to the soldiers, and lastly to the people. They are to be told that their youth was a dream, and the education and training which they received from us an appearance only. In reality, during all that time they were being formed and fed in the womb of the earth, where they themselves and their arms and appurtenances were manufactured. When they were completed, the earth, their mother, sent them up and so their country being their mother and also their nurse they were bound to advise for her good and to defend her against attacks and her citizens they are to regard as children of the earth and their own brothers you had good reason he said to be ashamed of the lie which you were going to tell true i replied but there is more coming i have only told you half citizens we shall say to them in our tale you are brothers yet god has framed you differently some of you have the power of command and in the composition of these he has mingled gold wherefore also they have the greatest honour others he has made of silver to be auxiliaries others again who are to be husbandmen and craftsmen he has composed of brass and iron and the species will generally be preserved in the children but as all are of the same original stock a golden parent will sometimes have a silver son or a silver parent a golden son and god proclaims as a first principle to the rulers and above all else that there is nothing which they should so anxiously guard or of which they are to be such good guardians as the purity of the race they should observe what elements mingle in their offspring for if the son of a golden or silver parent has an admixture of brass and iron, then nature orders a transposition of ranks, and the eye of the ruler must not be pitiful towards the child because he has to descend in the scale and become a husbandman or artisan, just as there may be sons of artisans who have an admixture of gold or silver in them are raised to honour and become guardians or auxiliaries for an oracle says that when a man of brass or iron guards the state it will be destroyed such is the tale is there any possibility of making our citizens believe in it not in the present generation he replied there is no way of accomplishing this but their sons may be made to believe in the tale and their sons sons and posterity after them i see the difficulty i replied yet the fostering of such a belief will make them care more for the city and for one another enough however of the fiction which may now fly abroad upon the wings of rumour 
while we arm our earth-born heroes and lead them forth under the command of their rulers. Let them look round and select a spot whence they can best suppress insurrection, if any prove refractory within, and also defend themselves against enemies, who, like wolves, may come down on the fold from without. There let them encamp, and when they have encamped, let them sacrifice to the proper gods and prepare their dwellings. Just so, he said, and their dwellings must be such as will shield them against the cold of winter and the heat of summer. I suppose you mean houses, he replied. But yes, I said, but they must be houses of soldiers and not of shopkeepers. What is the difference? he said. That I will endeavour to explain, I replied. To keep watchdogs, who from want of discipline or hunger or some evil habit or other would turn upon the sheep and worry them, and behave not like dogs but wolves, would be a foul and monstrous thing in a shepherd. Truly monstrous, he said. And therefore every care must be taken that our auxiliaries, being stronger than our citizens, may not grow to be too much for them, and become savage tyrants instead of friends and allies. Yes, great care should be taken. And would not a really good education furnish the best safeguard? But they are well educated already, he replied. I cannot be so confident, my dear Glaucon, I said. I am much more certain that they ought to be, and that true education, whatever that may be, will have the greatest tendency to civilize and humanize them in their relations to one another, and to those who are under their protection. Very true, he replied. Not only their education, but their habitations, and all that belongs to them, should be such as will neither impair their virtue as guardians, nor tempt them to prey upon the other citizens. Any man of sense must acknowledge that. He must. Then, now let us consider what will be their way of life, if they are to realize our idea of them. In the first place, none of them should have any property of his own, beyond what is absolutely necessary. Neither should they have a private house or store closed against any one who has a mind to enter. Their provisions should be only such as are required by trained warriors, who are men of temperance and courage. They should agree to receive from the citizens a fixed rate of pay, enough to meet the expenses of the year and no more, and they will go to mess and live together like soldiers in a camp. Gold and silver we will tell them that they have from God. The diviner metal is the diviner metal is within them, and they have therefore no need of the dross which is current among men, and ought not to pollute the divine by any such earthly admixture. For that commoner metal has been the source of many unholy deeds, but their own is undefiled, and they alone of all the citizens may not touch or handle silver or gold, or be under the same roof with them, or wear them, or drink from them. And this will be their salvation, and they will be the saviors of the state. But should they ever acquire homes, or lands, or monies of their own, they will become housekeepers and husbandmen instead of guardians, enemies and tyrants instead of allies of the other citizens, hating and being hated, plotting and being plotted against. They will pass their whole life in much greater terror of internal rather than external enemies, and the hour of ruin, both to themselves and to the rest of the state, will be at hand. For all which reasons may we not say that thus shall our state be ordered, and that these shall be the regulations appointed by us for guardians concerning their houses and all their matters. Yes, said Glaucon. End of Book Three Book Four, Part One of The Republic by Plato this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Here Adamantus interposed a question. How would you answer, Socrates, said he, if a person were to say that you are making these people miserable, and that they are the cause of their own unhappiness? The city, in fact, belongs to them, but they are none the better for it, whereas other men acquire lands and build large and handsome houses and have everything handsome about them, 
offering sacrifices to the gods on their own account, and practicing hospitality. Moreover, as you were saying just now, they have gold and silver and all that is usual among the favorites of fortune. But our poor citizens are no better than mercenaries who are quartered in the city and are always mounting guard. Yes, I said, and you may add that they are only fed and not paid in addition to their food like other men, and therefore they cannot, if they would, take a journey of pleasure. They have no money to spend on a mistress or on any luxurious fancy, which, as the world goes, is thought to be happiness, and many other accusations of the same nature might be added. But, said he, let us suppose all this to be included in the charge. You mean to ask, I said, what will be our answer? Yes. If we proceed along the old path, my belief, I said, is that we shall find the answer. And our answer will be that, even as they are, our guardians may very likely be the happiest of men. But our aim in founding the state was not the disproportionate happiness of any one class, but the greatest happiness of the whole. We thought that in a state which is ordered with a view to the good of the whole, we should be most likely to find justice, and having found them, we might then decide which of the two is the happier. At present, I take it, we are fashioning the happy state, not piecemeal, or with a view of making a few happy citizens, but as a whole, and by and by we will proceed to view the opposite kind of state. Suppose that we were painting a statue, and someone came up to us and said, Why do you not put the most beautiful colors on the most beautiful parts of the body? The eyes are to be purple, but you have made them black. To him we might fairly answer, Sir, you would not surely have us beautify the eyes to such a degree that they are no longer eyes. Consider rather whether, by giving this or the other features their due proportion, we make the whole beautiful. And so I say to you, do not compel us to assign to the guardians a sort of happiness which will make them anything but guardians. For we too can clothe our husbandmen in royal apparel, and set crowns of gold on their heads, and bid them till the ground as much as they like, and no more. Our potters also might be allowed to repose on couches and feast by the fireside, passing round the wine-cup, while their wheel is conveniently at hand, and working at pottery only as much as they like. In this way we might make every class happy, and then, as you imagine, the whole state would be happy. But do not put this idea into our heads, for if we listen to you, the husbandman will be no longer a husbandman, the potter will cease to be a potter, and no one will have the character of any distinct class in the state. Now this is not of much consequence, where the corruption of society and pretension to be what you are not is confined to cobblers, but when the guardians of the laws and of the government are only seeming and not real guardians, then see how they turn the state upside down, and on the other hand they alone have the power of giving order and happiness to the state. We mean our guardians to be true saviors, and not the destroyers of the state, whereas our opponent is thinking of peasants at a festival, who are enjoying a life of revelry, not of citizens who are doing their duty to the state. But if so, we mean different things, and he is speaking of something which is not a state, and therefore we must consider whether in appointing our guardians we would look to their greatest happiness individually, or whether this principle of happiness does not rather reside in the state as a whole. But if the latter be the truth, then the guardians and auxiliaries, and all others equal with them, must be compelled or induced to do their own work in the best way. And thus the whole state will grow up in a noble order, and the several classes will receive the proportion of happiness which nature assigns to them. I think that you are quite right. I wonder whether you will agree with another remark which occurs to me. What might that be? There seem to be two causes of the deterioration of the arts. What are they? Wealth, I said, and poverty. How do they act? The process is as follows. When a potter becomes rich, will he, think you, any longer take the same pains with his art? 
"'Certainly not. "'He will grow more and more indolent and careless. "'Very true. "'And the result will be that he becomes a worse potter. "'Yes, he greatly deteriorates. "'But, on the other hand, "'if he has no money and cannot provide himself with tools or instruments, "'he will not work equally well himself, "'nor will he teach his sons or apprentices to work equally well. "'Certainly not. "'Then, under the influence either of poverty or of wealth, workmen and their work are equally liable to degenerate. That is evident. Here, then, is a discovery of new evils, I said, against which the guardians will have to watch, or they will creep into the city unobserved. What evils? Wealth, I said, and poverty. The one is the parent of luxury and indolence, and the other of meanness and viciousness, and both of discontent. That is very true, he replied, but still I should like to know, Socrates, how our city will be able to go to war, especially against an enemy who is rich and powerful, if deprived of the sinews of war. There would certainly be a difficulty, I replied, in going to war with one such enemy. But there is no difficulty where there are two of them. How so? he asked. In the first place, I said, if we have to fight, our side will be trained warriors fighting against an army of rich men. That is true, he said. And do you not suppose, Adamantus, that a single boxer who is perfect in his art would easily be a match for two stout and well-to-do gentlemen who were not boxers? Well, hardly, if they came upon him at once. "'What now?' I said. "'If we were able to run away and then turn and strike at the one who first came up, and supposing he were to do this several times under the heat of a scorching sun, might he not, being an expert, overturn more than one stout personage?' "'Certainly,' he said. "'There would be nothing wonderful in that.' And yet rich men probably have a greater superiority in the science and practice of boxing than they have in military qualities. Likely enough. Then we may assume that our athletes will be able to fight with two or three times their own number. I agree with you, for I think you're right. And supposing that, before engaging, our citizens send an embassy to one of the two cities telling them what is the truth— Silver and gold we neither have nor are permitted to have, but you may. Do you, therefore, come and help us in war, and take the spoils of the other city? Who, on hearing these words, would choose to fight against lean, wiry dogs, rather than, with the dogs on their side, against fat and tender sheep? That is not likely, and yet there might be a danger to the poor state if the wealth of many states were to be gathered into one. But how simple of you to use the term state at all of any but our own. Why so? You ought to speak of other states in the plural number. Not one of them is a city, but many cities, as they say in the game. For indeed any city, however small, is in fact divided into two, one the city of the poor, the other of the rich. These are at war with one another and in either there are many smaller divisions, and you would be altogether beside the mark if you treated them all as a single state. But if you deal with them as many, and give the wealth or power or persons of one to the others, you will always have a great many friends, and not many enemies. And your state, while the wise order which has now been prescribed continues to prevail in her, will be the greatest of states, I do not mean to say in reputation or appearance, but in deed and truth, though she number not more than a thousand defenders. A single state which is her equal you will hardly find, either among Hellenes or barbarians, though many that appear to be as great and many times greater. That is most true, he said. When what, I said, will be the best limit for our rulers to fix when they are considering the size of the state and the amount of territory which they are to include, and beyond which they will not go? What limit would you propose? I would allow the state to increase so far as is consistent with unity. That, I think, is the proper limit. Very good, he said. Here, then, I said, is another order which will have to be conveyed to our guardians, let our city be accounted neither large nor small, but one and self-sufficing. 
and surely said he this is not a very severe order which we impose upon them and the other said i of which we were speaking before is lighter still i mean the duty of degrading the offspring of the guardians when inferior and of elevating into the rank of guardians the offspring of the lower classes when naturally superior the intention was that in the case of the citizens generally each individual should be put to the use for which nature intended him one to one work and then every man would do his own business and be one and not many and so the whole city would be one and not many yes he said that is not so difficult the regulations which we are prescribing my good adamantus are not as might be supposed a number of great principles but trifles all if care be taken as the saying is of the one great thing a thing however which i would rather call not great but sufficient for our purpose what may that be he asked education i said and nurture if our citizens are well educated and grow into sensible men they will easily see their way through all these as well as other matters which i omit such for example as marriage the possession of women and the procreation of children which will all follow the general principle that friends have all things in common as the proverb says that will be the best way of settling them also i said the state if once started well moves with accumulating force like a wheel for good nurture and education implant good constitutions and these good constitutions taking root in a good education improve more and more and this improvement affects the breed in man as in other animals very possibly he said then to sum up this is the point to which above all the attention of our rulers should be directed that music and gymnastic be preserved in their original form and no innovation made they must do their utmost to maintain them intact and when any one says that mankind must regard the newest song which the singers have they will be afraid that he may be praising not new songs but a new kind of song and this ought not to be praised or conceived to be the meaning of the poet for any musical innovation is full of danger to the whole state and ought to be prohibited so damon tells me and i can quite believe him he says that when modes of music change the fundamental laws of the state always change with them yes said adimantus and you may add my suffrage to damon's and your own then i said our guardians must lay the foundations of their fortress in music yes he said the lawlessness of which you speak too easily steals in yes i replied in the form of amusement and at first sight it appears harmless why yes he said and there is no harm were it not that little by little this spirit of license finding a home imperceptibly penetrates into manners and customs whence issuing with greater force it invades contracts between man and man and from contracts goes on to laws and constitutions in utter recklessness ending at last socrates by an overthrow of all rights private as well as public is that true i said that is my belief he replied then as i was saying our youth should be trained from the first in a stricter system for if amusements become lawless and the youths themselves become lawless they can never grow up into well-conducted and virtuous citizens very true he said and when they have made a good beginning in play and by the help of music have gained the habit of good order then this habit of order in a manner how unlike the lawless play of the others will accompany them in all their actions and be a principle of growth to them and if there be any fallen places in the state will raise them up again very true he said thus educated they will invent for themselves any lesser rules which their predecessors have altogether neglected what do you mean i mean such things as these when the young are to be silent before their elders how they are to show respect to them by standing and making them sit 
what honour is due to parents, what garments or shoes are to be worn, the mode of dressing the hair, deportment and manners in general. You would agree with me? Yes. But there is, I think, small wisdom in legislating about such matters. I doubt if it is ever done, nor are any precise written enactments about them likely to be lasting. Impossible. It would seem, Adamantus, that the direction in which education starts a man will determine his future life. Does not like always attract like, to be sure, until some one rare and grand result is reached which may be good, and may be the reverse of good? That is not to be denied. And for this reason, I said, I shall not attempt to legislate further about them. Naturally enough, he replied. Well, and about the business of the agora, and the original dealings between man and man, or again about agreements with artisans, about insult and injury, or the commencement of actions and the appointment of juries, what would you say? There may also arise questions about any impositions and exactions of market and harbour dues which may be required, and in general about the regulations of markets, police, harbours, and the like. Oh, heavens! Shall we condescend to legislate on any of these particulars? I think, he said, that there is no need to impose laws about them on good men. What regulations are necessary they will find out soon enough for themselves. Yes, I said, my friend, if God will only preserve to them the laws which we have given them. And without divine help, said Adimantus, they will go on forever making and bending their laws and their lives in the hope of attaining perfection. You would compare them, I said, to those invalids who, having no self-restraint, will not leave off their habits of intemperance? Exactly. Yes, I said, and what a delightful life they lead. They are always doctoring and increasing and complicating their disorders, and always fancying that they will be cured by any nostrum which anybody advises them to try. Some cases are very common, he said, with invalids of this sort. Yes, I replied, and the charming thing is that they deem him their worst enemy who tells them the truth, which is simply that unless they give up eating and drinking and wenching and idling, Neither drug nor cautery nor spell nor amulet nor any other remedy will avail. Charming, he replied. I see nothing charming in going into a passion with a man who tells you what is right. These gentlemen, I said, do not seem to be in your good graces. Ah, uh, assuredly not. Nor would you praise the behavior of states which act like the men whom I was just now describing, for are there not ill-ordered states in which the citizens are forbidden under pain of death to alter the constitution, and yet he who most sweetly courts those who live under this regime, and indulges them, and fawns upon them, and is skilful at anticipating and gratifying their humours, is held to be a great and good statesman? Do not these states resemble the persons whom I was describing? Yes, he said, the states are as bad as the men, and I am very far from praising them. But do you not admire, I said, the coolness and dexterity of these ready ministers of political corruption? Yes, he said, I do, but not for all of them, for there are some whom the applause of the multitude has deluded into the belief that they are really statesmen, and these are not much to be admired. What do you mean? I said. You should have more feeling for them. When a man cannot measure, and a great many others who cannot measure declare that he is four cubits high, can he help believing what they say? Nay, he said, certainly not in that case. Well, then, do not be angry with them, for are they not as good as a play, trying their hand at paltry reforms such as I was describing? They are always fancying that by legislation they will make an end of frauds in contracts, and the other rascalities which I was mentioning, not knowing that they are in reality cutting off the heads of the hydra. Yes, he said, that is just what they are doing. I conceive, I said, that the true legislator will not trouble himself with this class of enactments, whether concerning laws or the Constitution, either in an ill-ordered or in a well-ordered state. 
for in the former they are quite useless, and in the latter there will be no difficulty in devising them, and many of them will naturally flow out of our previous regulations. What, then, he said, is still remaining to us of the work of legislation? Nothing to us, I replied, but to Apollo, the god of Delphi, there remains the ordering of the greatest and noblest and chiefest things of all. Which are they? he said the institution of temples and sacrifices, and the entire service of gods, demigods, and heroes, also the ordering of the repositories of the dead, and the rites which have to be observed by him who would propitiate the inhabitants of the world below. These are matters of which we are ignorant ourselves, and as founders of a city we should be unwise in trusting them to any interpreter but our ancestral deity. He is the god who sits in the centre, on the navel of the earth, and he is the interpreter of religion to all mankind. You are right, and we will do as you propose. But where, amid all this, is justice? Son of Ariston, tell me where. Now that our city has been made habitable, light a candle and search, and get your brother and Polymarchus and the rest of our friends to help and let us see wherein it we can discover justice, and wherein justice, and in what they differ from one another, and which of them the man who would be happy should have for his portion, whether seen or unseen by gods and men. Nonsense, said Glaucon. Did you not promise to search yourself, saying that for you not to help justice in her need would be an impiety? I do not deny that I said so, and as you remind me, I will be as good as my word. But you must join. Oh, we will, he replied. Well, then, I hope to make a discovery in this way. I mean to begin with the assumption that our state, if rightly ordered, is perfect. Well, that is most certain and being perfect is therefore wise and valiant and temperate and just. That is likewise clear. And whichever of these qualities we find in the state, the one which is not found will be the residue? Well, very good. If there were four things, and we were searching for one of them, wherever it might be, the one sought for might be known to us from the first, and there would be no further trouble or we might know the other three first, and then the fourth would be clearly the one left. Very true, he said. And it's not a similar method to be pursued about the virtues, which are also four in number. Clearly. First among the virtues found in the state, wisdom comes into view, and in this I detect a certain peculiarity. What is that? The state which we have been describing is said to be wise as being good in counsel, very true, and good counsel is clearly a kind of knowledge, for not by ignorance but by knowledge do men counsel well, clearly. And the kinds of knowledge in a state are many and diverse? Of course. There is the knowledge of the carpenter, but is that the sort of knowledge which gives a city the title of wise and good in counsel? Certainly not. That would only give a city the reputation of skill in carpentering. That a city is not to be called wise because possessing a knowledge which counsels for the best about wooden implements? Certainly not. Nor by reason of a knowledge which advises about brazen pots, I said, nor as possessing any other similar knowledge. Not by reason of any of them, he said. Nor yet by reason of a knowledge which cultivates the earth. That would give the city the name of agricultural. Yes. Well, I said. And is there any knowledge in our recently founded state among any of the citizens which advises not about any particular thing in the state, but about the whole, and considers how a state can best deal with itself and with other states? There certainly is. And what is this knowledge, and among whom is it found? I asked. Oh, it is the knowledge of the guardians, he replied, and is found among those whom we were just now describing as perfect guardians. And what is the name which the city derives from the possession of this sort of knowledge? The name of good in counsel and truly wise. And will there be in our city more of these true guardians or more smiths? The smiths, he replied, will be far more numerous. 
Will not the guardians be the smallest of all the classes who receive a name from the profession of such kind of knowledge? Much the smallest. And so, by reason of the smallest part or class, and of the knowledge which resides in this presiding and ruling part of itself, the whole state, being thus constituted according to nature, will be wise, and this, which has the only knowledge worthy to be called wisdom, has been ordained by nature to be of all classes the least. Most true. Thus, then, I said, the nature and place in the state of one of the four virtues has somehow or other been discovered, and in my humble opinion very satisfactorily discovered, he replied. Again, I said, there is no difficulty in seeing the nature of courage, and in what part that quality resides which gives the name of courageous to the state. Oh, how do you mean? Why, I said, every one who calls any state courageous or cowardly will be thinking of the part which fights and goes to war on the state's behalf. No one, he replied, would ever think of any other. The rest of the citizens may be courageous or may be cowardly, but their courage or cowardice will not, as I conceive, have the effect of making the city either the one or the other. Certainly not. The city will be courageous in virtue of a portion of herself which preserves under all circumstances that opinion about the nature of things to be feared and not to be feared, in which our legislator educated them, and this is what you term courage. I should like to hear what you are saying once more, for I do not think that I perfectly understand you. I mean that courage is a kind of salvation. Salvation of what? Of the opinion respecting things to be feared, what they are and of what nature, which the law implants through education. And I mean by the words, under all circumstances, to intimate that in pleasure or in pain, or under the influence of desire or fear, a man preserves and does not lose his opinion. Shall I give you an illustration? If you please. You know, I said, that dyers, when they want to dye wool for making the true sea purple, begin by selecting their white color first. This they prepare and dress with much care and pains, in order that the white ground may take the purple hue in full perfection. The dyeing then proceeds and whatever is dyed in this manner becomes a fast color, but no washing, either with lies or without them, can take away the bloom. But when the ground has not been duly prepared, you will have noticed how poor is the look, either of purple or of any other color. Yes, he said, I know that they have a washed-out and ridiculous appearance. Then now, I said, you will understand what our object was in selecting our soldiers and educating them in music and gymnastic. We are contriving influences which would prepare them to take the dye of the laws in perfection, and the color of their opinion about dangers and of every other opinion was to be indelibly fixed by their nurture and training, not to be washed away by such potent lies as pleasure mightier agent far in washing the soul than any soda or lye, or by sorrow, fear, and desire, the mightiest of all other solvents. And this sort of universal saving power of true opinion in conformity with law about real and false dangers, I call and maintain to be courage, unless you disagree. But I agree, he replied, for I suppose that you mean to exclude more uninstructed courage, such as that of a wild beast or a slave. This, in your opinion, is not the courage which law ordains, and ought to have another name. Most certainly. Then I may infer courage to be such as you describe. Why, yes, said I, you may, and if you add the words of a citizen, you will not be far wrong. Hereafter, if you like, we will carry the examination further, but at present we are seeking not for courage, but justice, and for the purpose of our inquiry we have said enough. You are right, he replied. Two virtues remain to be discovered in the state, first temperance, and then justice, which is the end of our search. Very true. Now, can we find justice without troubling ourselves about temperance? 
I do not know how that could be accomplished, he said, nor do I desire that justice should be brought to light and temperance lost sight of, and therefore I wish that you would do me the favour of considering temperance first. Certainly, I replied, I should not be justified in refusing your request. Then consider, he said. Yes, I replied, I will. And as far as I can at present see, the virtue of temperance has more of the nature of harmony and symphony than the preceding. How so? he asked. Temperance, I replied, is the ordering or controlling of certain pleasures and desires. This is curiously enough implied in the saying of a man being his own master, and other traces of the same notion may be found in language. No doubt, he said, there is something ridiculous in the expression master of himself, for the master is also the servant, and the servant the master, and in all these modes of speaking the same person is denoted. Certainly. The meaning is, I believe, that in the human soul there is a better and also a worse principle, and when the better has the worse under control, then a man is said to be master of himself, and this is a term of praise. But when, owing to evil education or association, the better principle, which is also the smaller, is overwhelmed by the greater mass of the worse, in this case he is blamed, and is called the slave of self and unprincipled. Yes, there is reason in that. And now, I said, look at our newly created state, and there you will find one of these two conditions realized, for the state, as you will acknowledge, may be justly called master of itself, if the words temperance and self-mastery truly express the rule of the better part over the worse. Yes, he said, I see that what you say is true. Let me further note that the manifold and complex pleasures and desires and pains are generally found in children and women and servants, and in the free men so called who are the lowest and more numerous class. Certainly, he said, whereas the simple and moderate desires which follow reason and are under the guidance of mind and true opinion are to be found only in a few, and those the best born and best educated. Very true. These two, as you may perceive, have a place in our state, and the meaner desires of the many are held down by the virtuous desires and wisdom of the few. For that I perceive, he said. Then, if there be any city which may be described as master of its own pleasures and desires, and master of itself, Ours may claim such a designation? Certainly, he replied. It may also be called temperate, and for the same reasons? Yes. And if there be any state in which rulers and subjects will be agreed as to the question who are to rule, that again will be our state, undoubtedly. And the citizens being thus agreed among themselves, in which class will temperance be found, in the rulers or in their subjects? "'In both, as I should imagine,' he replied. "'Do you observe that we are not far wrong in our guess that temperance was a sort of harmony? Why so? Why? Because temperance is unlike courage and wisdom, each of which resides in a part only, the one making the state wise and the other valiant. Not so temperance, which extends to the whole, and runs through all the notes of the scale, and produces a harmony of the weaker and the stronger and the middle class, whether you suppose them to be stronger or weaker in wisdom or power or numbers or wealth, or anything else. Most truly, then, may we deem temperance to be the agreement of the naturally superior and inferior, as to the right of rule of either, both in states and individuals. I entirely agree with you. And so, I said, we may consider three out of the four virtues to have been discovered in our state. The last of these qualities which make a state virtuous must be justice, if we only knew what that was. The inference is obvious. The time has then arrived, Glaucon, when, like huntsmen, we should surround the cover, and look sharp that justice does not steal away, and pass out of sight, and escape us for beyond a doubt she is somewhere in this country. Watch, therefore, and strive to catch a sight of her, and if you see her first, let me know. Would that I could, 
but you should regard me rather as a follower who has just eyes enough to see what you show him that is about as much as i am good for offer a prayer with me and follow i will but you must show me the way here is no path i said and the wood is dark and perplexing still we must push on let us push on end of book four part one Book Four, Part Two of the Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Here I saw something. Hello, I said. I begin to perceive a track, and I believe that the quarry will not escape. Good news, he said. Truly, I said, we are stupid fellows why so why my good sir at the beginning of our inquiry ages ago there was justice tumbling out at our feet and we never saw her nothing could be more ridiculous like people who go about looking for what they have in their hands that was the way with us we looked not at what we were seeking but at what was far off in the distance and therefore i suppose we missed her what do you mean i mean to say that in reality for a long time past we have been talking of justice and have failed to recognize her i grow impatient at the length of your exordium well then tell me i said whether i am right or not you remember the original principle which we were always laying down at the foundation of the state that one man should practice one thing only the thing to which his nature was best adapted now justice is this principle or a part of it yes we often said that one man should do one thing only further we affirmed that justice was doing one's own business and not being a busybody we said so again and again and many others have said the same to us yes we said so then to do one's own business in a certain way may be assumed to be justice can you tell me whence i derive this inference i cannot but i should like to be told because i think that this is the only virtue which remains in the state when the other virtues of temperance and courage and wisdom are abstracted and that this is the ultimate cause and condition of the existence of all of them and while remaining in them is also their preservative and we were saying that if the three were discovered by us justice would be the fourth or remaining one well, that follows of necessity if we are asked to determine which of these four qualities by its presence contributes most to the excellence of the state whether the agreement of rulers and subjects or the preservation in the soldiers of the opinion which the law ordains about the true nature of dangers or wisdom and watchfulness in the rulers or whether this other which i am mentioning and which is found in children and women slave and freeman artisan ruler subject the quality i mean of every one doing his own work and not being a busybody would claim the palm the question is not so easily answered certainly he replied there would be a difficulty in saying which then the power of each individual in the state to do his own work appears to compete with the other political virtues wisdom temperance courage yes he said and the virtue which enters into this competition is justice exactly let us look at the question from another point of view are not the rulers in a state those to whom you would entrust the office of determining suits at law certainly and are suits decided on any other ground but that a man may neither take what is another's nor be deprived of what is his own yes that is their principle which is a just principle yes then on this view also justice will be admitted to be the having and doing what is a man's own and belongs to him very true think now and say whether you agree with me or not 
suppose a carpenter to be doing the business of a cobbler or a cobbler of a carpenter and suppose them to exchange their implements or their duties or the same person to be doing the work of both or whatever be the change do you think that any great harm would result to the state not much but when the cobbler or any other man whom nature designed to be a trader having his heart lifted up by wealth or strength or the number of his followers or any like advantage attempts to force his way into the class of warriors or a warrior into that of legislators and guardians for which he is unfitted and either to take the implements or the duties of the other or when a man is trader legislator and warrior all in one then i think you will agree with me in saying that this interchange and this meddling of one with another is the ruin of the state most true seeing then i said that there are three distinct classes any meddling of one with another or the change of one into another is the greatest harm to the state and may be most justly termed evil doing precisely and the greatest degree of evil doing to one's own city would be termed by you injustice certainly this then is injustice and on the other hand when the trader the auxiliary and the guardian each do their own business that is justice and will make the city just i agree with you we will not i said be over positive as yet but if on trial this conception of justice be verified in the individual as well as in the state there will be no longer any room for doubt if it be not verified we must have a fresh inquiry first let us complete the old investigation which we began as you remember under the impression that if we could previously examine justice on the larger scale there would be less difficulty in discerning her in the individual that larger example appeared to be the state and accordingly we constructed as good a one as we could knowing well that in the good state justice would be found let the discovery which we made be now applied to the individual if they agree we shall be satisfied or if there be a difference in the individual we will come back to the state and have another trial of the theory the friction of the two when rubbed together may possibly strike a light in which justice will shine forth and the vision which is then revealed we will fix in our souls that will be in regular course let us do as you say i proceeded to ask when two things a greater and less are called by the same name are they like or unlike in so far as they are called the same like he replied the just man then if we regard the idea of justice only will be like the just state he will and a state was thought by us to be just when the three classes in the state severally did their own business and also thought to be temperate and valiant and wise by reason of certain other affections and qualities of these same classes true he said and so of the individual we may assume that he has the same three principles in his own soul which we find in the state and he may be rightly described in the same terms because he is affected in the same manner certainly he said once more then o oh my friend we have alighted upon an easy question whether the soul has these three principles or not an easy question nay rather socrates the proverb holds that hard is the good very true i said and i do not think that the method which we are employing is at all adequate to the accurate solution of this question the true method is another and a longer one still we may arrive at a solution not below the level of the previous inquiry oh, may we not be satisfied with that he said under the circumstances i am quite content i too i replied shall be extremely well satisfied then fate not in pursuing the speculation he said must we not acknowledge i said that in each of us there are the same principles and habits which there are in the state 
and that from the individual they pass into the state. How else can they come there? Take the quality of passion or spirit. It would be ridiculous to imagine that this quality, when found in states, is not derived from the individuals who are supposed to possess it. For example, the Thracians, the Scythians, and in general the northern nations, and the same may be said of the love of knowledge, which is the special characteristic of our part of the world, or the love of money, which may, with equal truth, be attributed to the Phoenicians and Egyptians. Exactly so, he said. There is no difficulty in understanding this. None whatever. But the question is not quite so easy when we proceed to ask whether these principles are three or one. Whether, that is to say, we learn with one part of our nature, are angry with another, and with a third part desire the satisfaction of our natural appetites, or whether the whole soul comes into play in each sort of action. To determine that is the difficulty. Yes, he said, there lies the difficulty. Then let us now try and determine whether they are the same or different. How can we? he asked. I replied as follows. The same thing clearly cannot act or be acted upon in the same part, or in relation to the same thing at the same time in contrary ways, and therefore Whenever this contradiction occurs in things apparently the same, we know that they are really not the same, but different. Good. For example, I said, can the same thing be at rest and in motion at the same time in the same part? Or impossible. Still, I said, let us have a more precise statement of terms, lest we should hereafter fall out by the way. Imagine the case of a man who is standing and also moving his hands and his head, and suppose a person to say that one and the same person is in motion and at rest at the same moment. To such a mode of speech we should object, and should rather say that one part of him is in motion while another is at rest. Very true. And suppose the objector, to refine still further, and to draw the nice distinction that not only parts of tops but whole tops when they spin round with their pegs fixed on the spot are at rest and in motion at the same time and he may say the same of anything which revolves in the same spot his objection would not be admitted by us because in such cases things are not at rest and in motion in the same parts of themselves we should rather say that they have both an axis and a circumference, and that the axis stands still, for there is no deviation from the perpendicular, and that the circumference goes round. But if, while revolving, the axis inclines, either to the right or left, forwards or backwards, then in no point of view can they be at rest. That is the correct mode of describing them, he replied then none of these objections will confuse us, or incline us to believe that the same thing at the same time, in the same part, or in relation to the same thing, can act or be acted upon in contrary ways. Certainly not, according to my way of thinking. Yet, I said, that we may not be compelled to examine all such objections, and prove at length that they are untrue, let us assume their absurdity, and go forward on the understanding that hereafter, if this assumption turn out to be untrue, all the consequences which follow shall be withdrawn. Yes, he said, that will be the best way. Well, I said, would you not allow that assent and dissent, desire and aversion, attraction and repulsion, are all of them opposites, whether they are regarded as active or passive, for that makes no difference in the fact of their opposition. Yes, he said, they are opposites. Well, I said, and hunger and thirst, and the desires in general, and, again, willing and wishing, all these you would refer to the classes already mentioned. You would say, would you not, that the soul of him who desires is seeking after the object of his desire, or that he is drawing to himself the thing which he wishes to possess, or, again, when a person wants anything to be given him, 
his mind longing for the realization of his desire intimates his wish to have it by a nod of assent as if he had been asked a question very true and what would you say of unwillingness and dislike and the absence of desire should not these be referred to the opposite class of repulsion and rejection certainly admitting this to be true of desire generally let us suppose a particular class of desires and out of these we will select hunger and thirst as they are termed which are the most obvious of them let us take that class he said the object of one is food and of the other drink yes and here comes the point is not thirst the desire which the soul has of drink and of drink only not of drink qualified by anything else for example warm or cold or much or little or in a word drink of any particular sort but if the thirst be accompanied by heat then the desire is of cold drink or if accompanied by cold then of warm drink or if the thirst be excessive then the drink which is desired will be excessive or if not great the quantity of drink will also be small but thirst pure and simple will desire drink pure and simple which is the natural selection of thirst as food is of hunger yes he said the simple desire is as you say in every case of the simple object and the qualified desire of the qualified object but here a confusion may arise and i should wish to guard against an opponent starting up and saying that no man desires drink only but good drink or food only but good food for good is the universal object of desire and thirst being a desire will necessarily be thirst after good drink and the same is true of every other desire yes he replied the opponent might have something to say nevertheless i should still maintain that of relatives some have a quality attached to either term of the relation others are simple and have their correlatives simple i do not know what you mean well you know of course that the greater is relative to the less certainly and the much greater to the much less yes and the sometime greater to the sometime less and the greater that is to be to the less that is to be certainly he said and so of more and less and of other correlative terms such as the double and the half or, or again the heavier and the lighter the swifter and the slower and of hot and cold and of any other relatives is not this true of all of them yes and does not the same principle hold in the sciences the object of science is knowledge assuming that to be the true definition but the object of a particular science is a particular kind of knowledge i mean for example that the science of house-building is a kind of knowledge which is defined and distinguished from other kinds and is therefore termed architecture certainly because it has a particular quality which no other has yes and it has this particular quality because it has an object of a particular kind and this is true of the other arts and sciences yes now then if i made myself clear you will understand my original meaning in what i said about relatives my meaning was that if one term of a relation is taken alone the other is taken alone if one term is qualified the other is also qualified i do not mean to say that relatives may not be desperate or that the science of health is healthy or of disease necessarily diseased or that the sciences of good and evil are therefore good and evil but only that when the term science is no longer used absolutely but has a qualified object which in this case is the nature of health and disease it becomes defined and is hence called not merely science but the science of medicine i quite understand and i think as you do would you not say that thirst is one of these essentially relative terms having clearly a relation yes thirst is relative to drink and a certain kind of thirst is relative to a certain kind of drink 
but thirst taken alone is neither of much nor little nor of good nor bad nor of any particular kind of drink but of drink only certainly then the soul of the thirsty one in so far as he is thirsty desires only drink for this he yearns and tries to obtain it for that is plain and if you suppose something which pulls a thirsty soul away from drink that must be different from the thirsty principle which draws him like a beast to drink for as we were saying the same thing cannot at the same time with the same part of itself act in contrary ways about the same impossible no more than you can say that the hands of the archer push and pull the bow at the same time but what you say is that one hand pushes and the other pulls exactly so he replied and might a man be thirsty and yet unwilling to drink yes he said it constantly happens and in such a case what is one to say would you not say that there was something in the soul bidding a man to drink and something else forbidding him which is other and stronger than the principle which bids him i should say so and the forbidding principle is derived from reason and that which bids and attracts proceeds from passion and disease clearly then we may fairly assume that they are two and that they differ from one another the one with which a man reasons we may call the rational principle of the soul the other we may call the rational principle of the soul the other with which he loves and hungers and thirsts and feels the flutterings of any other desire may be termed the irrational or appetitive the ally of sundry pleasures and satisfactions yes he said we may fairly assume them to be different then let us finally determine that there are two principles existing in the soul and what of passion or spirit is it a third or akin to one of the preceding i should be inclined to say akin to desire well i said there is a story which i remember to have heard and in which i put faith the story is that leontius the son of alglion coming up one day from the piraeus under the north wall on the outside observed some dead bodies lying on the ground at the place of execution he felt a desire to see them and also a dread and abhorrence of them for a time he struggled and covered his eyes but at length the desire got the better of him and forcing them open he ran up to the dead bodies saying look ye wretches take your fill of the fair sight i have heard the story myself he said the moral of the tale is that anger at times goes to war with desire as though they were two distinct things yes that is the meaning he said and are there not many other cases in which we observe that when a man's desires violently prevail over his reason he reviles himself and is angry at the violence within him and that in this struggle which is like the struggle of factions in a state his spirit is on the side of his reason but for the passionate or spirited element to take part with the desires when reason decides that she should not be opposed is a sort of thing which i believe that you never observed occurring in yourself nor as i should imagine in any one else certainly not suppose that a man thinks he has done a wrong to another the nobler he is the less able he is to feel indignant at any suffering such as hunger or cold or any other pain which the injured person may inflict upon him these he deems to be just and as i say his anger refuses to be excited by them true he said but when he thinks that he is the sufferer of the wrong then he boils and chafes and is on the side of what he believes to be justice and because he suffers hunger or cold or other pain he is only the more determined to persevere and conquer his noble spirit will not be quelled until he either slays or is slain or until he hears the voice of the shepherd that is reason 
bidding his dog bark no more. "'The illustration is perfect,' he replied, "'and in our state, as we were saying, the auxiliaries were to be dogs, and to hear the voice of the rulers, who are their shepherds.' "'I perceive,' I said, "'that you quite understand me. There is, however, a further point which I wish to consider.' what point you remember that passion or spirit appeared at first sight to be a kind of desire but now we should say quite the contrary for in the conflict of the soul spirit is arrayed on the side of the rational principle most assuredly but a further question arises is passion different from reason also or only a kind of reason in which latter case instead of three principles in the soul there will be only two the rational and the concupiscent or rather as the state was composed of three classes traders auxiliaries counsellors so may there not be in the individual soul a third element which is passion or spirit and when not corrupted by bad education is the natural auxiliary of reason yes he said there must be a third yes i replied if passion which has already been shown to be different from desire turns out also to be different from reason but that is easily proved we may observe even in young children that they are full of spirit almost as soon as they are born whereas some of them never seem to attain the use of reason and most of them late enough excellent i said and you may see passion equally in brute animals which is a further proof of the truth of what you are saying and we may once more appeal to the words of homer which have already been quoted by us he smote his breast and thus rebuked his soul for in this verse homer has clearly supposed the power which reasons about the better and worse to be different from the unreasoning anger which is rebuked by it very true he said and so after much tossing we have reached land and are fairly agreed that the same principles which exist in the state exist also in the individual and that they are three in number exactly must we not then infer that the individual is wise in the same way and in virtue of the same quality which makes the state wise certainly also that the same quality which constitutes courage in the state constitutes courage in the individual, and that both the state and the individual bear the same relation to all the other virtues? Assuredly. And the individual will be acknowledged by us to be just in the same way in which the state is just? Well, that follows, of course. We cannot but remember that the justice of the state consisted in each of the three classes doing the work of its own class. We are not very likely to have forgotten, he said. We must recollect that the individual in whom the several qualities of his nature do their own work will be just and will do his own work. Yes, he said, we must remember that too and ought not the rational principle which is wise and has the care of the whole soul to rule and the passionate or spirited principle to be the subject and ally certainly and as we were saying the united influence of music and gymnastic will bring them into accord nerving and sustaining the reason with noble words and lessons and moderating and soothing and civilizing the wildness of passion by harmony and rhythm quite true he said and these two thus nurtured and educated and having learned truly to know their own functions will rule over the concupiscent which in each of us is the largest part of the soul and by nature most insatiable of gain over this they will keep guard lest waxing great and strong with the fullness of bodily pleasures as they are termed the concupiscent soul no longer confined to her own sphere should attempt to enslave and rule those who are not her natural-born subjects and overturn the whole life of man very true he said both together will they not be the best defenders of the whole soul and the whole body against attacks from without 
the one counselling, and the other fighting under his leader, and courageously executing his commands and counsels. True, and he is to be deemed courageous, whose spirit retains in pleasure and in pain the commands of reason about what he ought or ought not to fear. Right, he replied. And him we will call wise, who has in him that little part which rules, and which proclaims these commands, that part too being supposed to have a knowledge of what is for the interest of each of the three parts, and of the whole? Assuredly. And would you not say that he is temperate, who has these same elements in friendly harmony, in whom the one ruling principle of reason, and the two subject ones of spirit and desire, are equally agreed that reason ought to rule, and do not rebel? Certainly, he said, that is the true account of temperance, whether in the state or individual. And surely, I said, we have just explained again and again how, and by virtue of what quality, a man will be just. That is very certain. And is justice dimmer in the individual, and is her form different, or is she the same which we found her to be in the state? There is no difference in my opinion, he said, because if any doubt is still lingering in our minds, a few commonplace instances will satisfy us of the truth of what I am saying. What sort of instances do you mean? If the case is put to us, we must not admit that the just state, or the man who is trained in the principles of such a state, will be less likely than the unjust to make away with a deposit of gold or silver. Would any one deny this? No one, he replied. Will the just man or citizen ever be guilty of sacrilege or theft, or treachery either to his friends or to his country? Never. Neither will he ever break faith where there have been oaths or agreements? Impossible. No one will be less likely to commit adultery, or to dishonour his father and mother, or to fail in his religious duties. No one. And the reason is that each part of him is doing its own business, whether in ruling or being ruled. Exactly so. Are you satisfied, then, that the quality which makes such men and such states is justice, or do you hope to discover some other? But not I, indeed then our dream has been realized and the suspicion which we entertained at the beginning of our work of construction that some divine power must have conducted us to a primary form of justice has now been verified yes certainly and the division of labour which required the carpenter and the shoemaker and the rest of the citizens to be doing each his own business and not another's was a shadow of justice, and for that reason it was of use. Clearly. But in reality, justice was such as we were describing, being concerned, however, not with the outward man, but with the inward, which is the true self and concernment of man. For the just man does not permit the several elements within him to interfere with one another, or any of them to do the work of others. He sets in order his own inner life, and is his own master and his own law, and at peace with himself. And when he has bound together the three principles within him, which may be compared to the higher, lower, and middle notes of a scale, and the intermediate intervals, when he has bound all these together, and is no longer many, but has become one entirely temperate and perfectly adjusted nature, then he proceeds to act, if he has to act, whether in a matter of property, or in the treatment of the body, or in some affair of politics or private business, always thinking and calling that which preserves and cooperates with this harmonious condition, just and good action, and the knowledge which presides over it, wisdom, and which at any time impairs this condition, he will call unjust action and the opinion which presides over it, ignorance. You have said the exact truth, Socrates. Very good. And if we were to affirm that we had discovered the just man and the just state, 
and the nature of justice in each of them, we should not be telling a falsehood. Most certainly not. May we say so, then? Let us say so. And now, I said, injustice has to be considered. Clearly. Must not injustice be a strife, which arises among the three principles of meddlesomeness and interference, and rising up of a part of the soul against the whole, an assertion of unlawful authority, which is made by a rebellious subject against a true prince, of whom he is the natural vassal? What is all this confusion and delusion but injustice? and intemperance and cowardice and ignorance and every form of vice exactly so and if the nature of justice and injustice be known then the meaning of acting unjustly and being unjust or again of acting justly will also be perfectly clear what do you mean he said why i said they are like disease and health being in the soul just what disease and health are in the body. How so? he said. Why? I said, that which is healthy causes health, and that which is unhealthy causes disease. Yes. And just actions cause justice, and unjust actions cause injustice? Well, that is certain. And the creation of health is the institution of a natural order, and government of one by another in the parts of the body, and the creation of disease is the production of a state of things at variance with this natural order. True. And is not the creation of justice the institution of a natural order, and government of one by another in the parts of the soul, and the creation of injustice the production of a state of things at variance with the natural order. Exactly so, he said. Then, virtue is the health and beauty and well-being of the soul, and vice the disease and weakness and deformity of the same. True. And do not good practices lead to virtue, and evil practices to vice? Assuredly. Still, our old question of the comparative advantage of justice and injustice has not been answered. Which is the more profitable, to be just and act justly and practice virtue, whether seen or unseen, of gods and men, or to be unjust and act unjustly, if only unpunished and unreformed? In my judgment, Socrates, the question has now become ridiculous. We know that when the bodily constitution is gone, life is no longer endurable though pampered with all kinds of meats and drinks and having all wealth and all power and shall we be told that when the very essence of the vital principle is undermined and corrupted life is still worth having to a man if only he be allowed to do whatever he likes with the single exception that he is not to acquire justice and virtue or to escape from injustice and vice assuming them both to be such as we have described yes i said the question is as you say ridiculous still as we are near the spot at which we may see the truth in the clearest manner with our own eyes let us not faint by the way certainly not he replied come up hither i said and behold the various forms of vice those of them, I mean, which are worth looking at. I am following you, he replied. Proceed. I said, the argument seems to have reached a height from which, as from some tower of speculation, a man may look down and see that virtue is one, but that the forms of vice are innumerable, there being four special ones which are deserving of note. What do you mean? he said i mean i replied that there appear to be as many forms of the soul as there are distinct forms of the state how many there are five of the state and five of the soul i said well, what are they the first i said is that which we have been describing and which may be said to have two names monarchy and aristocracy accordingly as rule is exercised by one distinguished man or by many true he replied 
but I regard the two names as describing one form only. For whether the government is in the hands of one or many, if the governors have been trained in the manner which we have supposed, the fundamental laws of the state will be maintained. That is true, he replied. End of Book Four Book Five, Part One of the Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Such is the good and true city or state, and the good and true man is of the same pattern. And if this is right, every other is wrong, and the evil is one which affects not only the ordering of the state but also the regulation of the individual soul, and is exhibited in four forms. "'What are they?' he said. I was proceeding to tell the order in which the four evil forms appeared to me to succeed one another, when Polymarchus, who was sitting a little way off, just beyond Adamantus, began to whisper to him. Stretching forth his hand, he took hold of the upper part of his coat by the shoulder, and drew him towards him leading forward himself so as to be quite close, and saying something in his ear, of which I only caught the words, Shall we let him off, or what shall we do? Certainly not, said Adamantus, raising his voice. Who is it, I said, whom you are refusing to let off? You, he said. I repeated, Why am I especially not to be let off? Why, he said, we think that you are lazy, and mean to cheat us out of a whole chapter which is a very important part of the story, and you fancy that we shall not notice your airy way of proceeding, as if it were self-evident to everybody that in the matter of women and children friends have all things in common. And was I not right, Adamantus? Yes, he said, but what is right in this particular case, like everything else, requires to be explained, for community may be of many kinds. Please, therefore, to say what sort of community you mean. We have been long expecting that you would tell us something about the family life of your citizens, how they will bring children into the world and rear them when they have arrived, and in general, what is the nature of this community of women and children. For we are of opinion that the right or wrong management of such matters will have a great and paramount influence on the state for good or for evil. And now, since the question is still undetermined, and you are taking in hand another state, we have resolved, as you heard, not to let you go until you give an account of all this. To that resolution, said Glaucon, you may regard me as saying agreed. And without more ado, said Trisimachus, you may consider us all to be equally agreed. I said, you know not what you are doing in thus assailing me. What an argument are you raising about the state? Just as I thought that I had finished, and was only too glad that I had laid this question to sleep, and was reflecting how fortunate I was in your acceptance of what I then said, you ask me to begin again at the very foundation ignorant of what a hornet's nest of words you are stirring. Now I foresaw this gathering trouble, and avoided it. For what purpose do you conceive that we have come here, said Trisimachus, to look for gold or to hear discourse? Yes, but discourse should have a limit. Yes, Socrates, said Glaucon, and the whole of life is the only limit which wise men assign to the hearing of such discourses, but never mind about us. Take heart yourself, and answer the question in your own way. What sort of community of women and children is this which is to prevail among our guardians, and how shall we manage the period between birth and education, which seems to require the greatest care? Tell us how these things will be. Yes, my simple friend, but the answer is the reverse of easy. Many more doubts arise about this than about our previous conclusions, for the practicability of what is said may be doubted, 
and looked at in another point of view whether the scheme if ever so practicable would be for the best is also doubtful hence i feel a reluctance to approach the subject lest our aspiration my dear friend should turn out to be a dream only fear not he replied for your audience will not be hard upon you they are not sceptical or hostile i said my good friend i suppose that you mean to encourage me by these words yes he said then let me tell you that you are doing just the reverse the encouragement which you offer would have been all very well had i myself believed that i knew what i was talking about to declare the truth about matters of high interest which a man honours and loves among wise men who love him need occasion no fear of faltering in his mind but to carry on an argument when you are yourself only a hesitating inquirer which is my condition is a dangerous and slippery thing and the danger is not that i shall be laughed at of which the fear would be childish but that i shall miss the truth where i have most need to be sure of my footing and drag my friends after me in my fall and i prayed nemesis not to visit upon me the words which i am going to utter for i do indeed believe that to be an involuntary homicide is a less crime than to be a deceiver about beauty or goodness or justice in the matter of laws and that it is a risk which i would rather run among enemies than among friends therefore you do well to encourage me glaucon laughed and said well then socrates in case you and your argument do us any serious injury you shall be acquitted beforehand of the homicide, and shall not be held to be a deceiver. Take courage, then, and speak. Well, I said, the law says that when a man is acquitted he is free from guilt, and what holds at law may hold in argument. Then why should you mind? Well, I replied, i suppose that i must retrace my steps and say what i perhaps ought to have said before in the proper place the part of the men has been played out and now properly enough comes the turn of the women of them i will proceed to speak and the more readily since i am invited by you for men born and educated like our citizens the only way in my opinion of arriving at a right conclusion about the possession and use of women and children is to follow the path on which we originally started when we said that the men were to be the guardians and watchdogs of the herd true let us further suppose the birth and education of our women to be subject to similar or nearly similar regulations then we shall see whether the result accords with our design what do you mean what i mean may be put into the form of a question i said are dogs divided into he's and she's or do they both share equally in hunting and in keeping watch and in other duties of dogs or do we entrust to the males the entire and exclusive care of the flocks while we leave the females at home under the idea that the bearing and suckling their puppies is labor enough for them no he said they share alike the only difference between them is that the males are stronger and the females weaker but can you use different animals for the same purpose unless they are bred and fed in the same way you cannot then if women are to have the same duties as men they must have the same nurture and education yes the education which was assigned to the men was music and gymnastic yes then women must be taught music and gymnastic and also the art of war which they must practise like the men that is the inference i suppose i should rather expect i said that several of our proposals if they are carried out being unusual may appear ridiculous no doubt of it yes and the most ridiculous of all will be the sight of women naked in the palestra exercising with the men especially when they are no longer young they certainly will not be a vision of beauty any more than the enthusiastic old men who in spite of wrinkles and ugliness continue to frequent the gymnasia yes indeed he said according to present notions the proposal would be thought ridiculous 
but then i said as we have determined to speak our minds we must not fear the jest of the wits which will be directed against this sort of innovation how they will talk of women's attainments both in music and gymnastic and above all about their wearing armour and riding upon horseback very true he replied yet having begun we must go forward to the rough places of the law at the same time begging of these gentlemen for once in their life to be serious not long ago as we shall remind them the hellenes were of the opinion which is still generally received among the barbarians that the sight of a naked man was ridiculous and improper and when first the cretans and then the lacedaemonians introduced the custom the wits of that day might equally have ridiculed the innovation no doubt but when experience showed that to let all things be uncovered was far better than to cover them up and the ludicrous effect to the outward eye vanished before the better principle which reason asserted then the man was perceived to be a fool who directs the shafts of his ridicule at any other sight but that of folly and vice or seriously inclines to weigh the beautiful by any other standard but that of the good very true he replied first then whether the question is to be put in jest or in earnest let us come to an understanding about the nature of woman is she capable of sharing either wholly or partially in the actions of men or not at all and is the art of war one of those arts in which she can or cannot share that will be the best way of commencing the inquiry and will probably lead to the fairest conclusion that will be much the best way shall we take the other side first and begin by arguing against ourselves in this manner the adversary's position will not be undefended why not he said then let us put a speech into the mouths of our opponents they will say socrates and glaucard no adversary need convict you for you yourselves at the first foundation of the state admitted the principle that everybody was to do the one work suited to his own nature and certainly if i am not mistaken such an admission was made by us and do not the natures of men and women differ very much indeed and we shall reply of course they do then we shall be asked whether the tasks assigned to men and to women should not be different and such as are agreeable to their different natures certainly they should but if so have you not fallen into a serious inconsistency in saying that men and women whose natures are so entirely different ought to perform the same actions what defence will you make for us my good sir against any one who offers these objections that is not an easy question to answer when asked suddenly and i shall and i do beg of you to draw out the case on our side these are the objections glaucon and there are many others of a like kind which i foresaw long ago they made me afraid and reluctant to take in hand any law about the possession and nurture of women and children by zeus he said the problem to be solved is anything but easy why yes i said but the fact is that when a man is out of his depth whether he has fallen into a little swimming bath or into mid-ocean he has to swim all the same very true and must not we swim and try to reach the shore we will hope that arian's dolphin or some other miraculous help may save us i suppose so he said well then let us see if any way of escape can be found we acknowledged did we not that different natures ought to have different pursuits and that men's and women's natures are different and now what are we saying that different natures ought to have the same pursuits this is the inconsistency which is charged upon us precisely verily glaucon i said glorious is the power of the art of contradiction why do you say so because i think that many a man falls into the practice against his will when he thinks that he is reasoning he is really disputing just because he cannot define and divide and so know that of which he is speaking and he will pursue a merely verbal opposition in the spirit of contention and not a fair discussion yes he replied such is very often the case 
but what has that to do with us and our argument a great deal for there is certainly a danger of our getting unintentionally into a verbal opposition in what way why we valiantly and pugnaciously insist upon the verbal truth that different natures ought to have different pursuits but we never considered at all what was the meaning of sameness or difference of nature or why we distinguished them when we assigned different pursuits to different natures and the same to the same natures why no he said that was never considered by us i said suppose that by way of illustration we were to ask the question whether there is not an opposition in nature between bald men and hairy men and if this is admitted by us then if bald men are cobblers we should forbid the hairy men to be cobblers and conversely that would be a jest he said yes i said a jest and why because we never meant when we constructed the state that the opposition of natures should extend to every difference but only to those differences which affected the pursuit in which the individual is engaged we should have argued for example that a physician and one who is in mind a physician may be said to have the same nature true whereas the physician and the carpenter have different natures certainly and if i said the male and female sex appear to differ in their fitness for any art or pursuit we should say that such pursuit or art ought to be assigned to one or the other of them but if the difference consists only in women bearing and men begetting children this does not amount to a proof that a woman differs from a man in respect to the sort of education she should receive and we shall therefore continue to maintain that our guardians and their wives ought to have the same pursuits very true he said next we shall ask our opponent how in reference to any of the pursuits or arts of civic life the nature of a woman differs from that of a man that will be quite fair and perhaps he like yourself will reply that to give a sufficient answer on the instant is not easy but after a little reflection there is no difficulty yes perhaps suppose then that we invite him to accompany us in the argument and then we may hope to show him that there is nothing peculiar in the constitution of women which would affect them in the administration of the state by all means let us say to him come now and we will ask you a question when you spoke of a nature gifted or not gifted in any respect did you mean to say that one man will acquire a thing easily another with difficulty a little learning will lead the one to discover a great deal whereas the other after much study and application no sooner learns than he forgets or again did you mean that the one has a body which is a good servant to his mind while the body of the other is a hindrance to him would not these be the sort of differences which distinguish the man gifted by nature from the one who is ungifted no one will deny that and can you mention any pursuit of mankind in which the male sex has not all these gifts and qualities in a higher degree than the female need i waste time in speaking of the art of weaving and the management of pancakes and preserves in which womankind does really appear to be great and in which for her to be beaten by a man is of all things the most absurd you are quite right he replied in maintaining the general inferiority of the female sex although many women are in many things superior to many men yet on the whole what you say is true and if so my friend i said there is no special faculty of administration in a state which a woman has because she is a woman or which a man has by virtue of his sex but the gifts of nature are alike diffused in both all the pursuits of men are the pursuits of women also but in all of them a woman is inferior to a man very true then are we to impose all our enactments on men and none of them on women that will never do one woman has a gift of healing another not one is a musician and another has no music in her nature very true and one woman has a turn for gymnastics and military exercises and another is unwarlike and hates gymnastics certainly 
and one woman is a philosopher and another is an enemy of philosophy one has spirit and another is without spirit that is also true then one woman will have the temper of a guardian and another not was not the selection of the male guardians determined by differences of this sort yes men and women alike possess the qualities which make a guardian they differ only in their comparative strength or weakness obviously and those women who have such qualities are to be selected as the companions and colleagues of men who have similar qualities and whom they resemble in capacity and in character very true and ought not the same natures to have the same pursuits they ought then as we were saying before there is nothing unnatural in assigning music and gymnastic to the wives of the guardians to that point we come round again certainly not the law which we then enacted was agreeable to nature and therefore not an impossibility or mere aspiration and the contrary practice which prevails at present is in reality a violation of nature that appears to be true we had to consider first whether our proposals were possible and secondly whether they are the most beneficial yes and the possibility has been acknowledged yes the very great benefit was next to be established quite so you will admit that the same education which makes a man a good guardian will make a woman a good guardian for their original nature is the same yes i should like to ask you a question what is it would you say that all men are equal in excellence or is one man better than another the latter and in the commonwealth which we are founding do you conceive the guardians who have been brought up on our model system to be more perfect men or the cobblers whose education has been cobbling what a ridiculous question you have answered me i replied well and may we not further say that our guardians are the best of our citizens by far the best and will not their wives be the best women yes by far the best and can there be anything better for the interests of the state than that the men and women of the state should be as good as possible there can be nothing better and this is what the arts of music and gymnastic when present in such manner as we have described will accomplish certainly then we have made an enactment not only possible but in the highest degree beneficial to the state true then let the wives of our guardians strip for their virtue will be their robe and let them share in the toils of war and the defence of their country only in the distribution of labours the lighter are to be assigned to the women who are the weaker natures but in other respects their duties are to be the same and as for the man who laughs at naked women exercising their bodies from the best of motives in his laughter he is plucking a fruit of unripe wisdom and he himself is ignorant of what he is laughing at or what he is about for that is and ever will be the best of sayings that the useful is the noble and the hurtful is the base very true here then is one difficulty in our law about women which we may say that we have now escaped the wave has not swallowed us up alive for enacting that the guardians of either sex should have all the pursuits in common to the utility and also to the possibility of this arrangement the consistency of the argument with itself bears witness yes that was a mighty wave which you have escaped yes i said but a greater is coming you will not think much of this when you see the next go on let me see the law i said which is the sequel of this and of all that has preceded is to the following effect that the wives of our guardians are to be common and their children are to be common and no parent is to know his own child nor any child his parent yes he said that is a much greater wave than the other and the possibility as well as the utility of such a law are far more questionable i do not think i said that there can be any dispute about the very great utility of having wives and children in common the possibility is quite another matter and will be very much disputed 
I think that a good many doubts may be raised about both. You imply that the two questions must be combined, I replied. Now, I meant that you should admit the utility, and in this way, as I thought, I should escape from one of them, and then there would remain only the possibility. But that little attempt is detected, and therefore you will please to give a defence of both. Well, I said, I submit to my fate. Yet grant me a little favour. Let me feast my mind with the dream, as daydreamers are in the habit of feasting themselves when they are walking alone. For before they have discovered any means of affecting their wishes, that is, a matter which never troubles them, they would rather not tire themselves by thinking about possibilities. But assuming that what they desire is already granted to them, they proceed with their plan, and delight in detailing what they mean to do when their wish has come true. That is a way which they have of not doing much good to a capacity which was never good for much. Now, I myself am beginning to lose heart, and I should like, with your permission, to pass over the question of possibility at present. Assuming, therefore, the possibility of the proposal, I shall now proceed to inquire how the rulers will carry out these arrangements, and I shall demonstrate that our plan, if executed, will be of the greatest benefit to the State and to the guardians. First of all, then, if you have no objection, I will endeavour, with your help, to consider the advantages of the measure, and hereafter the question of possibility. I have no objection. Proceed. First, I think that if our rulers and our auxiliaries are to be worthy of the name which they bear, there must be willingness to obey in the one, and the power of command in the other. The guardians must themselves obey the laws, and they must also imitate the spirit of them in any details which are entrusted to their care. That is right, he said. You, I said, who are their legislator, having selected the men, will now select the women and give them to them. They must be as far as possible of like natures with them. They must live in common houses and meet at common meals. None of them will have anything specially his or her own. They will be together, and will be brought up together, and will associate at gymnastic exercises. And so they will be drawn by a necessity of their natures to have intercourse with each other. Necessity is not too strong a word, I think. Yes, he said, necessity, not geometrical, but another sort of necessity which lovers know, and which is far more convincing and constraining to the mass of mankind. True, I said, and this Glaucon, like all the rest, must proceed after an orderly fashion. In a city of the blessed, licentiousness is an unholy thing which the rulers will forbid. Yes, he said, and it ought not to be permitted. Then clearly the next thing will be to make matrimony sacred in the highest degree, and what is most beneficial will be deemed sacred. Exactly. And how can marriages be made most beneficial? That is a question which I put to you, because I see in your house dogs for hunting, and of the nobler sort of birds not a few. Now, I beseech you, do tell me, have you ever attended to their pairing and breeding? In uh, what particulars? Why, in the first place, although they are all of a good sort, are not some better than others? True. And do you breed from them all indifferently? Or do you take care to breed from the best only? Well, from the best. And do you take the oldest or the youngest, or only those of ripe age? I choose only those of ripe age. And if care was not taken in the breeding, your dogs and birds would greatly deteriorate? Certainly. And the same of horses and animals in general? Undoubtedly. "'Good heavens! My dear friend,' I said, "'what consummate skill will our rulers need "'if the same principle holds of the human species?' "'Certainly the same principle holds, "'but why does this involve any particular skill?' "'Because,' I said, "'our rulers will often have to practice "'upon the body corporate with medicines. "'Now, you know that when patients do not require medicines "'but have only to be put under a regimen, the inferior sort of practitioner is deemed to be good enough, but when medicine has to be given, 
then the doctor should be more of a man that is quite true he said but to what are you alluding i mean i replied that our rulers will find a considerable dose of falsehood and deceit necessary for the good of their subjects we were saying that the use of all these things regarded as medicines might be of advantage and we were very right and this lawful use of them seems likely to be often needed in the regulations of marriages and births how so why i said the principle has already been laid down that the best of either sex should be united with the best as often and the inferior with the inferior as seldom as possible and that they should rear the offspring of the one sort of union but not of the other if the flock is to be maintained in first-rate condition now these goings-on must be a secret which the rulers only know and there will be a further danger of our herd as the guardians may be termed breaking out into rebellion very true had we not better appoint certain festivals at which we will bring together the brides and bridegrooms and sacrifices will be offered and suitable high menial songs composed by our poets the number of weddings is a matter which must be left to the discretion of the rulers whose aim will be to preserve the average of population there are many other things which they will have to consider such as the effects of wars and diseases and similar agencies in order as far as this is possible to prevent the state from becoming either too large or too small certainly he replied we shall have to invent some ingenious kind of lots which the less worthy may draw on each occasion of our bringing them together and then they will accuse their own ill luck but not the rulers to be sure he said and i think that our braver and better youth besides their other honors and rewards might have greater facilities of intercourse with women given them their bravery will be a reason and such fathers ought to have as many sons as possible true and the proper officers whether male or female or both for offices are to be held by women as well as by men yes the proper officers will take the offspring of the good parents to the pen or fold and there they will deposit them with certain nurses who dwell in a separate quarter but the offspring of the inferior or of the better when they chance to be deformed will be put away in some mysterious unknown place as they should be yes he said that must be done if the breed of the guardians is to be kept pure they will provide for their nurture and will bring the mothers to the fold when they are full of milk taking the greatest possible care that no mother recognizes her own child and other wet nurses may be engaged if more are required care will also be taken that the process of suckling shall not be protracted too long and the mothers will have no getting up at night or other trouble but will hand over all this sort of thing to the nurses and attendants you suppose the wives of our guardians to have a fine easy time of it when they are having children why said i and so they ought let us however proceed with our scheme we were saying that the parents should be in the prime of life very true and what is the prime of life may it not be defined as a period of about twenty years in a woman's life and thirty in a man's which years do you mean to include a woman i said at twenty years of age may begin to bear children to the state and continue to bear them until forty a man may begin at five and twenty when he has passed the point at which the pulse of life beats quickest and continue to beget children until he be fifty-five certainly he said both in men and women those years are the prime of physical as well as of intellectual vigour any one above or below the prescribed ages who takes part in the public hymenials shall be said to have done an unholy and unrighteous thing the child of which he is the father if it steals into life will have been conceived under auspices very unlike the sacrifices and prayers which at each hymenial priestesses and priests and the whole city will offer that the new generation may be better and more useful than their good and useful parents whereas his child will be the offspring of darkness and strange lust very true he replied 
and the same law will apply to any one of those within the prescribed age who forms a connection with any woman in the prime of life without the sanction of the rulers for we shall say that he is raising up a bastard to the state uncertified and unconsecrated very true he replied this applies however only to those who are within the specified age after that we allow them to range at will except that a man may not bury his daughter or his daughter's daughter or his mother or his mother's mother and women on the other hand are prohibited from marrying their sons or fathers or son's son or father's father and so on in either direction and we grant all this accompanying the permission with strict orders to prevent any embryo which may come into being from seeing the light and if any force away to the birth the parents must understand that the offspring of such an union cannot be maintained and arranged accordingly that also he said is a reasonable proposition but how will they know who are fathers and daughters and so on they will never know the way will be this dating from the day of the hymeneal the bridegroom who was then married will call all the male children who are born in the seventh and tenth month afterwards his sons and the female children his daughters, and they will call him father, and he will call their children his grandchildren, and they will call the elder generation grandfathers and grandmothers. All who were begotten at the time when their fathers and mothers came together will be called their brothers and sisters, and these, as I was saying, will be forbidden to intermarry. This, however, is not to be understood as an absolute prohibition of the marriage of brothers and sisters, if the lot favours them and they receive the sanction of the pythian oracle the law will allow them quite right he replied such is the scheme glaucon according to which guardians of our state are to have their wives and families in common and now you would have the argument show that this community is consistent with the rest of our polity and also that nothing can be better would you not yes certainly shall we try to find a common basis by asking of ourselves what ought to be the chief aim of the legislator in making laws and in the organization of the state what is the greatest good and what is the greatest evil and then consider whether our previous description has the stamp of the good or of the evil by all means end of book five part one Book Five, Part Two of the Republic by Plato. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. Can there be any greater evil than discord and distraction and plurality where unity ought to reign, or any greater good than the bond of unity? Well, there cannot and there is unity where there is community of pleasures and pains where all the citizens are glad or grieved on the same occasions of joy and sorrow no doubt yes and where there is no common but only private feeling a state is disorganized when you have one half of the world triumphing and the other plunged in grief at the same events happening to the city or the citizens certainly such differences commonly originate in a disagreement about the use of the terms mine and not mine his and not his exactly so and is not that the best ordered state in which the greatest number of persons apply the terms mine and not mine in the same way to the same thing quite true or that again which most nearly approaches to the condition of the individual as in the body when but a finger of one of us is hurt the whole frame drawn towards the soul as a centre and forming one kingdom under the ruling power therein feels the hurt and sympathizes all together with the part affected and we say that the man has a pain in his finger and the same expression is used about any other part of the body which has a sensation of pain at suffering or of pleasure at the alleviation of suffering very true he replied and i agree with you that in the best ordered state there is the nearest approach to this common feeling which you describe then when any one of the citizens experiences any good or evil the whole state will make his case their own and will either rejoice or sorrow with him yes he said that is what will happen in a well-ordered state 
It will now be time, I said, for us to return to our state, and see whether this or some other form is most in accordance with these fundamental principles. Very good. Our state, like every other, has rulers and subjects, true, all of whom will call one another citizens, of course. But is there not another name which people give to their rulers in other states? Generally they call them masters, but in democratic states they simply call them rulers. And in our state what other name besides that of citizens do the people give the rulers? They are called saviors and helpers, he replied. And what do the rulers call the people? Their maintainers and foster fathers. And what do they call them in other states? Slaves. And what do the rulers call one another in other states? Fellow rulers. And what in ours? Fellow guardians. Did you ever know an example in any other state of a ruler who would speak of one of his colleagues as his friend, and of another as not being his friend? Yes, very often. And the friend he regards and describes as one in whom he has an interest, and the other as a stranger in whom he has no interest? Exactly. But would any of your guardians think or speak of any other guardians as a stranger? Certainly he would not, for every one whom they meet will be regarded by them either as a brother or sister, or father or mother, or son or daughter, or as the child or parent of those who are thus connected with him. Capital, I said. But let me ask you once more, shall they be a family in name only, or shall they in all their actions be true to the name? For example, in the use of the word father, would the care of a father be implied and the filial reverence and duty and obedience to him which the law commands, and is the violator of these duties to be regarded as an impious and unrighteous person, who is not likely to receive much good either at the hands of God or of man? Are these to be or not to be the strains which the children will hear repeated in their ears by all the citizens, about those who are intimated to them to be their parents and the rest of their kinsfolk. These, he said, and none other, for what can be more ridiculous than for them to utter the names of family ties with the lips only, and not to act in the spirit of them? Then in our city the language of harmony and concord will be more often heard than in any other. As I was describing before, when any one is well or ill, the universal word will be, With me it is well, or it is ill. Most true. And agreeably to this mode of thinking and speaking, were we not saying that they will have their pleasures and pains in common? Yes, and so they will. And they will have a common interest in the same thing, which they all will alike call my own, and having this common interest they will have a common feeling of pleasure and pain? yes far more so than in other states and the reason of this over and above the general constitution of the state will be that the guardians will have a community of women and children that will be the chief reason and this unity of feeling we admitted to be the greatest good as was implied in our own comparison of a well-ordered state to the relation of the body and the members when affected by pleasure or pain that we acknowledged, and very rightly. Then the community of wives and children among our citizens is clearly the source of the greatest good to the state? Certainly. And this agrees with the other principle which we were affirming, that the guardians were not to have houses or lands or any other property. Their pay was to be their food, which they were to receive from other citizens, and they were to have no private expenses for we intended them to preserve their true character of guardians. Right, he replied. Both the community of property and the community of families, as I am saying, tend to make them more truly guardians. They will not tear the city in pieces by differing about mine and not mine, each man dragging any acquisition which he has made into a separate house of his own, where he has a separate wife and children and private pleasures and pains but all will be affected as far as may be by the same pleasures and pains because they are all of one opinion about what is near and dear to them and therefore they all tend towards a common end certainly he replied 
and as they have nothing but their persons which they can call their own suits and complaints will have no existence among them they will be delivered from all those quarrels of which money or children or relations are the occasion of course they will neither will trials for assault or insult ever be likely to occur among them for that equals should defend themselves against equals we shall maintain to be honourable and right we shall make the protection of the person a matter of necessity that is good he said yes and there is a further good in the law that is that if a man has a quarrel with another he will satisfy his resentment then and there and not proceed to more dangerous lengths certainly to the elder shall be assigned the duty of ruling and chastising the younger clearly nor can there be a doubt that the younger will not strike or do any other violence to an elder unless the magistrates command him nor will he slight him in any way for there are two guardians shame and fear mighty to prevent him shame which makes men refrain from laying hands on those who are to them in the relation of parents fear that the injured one will be succoured by the others who are his brothers sons and fathers that is true he replied then in every way the laws will help the citizens to keep the peace with one another yes there will be no want of peace and as the guardians will never quarrel among themselves there will be no danger of the rest of the city being divided either against them or against one another none whatever i hardly like even to mention the little meannesses of which they will be rid for they are beneath notice such for example as the flattery of the rich by the poor and all the pains and pangs which men experience in bringing up a family and in finding money to buy necessaries for their household borrowing and then repudiating getting how they can and giving the money into the hands of women and slaves to keep the many evils of so many kinds which people suffer in this way are mean enough and obvious enough and not worth speaking of yes he said a man has no need of eyes in order to perceive that and from all these evils they will be delivered and their life will be blessed as the life of olympic victors and yet more blessed how so the olympic victor i said is deemed happy in receiving a part only of the blessedness which is secured to our citizens who have won a more glorious victory and have a more complete maintenance at the public cost for the victory which they have won is the salvation of the whole state and the crown with which they and their children are crowned is the fullness of all that life needs they receive rewards from the hands of their country while living and after death have an honourable burial yes he said and glorious rewards they are do you remember i said how in the course of the previous discussion some one who shall remain nameless accused us of making our guardians unhappy they had nothing and might have possessed all things to whom we replied that if an occasion offered we might perhaps hereafter consider this question but that as at present advised we would make our guardians truly guardians and that we were fashioning the state with a view to the greatest happiness not of any particular class but of the whole yes i remember and what do you say now that the life of our protectors is made out to be far better and nobler than that of olympic victors is the life of shoemakers or any other artisans or of husbandmen to be compared with it certainly not at the same time i ought here to repeat what i have said elsewhere that if any of our guardians shall try to be happy in such a manner that he will cease to be a guardian and is not content with this safe and harmonious life which in our judgment is of all lives the best but infatuated by some youthful conceit of happiness which gets up into his head shall seek to appropriate the whole state to himself then he will have to learn how wisely hesiod spoke when he said half is more than the whole if he were to consult me i should say to him stay where you are when you have the offer of such a life you agree then i said that men and women are to have a common way of life such as we have described common education common children and they are to watch over the citizens in common whether abiding in the city or going out to war 
they are to keep watch together and to hunt together like dogs and always and in all things as far as they are able women are to share with the men and in so doing they will do what is best and will not violate but preserve the natural relation of the sexes i agree with you he replied the inquiry i said has yet to be made whether such a community be found possible as among other animals so also among men and if possible in what way possible you have anticipated the question which i was about to suggest there is no difficulty i said in seeing how war will be carried on by them how why of course they will go on expeditions together and will take with them any of their children who are strong enough that after the manner of the artisan's child they may look on at the work which they will have to do when they are grown up and besides looking on they will have to help and be of use in war and to wait upon their fathers and mothers did you never observe in the arts how the potter's boys look on and help long before they touch the wheel yes i have and shall potters be more careful in educating their children and in giving them the opportunity of seeing and practising their duties than our guardians will be the idea is ridiculous he said there is also the effect on the parents with whom as with other animals the presence of their young ones will be the greatest incentive to valour that is quite true socrates and yet if they are defeated which may often happen in war how great the danger is the children will be lost as well as their parents and the state will never recover true i said but would you never allow them to run any risk i am far from saying that well but if they are ever to run a risk should they not do so on some occasion when if they escape disaster they will be the better for it clearly whether the future soldiers do or do not see war in the days of their youth is a very important matter for the sake of which some risk may fairly be incurred yes very important this then must be our first step to make our children spectators of war but we must also contrive that they shall be secured against danger then all will be well true their parents may be supposed not to be blind to the risks of war but to know as far as human foresight can what expeditions are safe and what dangerous that may be assumed and they will take them on the safe expeditions and be cautious about the dangerous ones true and they will place them under the command of experienced veterans who will be their leaders and teachers very properly still the dangers of war cannot be always foreseen there is a good deal of chance about them true then against such chances the children must be at once furnished with wings in order that in the hour of need they may fly away and escape what do you mean he said i mean that we must mount them on horses in their earliest youth and when they have learnt to ride take them on horseback to see war the horses must not be spirited and warlike but the most tractable and yet the swiftest that can be had in this way they will get an excellent view of what is hereafter to be their own business and if there is danger they have only to follow their elder leaders and escape i believe that you are right he said next as to war what are to be the relations of your soldiers to one another and to their enemies i should be inclined to propose that the soldier who leaves his rank or throws away his arms or is guilty of any other act of cowardice should be degraded into the rank of a husbandman or artisan what do you think by all means i should say and he who allows himself to be taken prisoner may as well be made a present of to his enemies he is their lawful prey and let them do what they like with him certainly but the hero who has distinguished himself what shall be done to him in the first place he shall receive honour in the army from his youthful comrades every one of them in succession shall crown him what do you say i approve and what do you say to his receiving the right hand of fellowship to that too i agree but you will hardly agree to my next proposal what is your proposal that he should kiss and be kissed by them 
"'Most certainly, and I should be disposed to go further, and say, let no one whom he has a mind to kiss refuse to be kissed by him while the expedition lasts, so that if there be a lover in the army, whether his love be youth or maiden, he may be more eager to win the prize of valour. Capital, I said, that the brave man is to have more wives than others has been already determined, and he is to have first choices in such matters more than others, in order that he may have as many children as possible. Agreed. Again, there is another manner in which, according to Homer, brave youths shall be honoured, for he tells how Ajax, after he had distinguished himself in battle, was rewarded with long chines, which seems to be a compliment appropriate to a hero in the flower of his age, being not only a tribute of honour, but also a very strengthening thing. Most true, he said. Then in this, I said, Homer shall be our teacher and we too, at sacrifices and on like occasions, will honour the brave according to the measure of their valour, whether men or women, with hymns and those other distinctions which we are mentioning, also with seats of precedence and meats and full cups, and in honouring them we shall be at the same time training them. That, he replied, is excellent. Yes, I said. And when a man dies gloriously in war, shall we not say, in the first place, that he is of the golden race? To be sure. Nay, have we not the authority of Hesiod for affirming that when they are dead, they are holy angels upon the earth, authors of good, averters of evil, the guardians of speech gifted men? Yes, and we accept his authority. We must learn of the god how we are to order the sepulture of divine and heroic personages, and what is to be their specific distinction, and we must do as he bids, by all means. And in ages to come we will reverence them, and kneel before their sepulchres as at the graves of heroes, and not only they, but any who are deemed preeminently good, whether they die from age or in any other way, shall be admitted to the same honours. That is very right he said. Next, how shall our soldiers treat their enemies? What about this? In what respect do you mean? Well, first of all, in regard to slavery. Do you think it right that Hellenes should enslave Hellenic states, or allow others to enslave them, if they can help? Should not their custom be to spare them, considering the danger which there is that the whole race may one day fall under the yoke of the barbarians? to spare them is infinitely better. Then no Hellene should be owned by them as a slave. That is a rule which they will observe, and advise the other Hellenes to observe. Certainly, he said, they will in this way be united against the barbarians, and will keep their hands off one another. Next, as to the slain, ought the conquerors, I said, to take anything but their armour? Does not the practice of despoiling an enemy afford an excuse for not facing the battle? Cowards skulk about the field, pretending that they are fulfilling a duty, and many an army before now has been lost from this love of plunder. Very true. And is there not illiberality and avarice in robbing a corpse, and also a degree of meanness and womanishness, in making an enemy of the dead body when the real enemy has flown away and left only his fighting gear behind him? Is not this rather like a dog who cannot get at his assailant, quarrelling with the stones which strike him instead? Very like a dog, he said. Then we must abstain from spoiling the dead or hindering their burial? Yes, he replied, we most certainly must. Neither shall we offer up arms at the temples of the gods, least of all the arms of Hellenes, if we care to maintain good feeling with other Hellenes, and, indeed, we have reason to fear that the offering of spoils taken from kinsmen may be a pollution unless commanded by the god himself. Very true. Again, as to the devastation of Hellenic territory or the burning of houses, what is to be the practice? May I have the pleasure, he said, of hearing your opinion. Both shall be forbidden, in my judgment. I would take the annual produce and no more. Shall I tell you why? Oh, pray do. Why, 
You see, there is a difference in the names discord and war, and I imagine that there is also a difference in their natures. The one is expressive of what is internal and domestic, the other of what is external and foreign, and the first of the two is termed discord, and only the second war. That is a very proper distinction, he replied. And may I not observe with equal propriety that the Hellenic race is all united together by ties of blood and friendship, and alien and strange to the barbarians? Very good, he said. And therefore, when Hellenes fight with barbarians, and barbarians with Hellenes, they will be described by us as being at war when they fight, and by nature enemies, and this kind of antagonism should be called war. But when Hellenes fight with one another, we shall say that Hellas is then in a state of disorder and discord, they being by nature friends, and such enmity is to be called discord. I agree. Consider then, I said, when that which we have acknowledged to be discord occurs, and a city is divided, if both parties destroy the lands and burn the houses of one another, how wicked does the strife appear! No true lover of his country would bring himself to tear in pieces his own nurse and mother. There might be reason in the conqueror depriving the conquered of their harvest, but still they would have the idea of peace in their hearts, and would not mean to go on fighting for ever. Yes, he said, that is a better temper than the other. And will not the city which you are founding be a Hellenic city? It ought to be, he replied. Then will not the citizens be good and civilized? Yes, very civilized. And will they not be lovers of Hellas, and think of Hellas as their own land, and share in the common temples? Most certainly. And any difference which arises among them will be regarded by them as discord, only a quarrel among friends, which is not to be called a war. Certainly not. Then they will quarrel as those who intend some day to be reconciled? Certainly. They will use friendly correction, but will not enslave or destroy their opponents. They will be correctors, not enemies. Just so. And as they are Hellenes themselves, they will not devastate Hellas, nor will they burn houses, nor ever suppose that the whole population of city men, women, and children are equally their enemies. For they know that the guilt of war is always confined to a few persons, and that the many are their friends and for all these reasons they will be unwilling to waste their lands and raise their houses. Their enmity to them will only last until the many innocent sufferers have compelled the guilty few to give satisfaction. I agree, he said, that our citizens should thus deal with their Hellenic enemies, and with barbarians as the Hellenes now deal with one another. Then let us enact this law also for our guardians that they are neither to devastate the lands of Hellenes nor to burn their houses. Agreed. And we may agree also in thinking that these, like all our previous enactments, are very good. End of Book 5, Part 2this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Bob Neufeld. But still I must say, Socrates, that if you are allowed to go on in this way, you will entirely forget the other question, which at the commencement of this discussion you thrust aside. Is such an order of things possible, and how, if at all? For I am quite ready to acknowledge that the plan which you propose, if only feasible, would do all sorts of good to the state. I will add what you have omitted, that your citizens will be the bravest of warriors, and will never leave their ranks, for they will all know one another, and each will call the other father, brother, son. And if you suppose the women to join their armies, whether in the same rank or in the rear, either as a terror to the enemy, or as auxiliaries in case of need, I know that they will then be absolutely invincible, and there are many domestic advantages which might also be mentioned, and which I also fully acknowledge. But, as I admit all these advantages, and as many more as you please, if only this state of yours were to come into existence, we need say no more about them. Assuming then the existence of the state, let us now turn to the question of possibility, and ways and means. 
the rest may be left if i loiter for a moment you instantly make a raid upon me i said and have no mercy i have hardly escaped the first and second waves and you seem not to be aware that you are now bringing upon me the third which is the greatest and heaviest when you have seen and heard the third wave i think you will be more considerate and will acknowledge that some fear and hesitation was natural respecting a proposal so extraordinary as that which i have now to state and investigate the more appeals of this sort which you make he said the more determined are we that you shall tell us how such a state is possible speak out and at once let me begin by reminding you that we found our way hither in the search after justice and injustice true he replied but what of that i was only going to ask whether if we have discovered them we are to require that the just man should in nothing fail of absolute justice or may we be satisfied with an approximation and the attainment in him of a higher degree of justice than is to be found in other men the approximation will be enough we are inquiring into the nature of absolute justice and into the character of the perfectly just and to injustice and the perfectly unjust that we might have an ideal we were to look at these in order that we might judge of our own happiness and unhappiness according to the standard which they have exhibited and the degree in which we resembled them but not with any view of showing that they could exist in fact true he said would a painter be any the worse because after having delineated with consummate art an ideal of a perfectly beautiful man he was unable to show that any such man could ever have existed he would be none the worse well and were we not creating an ideal of a perfect state to be sure and is our theory a worse theory because we are unable to prove the possibility of a city being ordered in the manner described surely not he replied that is the truth i said but if at your request i am to try and show how and under what conditions the possibility is highest i must ask you having this in view to repeat your former admissions oh, what admissions i want to know whether ideals are ever fully realized in language does not the word express more than the fact and must not the actual whatever a man may think always in the nature of things fall short of the truth what do you say i agree then you must not insist on my proving that the actual state will in every respect coincide with the ideal if we are only able to discover how a city may be governed nearly as we proposed you will admit that we have discovered the possibility which you demand and will be contented i am sure that i should be contented will not you yes i will let me next endeavour to show what is that fault in states which is the cause of their present maladministration and what is the least change which will enable a state to pass into the truer form and let the change if possible be of one thing only or if not of two at any rate let the changes be as few and slight as possible certainly he replied i think i said that there might be a reform of the state if only one change were made which is not a slight or easy though still a possible one what is it he said now then i said i go to meet that which i liken to the greatest of the waves yet shall the word be spoken even though the wave break and drown me in laughter and dishonour and do you mark my words proceed i said until philosophers are kings or the kings and princes of this world have the spirit and power of philosophy and political greatness and wisdom meet in one and these commoner natures who pursue either to the exclusion of the other are compelled to stand aside cities will never have rest from their evils nor the human race as i believe and then only will this our state have a possibility of life and behold the light of day such was the thought my dear glaucon which i would fain have uttered if it had not seemed too extravagant for to be convinced that in no other state can there be happiness private or public is indeed a hard thing 
Socrates, what do you mean? I would have you consider that the word which you have uttered is one at which numerous persons, and very respectable persons too, in a figure pulling off their coats all in a moment, and seizing any weapon that comes to hand, will run at you might and main before you know where you are, intending to do heaven knows what. And if you don't prepare an answer and put yourself in motion, you will be paired by their fine wits, and no mistake. You got me into the scrape, I said, and I was quite right. However, I will do all I can to get you out of it. But I can only give you good will and good advice, and perhaps I may be able to fit answers to your questions better than another. That is all. And now, having such an auxiliary, you must do your best to show the unbelievers that you are right. I ought to try, I said, since you offer me such invaluable assistance. And I think that if there is to be a chance of our escaping, we must explain to them whom we mean when we say that philosophers are to rule in the state. Then we shall be able to defend ourselves. There will be discovered to be some natures who ought to study philosophy and to be leaders in the state, and others who are not born to be philosophers and are meant to be followers rather than leaders. Then now for a definition, he said. Follow me, I said, and I hope that I may in some way or other be able to give you a satisfactory explanation. Proceed. I dare say that you remember, and therefore I need not remind you, that a lover, if he is worthy of the name, ought to show his love, and not to some one part of that which he loves, but to the whole. I really do not understand, and therefore beg of you to assist my memory. Another person, I said, might fairly reply as you do, but a man of pleasure like yourself ought to know that all who are in the flower of youth do somehow or other raise a pang or emotion in a lover's breast, and are thought by him to be worthy of his affectionate regards. Is not this a way which you have with the fair? One has a snub nose, and you praise his charming face. The hook nose of another has, you say, a royal look while he who is neither snub nor hooked has the grace of regularity. The dark visage is manly, the fair are children of the gods, and as to the sweet honey pale, as they are called, what is the very name but the invention of a lover who talks in diminutives, and is not averse to paleness if appearing on the cheek of youth? In a word, there is no excuse which you will not make, and nothing which you will not say, in order not to lose a single flower that blooms in the springtime of youth. If you make me an authority in matters of love, for the sake of the argument, I assent. And what do you say of lovers of wine? Do you not see them doing the same? They are glad of any pretext of drinking any wine. Very good. And the same is true of ambitious men. If they cannot command an army, they are willing to command a file, and if they cannot be honoured by really great and important persons, they are glad to be honoured by lesser and meaner people, but honour of some kind they must have. Exactly. Once more, let me ask, does he who desires any class of goods desire the whole class or a part only? The whole. And may we not say of the philosopher that he is a lover not of a part of wisdom only, but of the whole? Yes, of the whole. And he who dislikes learning, especially in youth, when he has no power of judging what is good and what is not, such an one we maintain not to be a philosopher or a lover of knowledge, just as he who refuses his food is not hungry and may be said to have a bad appetite and not a good one. Very true, he said whereas he who has a taste for every sort of knowledge, and who is curious to learn and is never satisfied, may be justly termed a philosopher. Am I not right? Glaucon said, If curiosity makes a philosopher, you will find many a strange being will have a title to the name. All the lovers of sights have a delight in learning, and must therefore be included. Musical amateurs, too, are a folk strangely out of place among philosophers, for they are the last persons in the world who would come to anything like a philosophical discussion, if they could help, while they run about at the Dionysiac festivals as if they had let out their ears to hear every chorus. 
whether the performance is in town or country that makes no difference they are there now are we to maintain that all these and any who have similar tastes as well as the professors of quite minor arts are philosophers well, certainly not i replied they are only an imitation he said who then are the true philosophers those i said who are lovers of the vision of truth that is also good he said but i should like to know what do you mean to another i replied i might have a difficulty in explaining but i am sure that you will admit a proposition which i am about to make what is the proposition that since beauty is the opposite of ugliness they are two certainly and inasmuch as they are two each of them is one true again and of just and unjust good and evil and every other class the same remark holds taken singly each of them is one but from the various combinations of them with actions and things and with one another they are seen in all sorts of lights and appear many very true and this is the distinction which i draw between the sight-loving art-loving practical class and those of whom i am speaking and who are alone worthy of the name of philosophers how do you distinguish them he said the lovers of sounds and sights i replied are as i conceive fond of fine tones and colours and forms and all the artificial products that are made out of them but their mind is incapable of seeing or loving absolute beauty true he replied few are they who are able to attain the sight of this very true and he who having a sense of beautiful things has no sense of absolute beauty or who if another lead him to a knowledge of that beauty is unable to follow of such a one i ask is he awake or in a dream only reflect is not the dreamer sleeping or waking one who likens dissimilar things who puts the copy in the place of the real object i should certainly say that such an one was dreaming but take the case of the other who recognizes the existence of absolute beauty and is able to distinguish the idea from the objects which participate in the idea neither putting the subjects in the place of the idea nor the idea in the place of the objects is he a dreamer or is he awake he is wide awake and may we not say that the mind of the one who knows has knowledge and that the mind of the other who opines only has opinion certainly but suppose that the latter should quarrel with us and dispute our statement can we administer any soothing cordial or advice to him without revealing to him that there is sad disorder in his wits we must certainly offer him some good advice he replied come then and let us think of something to say to him shall we begin by assuring him that he is welcome to any knowledge which he may have and that we are rejoiced at his having it but we should like to ask him a question does he who has knowledge know something or nothing uh, you must answer for him i answer that he knows something something that is or is not something that is for how can that which is not ever be known and are we assured after looking at the matter from many points of view that absolute being is or may be absolutely known but that the utterly non-existent is utterly unknown nothing can be more certain good but if there be anything which is of such a nature as to be and not to be that will have a place intermediate between pure being and the absolute negation of being yes between them and as knowledge corresponded to being and ignorance of necessity to not being for that intermediate between being and not being there has to be discovered a corresponding intermediate between ignorance and knowledge if there be such well, certainly do we admit the existence of opinion undoubtedly as being same with knowledge or another faculty another faculty then opinion and knowledge have to do with different kinds of matter corresponding to this difference of faculties yes and knowledge is relative to being and knows being but before i proceed further i will make a division what division i will begin by placing faculties in a class by themselves there are powers in us and in all other things 
by which we do as we do. Sight and hearing, for example, I should call faculties. Have I clearly explained the class which I mean? Yes, I quite understand. Then let me tell you my view about them. I do not see them, and therefore the distinctions of figure, color, and the like which enable me to discern the differences of some things do not apply to them. In speaking of a faculty, I think only of its sphere and its result, and that which has the same sphere and the same result I call the same faculty, but that which has another sphere and another result I call different. Would that be your way of speaking? Yes. And will you be so very good as to answer one more question? Would you say that knowledge is a faculty, or in what class would you place it? Certainly knowledge is a faculty, and the mightiest of all faculties. And is opinion also a faculty? Certainly, he said, for opinion is that with which we are able to form an opinion. And yet you were acknowledging a little while ago that knowledge is not the same as opinion. Why, yes, he said. How can any reasonable being ever identify that which is infallible with that which errs? An excellent answer, proving, I said, that we are quite conscious of a distinction between them. Yes. Then knowledge and opinion, having distinct powers, have also distinct spheres or subject matters? That is certain. Being is the sphere and subject matter of knowledge, and knowledge is to know the nature of being? Yes. And opinion is to have an opinion? Yes. Then do we know what we opine? Or is the subject matter of opinion the same as the subject matter of knowledge? Nay, he replied, that has been already disproven. If difference in faculty implies difference in the sphere or subject matter, and if, as we were saying, opinion and knowledge are distinct faculties, then the sphere of knowledge and of opinion cannot be the same. Then if being is the subject matter of knowledge, something else must be the subject matter of opinion? Yes, something else. Well, then, is not being the subject matter of opinion? Or rather, how can there be an opinion at all about not being? Reflect. When a man has an opinion, has he not an opinion about something? Can he have an opinion which is an opinion about nothing? Impossible. He who has an opinion has an opinion about some one thing? Yes. And not being is not one thing, but, properly speaking, nothing. True. Of not being, ignorance was assumed to be the necessary correlative. Of being, knowledge. True, he said. Then opinion is not concerned either with being or with not being. Not with either. And can therefore neither be ignorance or knowledge. That seems to be true. But is opinion to be sought without and beyond either of them, in a greater clearness than knowledge, or in a greater darkness than ignorance? In neither. Then I suppose that opinion appears to you to be darker than knowledge, but lighter than ignorance? Both, and in no small degree. And also to be within and between them? Yes. Then you would infer that opinion is intermediate. No question. But were we not saying before that if anything appeared to be of a sort which is and is not at the same time, that sort of thing would appear also to lie in the interval between pure being and absolute not being, and that the corresponding faculty is neither knowledge nor ignorance, but will be found in the interval between them? True. And in that interval there has now been discovered something which we call opinion? There has. Then, what remains to be discovered is the object which partakes equally of the nature of being and not being, and cannot rightly be termed either, pure and simple. This unknown term, when discovered, we may truly call the subject of opinion, and assign each to their proper faculty, the extremes to the faculties of the extremes, and the mean to the faculty of the mean. True. This being premised, I would ask the gentleman who is of the opinion that there is no absolute or unchangeable idea of beauty, in whose opinion the beautiful is manifold, he, I say, your lover of beautiful sights, who cannot bear to be told that the beautiful is one and the just is one, or that anything is one, to him I would appeal, saying, 
will you be so very kind sir as to tell us whether of all these beautiful things there is one which will not be found ugly or of the just which will not be found unjust or of the holy which will not also be unholy no he replied the beautiful will in some point of view be found ugly and the same is true of the rest and may not the many which are doubles be also halves doubles that is of one thing and halves of another oh, quite true and things great and small heavy and light as they are termed will not be denoted by these any more than by the opposite names true both these and the opposite names will always attach to all of them and can any one of these many things which are called by particular names be said to be this rather than not to be this he replied they are like the punning riddles which are asked at feasts or the children's puzzle about the eunuch aiming at the bat with what he hit him as they say in the puzzle and upon what the bat was sitting the individual objects of which i am speaking are also a riddle and have a double sense nor can you fix them in your mind either as being or not being or both or neither then what will you do with them i said can they have a better place than between being and not being for they are clearly not in greater darkness or negation than not being and more full of light and existence than being that is quite true he said thus then we seem to have discovered that the many ideas which the multitude entertain about the beautiful and about all other things are tossing about in some region which is halfway between pure being and pure not being we have yes and we had before agreed that anything of this kind which we might find was to be described as matter of opinion and not as matter of knowledge being the intermediate flux which is caught and detained by the intermediate faculty quite true then those who see the many beautiful and who yet neither see absolute beauty nor can follow any guide who points the way thither who see the many just and not absolute justice and the like such persons may be said to have opinion but not knowledge that is certain but those who see the absolute and eternal and immutable may be said to know and not to have opinion only but neither can that be denied the one love and embrace the subjects of knowledge the other those of opinion the latter are the same as i dare say you will remember who listened to sweet sounds and gazed upon fair colours but would not tolerate the existence of absolute beauty yes i remember shall we then be guilty of an impropriety in calling them lovers of opinion rather than lovers of wisdom and will they be very angry with us for thus describing them i shall tell them not to be angry no man should be angry at what is true but those who love the truth in each thing are to be called lovers of wisdom and not lovers of opinion assuredly End of book five.